what we're what we come up with at tonight's meeting. Yeah, I mean, we don't need to have the comments in until May. That's right. The, the, the thing is, um, we won't have a full board meeting, so we can come up with some stuff tonight. We can come up with questions tonight and, you know, maybe we'll be satisfied with what what we come up with. Yeah, um, it's, I mean, somebody has to attend the scoping meeting on the 26th. So I, I'm, I'm hoping a few of us will be able yeah. to. Yeah. Hey, um, related to 315 Barry, I don't know if you saw, you know, the email with uh with jerry but um you know um you know attendees tonight who were intending to speak were like essentially told that if the uh, committee shares discretion whether um attendees can speak or not and i would just like to suggest that they absolutely be allowed to speak tonight on 315 Barry and everything else, but. Sure, we will have to make sure we limit the time, but I, I'm always willing to allow uh, attendees to, to speak, but again, they'll have to uh, limit themselves. Hopefully I won't have to limit them because we have six items and we have to come up with our own list of recommendations for the scoping meeting mm -hmm. after the, after the, uh, Two trees presentation. Yeah. So, but I think it's very important that we we hear what what these people have to say. Um, now we have three more people, non-board members, who have been added to the the board. So, um, I thought I'd ask them to just introduce themselves and give us a very quick idea of why they wanted to uh, be on the committee. Um, Jerry is going to is going to call the, the roll the roll call. Um, I don't know if we're ready to start yet. And um, just a warning my so I don't know why but my computer frequently just times out or does something on this WebEx and I, if, if I just disappear, uh, it's, that's what happened. And, um, then I have to sign in again. <laughs> so carry on if I'm not here, if I suddenly disappear. Um, Maria's here, she'll carry on while I get signed in again. All right. Hopefully you won't disappear. <laughs> it happens every time. After a certain period of time, I, it, it just says WebEx has stopped or something okay. to that effect. You have to promise to come back though, bro. Yes, I always, I've, I've always managed to come back somehow. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, there was a letter that um, Kenneth from Williamsburg Houses sent to me about 45 minutes ago that I asked the board office to share with the committee, and I don't think that it's gone out. So, you just have to explain it. Letter of support from the RA. That's fine. Do you think we have enough battery? No, yeah. So, um, Jerry, are you there? I'm here. Uh, can we start? Do we have your call? Enough people? I'm having trouble seeing how many people we have. Um, a lot of people. We have a lot of people. Yep. Well, why don't we start? We have whether we have a forum or not. Let's get started because we have a, a really full roster here. So, um, let's get started, Jerry. If you can do the roll call, and I think somebody might have to mute themselves. Might have to. Um. Their worries. Let's see, maybe me. I don't know. Um, and then we have three new people if they're here. 
Mr. Mr. Kawoka, Kawoka. I don't know uh, if you, if I'm pronouncing your name properly. Hi, uh, Michael Kawaska. Thank you. Kawoka. Okay. Hi. Kawachka. Close enough. Okay. Ka say it again, please. Huh? Uh, Kawachka. Kawachka. Oh, Kawachka. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and Mr. Andrews. So, Jerry, could you could you just do the roll call? Sure. Del T. Here. Maria Vieira. I know she's oh. here. I'm here. I'm here. Trina McKeever. Here. Gina Barrows. Stephen Chesler. Stephen Chesler. Here. Aaron Drinkwater. Here. Moisha Indy. Bozina, Bozina Kaminsky. I'm here. I'm signing in as Andrew Kaminsky. Avram Katz. Abraham Leibovitz. Sante Michelli. I'm here. 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 Rabbi Niederman. Here. Karen Yevas. Isaac Sulfur. Robert Solano. Stephen Weidberg. Here. William Vega. Simon Weiser. Michael Andrews. Here. Keith Berger. Mm -hmm. Corey Canton. Here. Michael Kawachka. Here. Here. Meglin Lee. Mm -hmm. Katie Naplatarski. Allison Stone. Here. I thought I saw Katie Neplatarski. No. You have 13. You have a quorum. Okay. Karen, I guess Jerry, is here. Jerry, Jerry did, did you hear me? Yes. Yes, Rabbi. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, what about uh, environmental, environmental protection? We need to have our roll call, too. Karen Evans is here. Right. What about Miss Lee? I couldn't tell whether she said yes. Yes, ma'am. I didn't hear okay. her call. Okay. Meglin Lee, are you here? Okay. okay, environmental protection. Stephen Chesler. Here. Eric Brzeidis. T. Willis Elkins. Here. William Clagsbold. Yo Lowe. Trina McKeever. Here. Janice Peterson. Bella Sable. Laura Hoffman, Kevin Kefta, Daniel Grossman, here. Four members present. We need six for a quorum. All right, thank you, thank you, Jared. So, how about we uh, we proceed because the um, application that needed the Environmental committee is uh, number four. What do you say, Steve? You're the chairperson. Steve? I don't know. If you, can you hear me, Steve? Steve, you're muted. Steve, I think you're muted. I think he's frozen. I think he's frozen. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he'll, he'll get back and. I think it's, uh, I can't imagine that he would object to uh, moving forward because the Williamsburg house is his first. Steve? All right, let's, 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 let's uh, start with the first, um, the first item on the agenda, which is the Williamsburg house. Oh, wait, wait, no, we were going to have 
the three new people just say hello and um, just give a little, just a short statement as to why you wanted to be on the um, land use and landmarks committee. So why don't we start with Ms. Stone? Hello, good evening everyone. My name is Allison Stone. I'm a local resident here in South Williamsburg. Uh, I both run a business in the neighborhood. Uh, I'm a marketing consultant as well as have a family and a young son in the neighborhood. Uh, I've been local for eight years now and uh, love North Brooklyn. Um, and I'm just thrilled to meet other neighbors and work uh, more cohesively together to create a better and greater community for all. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Andrews. Hello, um, I'm Mike Andrews. I'm involved um, on as uh, the treasurer, or I'm sorry, the uh, secretary of the firehouse in the neighborhood. I'm also on uh, St. Nick's board. Uh, I have been very involved in the neighborhood in the last five or six years, certainly a lot more um, working with those two organizations. And uh, I moved here 15 years ago. Uh, right after the rezoning in 2005 and have seen this neighborhood change probably more than any other um, maybe in the city ever uh, in that amount of time. So I'm you know, interested, involved, and, and just want to be helpful and, and help make a better neighborhood. Thank you. Mr. Kowachka? Hi, uh, Michael Kowachka, um, live in Greenpoint, and uh, yeah, I just want to give back to the community and serve on the board here. Okay, thank you. All right, um, Steve, I think you're back in. Steve Chesler. Yes, I'm back. I had a computer okay, problem. Okay, so if you don't mind, you don't have a, a quorum of your members, but I think we can get started if you don't mind. Um, and because I think, because the um, item that uh, really involves your committee is coming up as number four. If that's okay with you. Yeah, that's fine. And, you know, even if we don't have a quorum, we can provide a consensus recommendation. When it's okay. Appropriate. Yeah. Okay, great. So, Williamsburg houses, I think Trina, you'll probably take this 1. Okay, who wants to share their screen? Can they identify themselves and, and can you make that happen? So, uh, uh, well, this is Brian. Newman. Okay. Jerry, can Brian share his screen, please? Uh, they do it themselves at the bottom of their screen. They'll see a, a share in the middle of the screen and, and it's self serve. Brian, can you make that happen? Working on it right now. Okay. There we go. That looks good. Okay. There we go. Everyone see that okay? Yes, yes. So if we're good to proceed, maybe I could introduce the team members who are on the call today. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Matthew Rooney. I am the CEO of MDG Design and Construction. Uh, a contractor who will be performing uh, rehabilitation work at Williamsburg Houses, uh, a local uh, NYCHA site that's going through the RAD process, the rental assistance demonstration process. With me, you have uh, Brian Newman uh, of Newman Design, who is the architect for the project. You have Frank Lang from St. Nick's Alliance, um, who is one of the social service providers on the project. Uh, unfortunately, I don't believe uh, the TA members uh, were able to make it on the phone just from scrolling through the names. Uh, however, we did provide uh, to Trina a, a letter of support that the Tenant Association wrote in support of the project and just speaking to some of the outreach that we've done already. Um, you may remember us from presenting a couple months ago specifically on the windows. Um, I'll let Brian speak to the scope in a second. Um, I know there's a lot of mumbo jumbo that goes into the affordable housing uh, vernacular uh, that isn't always familiar. So I'll give a quick overview of the project. 
Um, I'll let Frank say a couple of words and then we'll turn it over to Brian to get to the nuts and bolts. Essentially, what is happening at Williamsburg houses is it is part of NYCHA's PACT program, Permanent Affordability Commitment Together. Uh, part of this program is finding ways to generate funds in order to reinvest in public housing. And so effectively, Williamsburg houses will be transitioning from Section 9 public housing uh, to Section 8 housing. Uh, NYCHA will still be sort of overseeing the process. Uh, they will ultimately own the land as well as be a uh, co-managing member of the partnership that is going to be uh, working at Williamsburg Houses and developing it. And so, can you hear me? Uh, uh, yes, we can hear you. Um, Sorry, thank you. And so, uh, what we're really looking to do is to take a combination of preserving the historic nature of the site, uh, tie that in with uh, real betterment for residents. Um, this uh, particular development uh, has a lot of issues that need to be addressed. Um, they have a lot of lead hazards. Um, the apartments are just in general disrepair due to disinvestment in NYCHA over the years. And so the goal of this project is to really transform the site while, pres uh, while preserving the uh, historic quality of the site and also granting uh, additional social services to residents. It's actually part of the program. Um, part of that is generating uh, wraparound services for residents, case management, uh, investing in the community centers at the site. Grand Street Settlements is also a partner with us on this project. Um, uh, Frank from St. Nick's can speak to a little bit about our approach to uh, training and hiring that we'll be doing as part of our community outreach, as well as just providing support to the residents uh, and making sure that they are uh, a part of this process and have a voice in this process. So. Frank, I don't know if you want to say a couple quick words and then we'll turn it over to Brian. Sure. Thank you, Matt. I, I just, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm in an unusual situation here at the board where I'm going to be talking about us as a social service provider. We were happy that um, that Grand Street Settlement, which runs the community center at Waynesburg Houses, will continue to do that. And then we, St. Nick's Alliance, will be providing kind of the one-on-one -on -one case management and referral and connecting residents with issues in um, in terms of services. Separately, our workforce development uh, staff, which have an office at 790 Broadway, will be coming and doing two types of trainings. One will be a focused training on OSHA and trying to get people jobs uh, readiness to be able to work uh, at the at the site and other sites, and then for those that want more certifications, they will be able to be encouraged to come down to 790 and have longer and more comprehensive uh, support. Uh, but we're very happy uh, that we're able to continue to provide for the residents and work with the RA and uh, MDG and Wave Press, the partners uh, in the RAD program. Thanks, Frank. And so uh, we're going to turn it over to Brian now. Uh, he's going to do two things. So previously we presented the windows uh, and now we are going to present uh, the remaining portion of the scope that's under LPC's purview, which is the site plan. Um, so Brian will go through that. Uh, I'd be happy sort of it, it seems like the agenda is pretty full today. I can provide my email in the chat if any. Uh, board members or members of the community are just curious about some of the other scope of work that isn't covered under uh, LPC's purview. We'd be happy to sort of explain some of that, whether it's about the lead or it's about just the general improvements that are happening at the site. So I'll turn it over to Brian now. Thank, thank you, Matt. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Brian Newman from Newman Design. And just to further what Matt was saying at a very high level uh, as far as overall scope. Um, we are improving from a micro level, all the apartment interiors to all new kitchens, bathrooms, interior finishes, um, things of that nature within the apartments. The common common area stairs will be repaired and railings will be repaired. Building apartment entrances will be replaced. Um, on the outside of the buildings, new roof systems uh, will be uh, installed. Uh, masonry will be repaired as well. 
um, security cameras, which we'll, we'll touch on in this uh, application, uh, will, will be uh, installed as well. So there, there's a very large, uh, very expansive scope um, and, and things that you don't necessarily see, but the tenants will certainly benefit from all new heating, all new plumbing, um, all new boiler systems, all new you know, plumbing and, and pipes behind the walls, all that's being replaced as well. So it's a very, very comprehensive, large scope uh, that's going to be um, uh, and that encompasses this project specific to um, what we needed to uh, present to LPC, what falls under LPC's jurisdiction, and also get, then gets uh, obviously presented to this community board would be the windows, which we presented uh, about a month or so ago. And now the overall site improvements package. Uh, essentially, that, that's what we're here today for is the site improvements package. Those are the two uh, large scope items that uh, affect the exterior that are required to be uh, under LPC. Uh, commissioner approval and CB uh, presentation format. So today we'll discuss uh, landscaping and more site-wide improvements. I don't want to just minimize it and call it landscaping, although landscaping is extremely important. And you see that here. It's essentially the site planning aspects uh, of the project. Uh, for those who uh, those of you who do not recall or were not able to see the uh, previous presentation. These uh, these buildings are extremely important uh, from a historic perspective. One of the first affordable housing complexes in the United States of America, uh, funded by uh, Teddy Roosevelt's New Deal as part of that aspect of it, started uh, as an idea in 1933 and was constructed between 1936 and 1938. Um, Architects from uh, around the world were uh, brought in, and it was an architectural committee uh, headed by a uh, very famous uh, European architect, Lascaz. Um, and we were fortunate enough to be uh, blessed with the, that this architectural design, this postmodern European design here that we see today. And generally speaking, generally, uh, the buildings uh, and the site remain as originally intended. Uh, there were certain improvements that were done over the years, certain changes that were done over the years, but generally speaking, the site uh, remains uh, how the original design architects and team had intended. Um, our intention is to bring it back to that original design intent uh, as far as architectural language, amenities, uh, experience for the tenants, uh, while addressing today's tenants' needs. Um, and so, so without further ado, I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, you see a, a rendering on the left-hand side from 1933 and the aerial photo uh, a few years ago or a year ago uh, of the four city blocks. Uh, an overall quick site plan is just a position here. It's the four city blocks ranging from Leonard all the way to Bushwick and, and um, uh, on the north side, boundary by Mauser and Skulls on the bottom. It's really, I, I call it three, three and a quarter. We, we do have the school and the community center uh, on the second block between Graham and Manhattan. As we did research, um, we've also, uh, for this aspect of the project, brought in landscape architect Dirtworks, uh, very familiar with uh, historic projects, and they helped to really sift through the documentation and understand the design intent uh, of the original architect and the original planners here. It was uh, all about the term they used was a uh, tower in a park. The whole idea was to create not only a central park area within each, each block, but then these pocket parks, if you will, uh, off to the sides. Um, and, and that's sort of the shape of these T or L or lowercase H shaped buildings. They create little pockets and little semi private areas. Um, for the residents. You can see photos here from the late 30s, early 40s, very open in the top left, uh, courtyards, some, some pavers here, generally speaking, open courtyards, some deciduous trees, and some low hedges to help um, differentiate or uh, announce the, uh, the park areas and separate the pathways from the landscape areas. 
As far as, sorry, that jumped on me. As far as pavement or hardscape, basically the pathways, which you can see, this was the historic plans, we have the existing conditions, and we have the proposed. And if you simply look uh, in the center and then to the right, sort of the gray areas are the paths. We're really leaving the existing paths alone, except for a few areas, these sort of darker patches here, which you can see that it's now replaced with green. That was originally landscape. Um, we're leaving the original serpentine or meandering paths and restoring areas that were originally landscaping that got pulled out and became hardscape that is really underutilized. And what we're doing here, and not only are we bringing back the, the original design intent, we're adding site amenities. And we've been speaking directly with the tenant association, getting tenants feedback, and what ideas or what pieces of program should we either upgrade or add to the, add to the site. And in doing so, actually the very first one that I'm gonna show you and I will jump right past was a dog run. Well, the dog run, the tenants have decided uh, or have given us some input that they prefer not to have the dog run uh, for a variety of reasons. So this particular area uh, will be uh, probably used as an adult, an additional adult recreation area or exercise area. But the intention here, you can see the original playground or area here was uh, a, a hedge on the side, as I mentioned before, the walkway and recreation. Well, essentially, over the years, NYCHA put up these low fences and basically blocked people from using these spaces. So the idea is to replicate those, um, those hedges again and to open these spaces up. In this case, because of dogs, we would have needed to install the fence. But as I just mentioned, the dog run is actually something that was recently uh, discussed, and we're going to eliminate that from the project. Uh, just uh, before we uh, move on, one thing I'd like to add in is while we present all these amenities, uh, one thing to keep in mind is we are trying to create almost a menu for residents. Uh, so that way we can say these things have been uh, showed as acceptable to LPC, uh, to State Historic Preservation and National Park Service. Uh, and that way we can present multiple amenity options and then the residents can vote on which ones they'd prefer to see maybe one block prefers you know uh pickleball courts or different playgrounds and another one may prefer the dog run so we are looking for all of these amenities to either be approved or vetoed and that way we have a clear uh, presentation to the residents that they can select which of these amenities they'd like to see and where Thank you, Matt. That, that I should have started that way. I apologize, but that's a, a much better explanation of, of the amenities and, and other opportunities that I'm showing here. So here um, is, uh, for, for an example, one of the uh, blocks. And in the center, as I mentioned before, uh, is that large area. In, in this case, this particular block has two playground areas and previously had a splash pad. The idea here is to replicate or to bring those back to the um, uh, the original intention to put new play equipment in. Uh, again, the pathways are going to remain the same. It's just upgrading these these areas and to basically put that play uh, that splash pad back into uh, into action. And you can see here on the left hand side, these are some of the uh, existing rend uh, existing photos of. Some older play equipment, it's a little bit outdated. Some of the play surfaces are old. Um, and to the right is a rendering of the, of the same area, but a new age appropriate ADA compliant um, uh, proper fall zones and soft surfaces uh, for the children, uh, along with some additional landscaping at the perimeter areas. And if, let me see if I could just move this. I don't know if you guys can see that. There we go. Uh, on the right hand side is a key plan which shows the four blocks and the red stars are the playground area. So two on top, three on the bottom and an, an additional play surface or play area uh, on the bottom block as well. Um, example of the playground equipment, it's fall zones, the soft play surface, 
um, just to give you an idea of what the, the material would actually be or the, uh, the equipment would actually be. So here's another block or another amenity. There's an existing basketball court there, uh, at, as we see today, uh, flanked by playgrounds on either side. You can see some of the photos of the existing court. We have an idea that will start to uh, come up, uh, and it's sort of a theme that uh, comes throughout the entire project. Um, in the 19, late 1930s, uh, artwork, uh, abstract artwork, was very prevalent in, these, in this particular project to the point where it has been um, restored, removed, and it's now in the Brooklyn Museum uh, of, of Modern Art. So what we would like to do um, is pay homage to that and start to incorporate that artwork throughout the site. So while we think it's important to preserve it in, in the museum, we also want the residents to understand uh, what the history is of it and can experience it every day. And perhaps maybe from experiencing it on these everyday items, that will draw them to the museum to learn a little bit more about this. Uh, in, in fact, there is one piece that is hanging uh, in the uh, second floor of the community room, um, in the community center, excuse me, across the way. Uh, so the idea here is to leave it as a basketball court, leave the basketball lines on there in the, in the hoops and things like that so people can enjoy that. But from an aerial perspective, have that uh, have artists paint a mural on, on the ground. So when you're on your fourth floor, when you're in your fourth floor apartment, looking down upon it, you're looking at artwork as well. And we'll touch base more on that in a little bit later. I had mentioned adult fitness. So similar to the basketball court or flanking over here, there's an, another adult fitness center or area. And you can see here, uh, as I mentioned before, these low. Uh, fences, which are sort of blocking access off to, to all these beautiful landscaped areas will be removed. We'll put some of that low uh, vegetation there. And now you can see the adult fitness area uh, sort of reclaiming that that space for the residents to be able to use. And just a quick catalog cut of a few pieces of equipment that will probably go in there and the play surface that that works with that as well, or the soft fall zone safety surface that goes in there as well. So what's also extremely important, uh, try to do it as many projects as we can, fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, community gardens. Um, so we anticipate providing community gardens or areas for community gardens, working with the residents. They'll have a program. They are already starting to talk about how they can organize that. Um, but creating areas that are separated, designated specifically for vegetables, fruits, and, and growing foods, uh, directly on site. And you can see a few renderings here. Here are the existing photos on the left hand side. And here on the right, uh, you can see the planter beds uh, and individuals or, you know, representing individuals planting there. And again, the key plan on the right hand side, uh, a star, red star on the top, red star on the bottom. Again, depending on the input, there might be more than two of these. Additionally, I talked about uh, sort of pocket parks, parks, if you will, or uh, areas that were sort of outside the main central garden area. Um, that's what this blow up is showing um, and showing the entrance of the now. building. Excuse me. I'll continue. Um, at the entrance of the building over time, there's sort of these pie shape, moon shape, crescent shape, if you will, areas around the entrances. It appears over time those landscape beds were removed, pavers were put in here, and it really hardened up uh, the building entrances. We're trying to soften them up and bring them back to that more inviting um, our architecture and language when you walk to the entrances. So those planting beds will be reestablished. Get the site furnishings now. Throughout the site, or, or the original intention of the site, there were certainly planted uh, seating areas throughout the site, looking out onto these uh, uh, garden areas and open space areas. Over time, um, they've sort of been reconfigured. Uh, it's these blue benches inside there, and the benches uh, are lacking tables and things of that nature. So we're going to put back more period correct. Um, site furnishings and, and probably some tables with chess and checker uh, areas 
for the residents to really enjoy and experience the, the exterior and the outdoors here. Uh, similarly, uh, trash cans will be um, improved upon, as you can see in the center photo, uh, bike racks as well. Security cameras will be added to the to the uh, the exterior of the buildings. Um, they'll be mounted low, and the colors will be uh, the color of the camera will match the um, the masonry. Additionally, lighting uh, will be approved improved upon. Um, the red indicates the existing light pole locations. Over time, there's been a lot of changes to the light poles. We'd like to improve upon the light and the aesthetic of that. Um, to the right, you can see a picture around 1938. Um, this sort of globe light fixture, uh, this postmodern fixture. To the bottom left is this current fixture. Uh, we're proposing something uh, along the lines of the, the pictures you see on the left. Ideally, we'd love to go with the top left photo, but that would not be dark sky compliant. And there are a lot of uh, energy efficiencies, environmental concerns we need to take into consideration. So this globe or this luminaire, this round piece would have been almost ideal to match. Uh, instead, we, we would just eliminate that. So the metal, if you will, uh, will come very close to, to matching that original fixture from 1938. Um, sorry, I jumped there. Uh, top left corner, you could see we were able to find some details on the historic plans on how pavers, these cobblestones, uh, these gray granite cobblestones were originally used. So uh, to the left, there's a flagpole. Um, you can see on the right-hand side, the, the red star gives you that indication. It's sort of painted right now, pavers, uh, sorry, painted asphalt, red, white, and blue with a, um, a flagpole in there. We want to make it more monumental, more period correct. And what we'll be doing there is putting those cobblestones or restoring those cobblestones back in here, putting some perimeter uh, landscaping again, and putting a new, uh, new flagpole. One, one thing that's a, an item of concern for the residents, um, are, is is trash uh, trash pickup trash locations? This is the existing dumpster enclosure, uh, which you can see uh, on the black uh, star in the center over here. What we will be doing, we are working directly with NYCHA and DSNY and and landmarks uh, to improve upon these. DSNY will be um, collecting. And we are increasing the capacity and creating two locations um, for these uh, bulk crushers, not just dumpsters, but bulk bulk crushers as well as uh, compactors. So not just open, not open dumpsters. By doing so, we feel the rodent population will significantly be decreased because open garbage will not be stored either in the buildings or out out in open area like this. So. Uh, Here's a, the location. This is the existing location. It's going to be improved upon, uh, widened uh, for the proper equipment. And here's the other location directly off of Mauser Street. So two locations instead of just the one current one. What we will be doing, um, you'll see a rendering in a moment. Uh, as I mentioned, the public art uh, and the historic murals. These are historic murals that I mentioned earlier. We will be creating art parks throughout. So some of those green spaces will also have artwork. And Eddie, and the majority of retaining walls that you see here, these sort of blank concrete walls that are around the site today, will be incorporating these art murals as well. And you can see there's quite a few uh, we anticipate about a dozen of these locations, and you can see those red stars throughout. And that's those stars are just indicating the retaining walls, so those concrete walls. But in addition, we have the um, we have the sculptures that I was just showing, and those um, those trash enclosures. Those three walls on those trash enclosures will also be used for locations for art murals as well. So you'll no longer be looking at that those steel fencing. And now we touch upon the landscaping itself. I'll just quickly go. Originally, essentially, 
It was all open area. We didn't have the low fences. Today is the center photo as you see it today. All those red lines are those low fences, which really sort of hold things down and really um, negate the openness and detract from the original design intent. Uh, and to the right, just probably maybe one or two areas uh, that may warrant fencing. For instance, in this uh, case, it was the um, community gardens, just to keep it organized. And we had the dog park, as I mentioned before, indicated over here, which is uh, probably not going to happen there. Um, so just heavily landscaping and improving upon all the areas. That's what you start to see here, uh, ground cover. Uh, you can start to see in this photo, and I don't recall if we have another one, there are a lot of um, very old trees uh, from 1930s when they were originally planted. They're completely overgrown and they're literally hanging on top of the buildings, on top of the roofs and creating maintenance issues for the roofs, for the masonry. Uh, all the trees will be pruned appropriately. Some will be removed as we get into the process. The arborist will come on, onto site and be very specific how we carefully prune these trees to allow natural light to come down in, help uh, allow newer trees to be planted and to grow underneath the can those canopies, as well as let these original trees flourish when appropriate. If they're overgrown, they, they will be need, need to be removed. Oh, and here, here's the dumpster enclosure that I mentioned before. It looks like it might have just gotten uh, out of order there. But to the left is that existing sort of steel wall on the dumpster enclosure. To the right is our intention. We're going to use those as murals as well. Here are some of those pocket parks, as I mentioned before, uh, when the buildings sort of carve in and out, creating these nice little spaces that are completely underutilized. They're blocked off right now by those low fences and they're not landscaped. So creating just places of meditation and privacy, semi-private, where families can go and sit and enjoy those areas. So I know you have a very large uh, agenda tonight. That is about as fast as I can go through 43 slides on a four <laughs> acre, on a, on a four block site. Um, but that concludes my, my presentation. I'm certainly open to any questions uh, that the board okay. members may have. I've got, uh, it's, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, and just really quickly, um, our goal today is for the subcommittee to issue a recommendation to the full board uh, to issue a, a letter uh, to LPC uh, with recommendations based on this presentation, uh, whether approving, uh, denying, or issuing uh, acceptance with recommendations. Okay, I've got two, a couple. A couple. Two. The, first of all, it, it's fabulous. It's really great what you're doing and bringing it back to the original intention, which was so thoughtful and part, so much a part of the project. It seems the, that the the planting and the, the park park like aspect of it was very tied into the siting of the buildings and the buildings themselves. My two questions have first one has to do with the hardscape. You talked about the pavers that are around the flagpole. What are the what are the pathways? What were the original pathways made of? What are they made of now? And are you changing the pathways themselves? So so the pathways are asphalt and the intention is not to change the pathways. Um, we're simply going to repair any trip hazards and, and things of that nature at this point. Um, we, we do not, uh, generally speaking, we're not replacing all the pathways. The hardscape that is getting modified uh, was over by the building entrance, uh, building entrances that have uh, pavers were added to those sort of semicircular shapes. I don't know if you recall that, and we're going to be yeah. removing that to put the landscaping in. But the general uh, pathways uh, are going to remain as is, except for obviously tripping hazards or or puddle hazards or something, you know, flood flood areas or some of the poor drainage areas. So, so the pavers that you're adding are only around the flagpole, what you had shown. And Correct. originally, were the were there paver? Is that what the pavers, the pathways were? They, they were not all. They were not all. Um, let me see if I could find that slide. They were not all uh, favors. You can see they're kind of concrete, yeah. and it was just accents. This top left helps. They're just some accents of pavers, and that's where we got that idea. And we found that detail. Um, 
uh, which looked like it might have been around a tree at one point. So we're sort of repurposing the idea of putting the pavers around the tree to use it around the flagpole just to sort of tie that detail in. Okay. And then my other question has to do with the public art. Who, how, you you said, um, Brian, that you, you guys were curating it. Will it be an ongoing public art program? And will it change from time to time? And who gets, who are the deciders? And will there be any, will it be local artists that will be more considered? And I know that that's not LPC, but I'm just wondering. So, so I think our intention is to have it open and changing. And we would work, be working with the tenant association. There's also some non for profits that we've worked with in the past um, uh, for local artists that um, you know we, we would anticipate coming and and taking uh, taking part of this this project. We think there's a lot of opportunities. There's a few different actually non for profits that have uh, expressed interest in. in being involved in this, it has a, a lot of opportunity. So we'd obviously need to put them in touch with um, management and the tenant association uh, to make sure it's a, it's an ongoing and inclusive process. Okay. Do other committee members have questions? These were my two. Yes, uh, Trina. Yeah, me too. Okay, Steve, you want to go first, then Sante. Okay, thanks, Trina. Um, yeah, I have a, a couple of questions. First, regarding the benches. They seem like a pretty far uh, move away from the original design. Um, I know what's there now is, you know, not so great. So I'm just wondering, could have gotten something closer in design to the the original. And then um, regarding the murals, I really dig the mur murals. Just wondering if they're a uh, material that could be spray washed because, you know, the graffiti situation uh, with walls is, you know, it's just off the charts right now. And then the third thing is, last thing is the uh, the trees. I'm kind of shocked and alarmed at the idea of full grown, um, you know, shade trees being removed because they're quote unquote overgrown. Um, I'm somebody who, who works a lot in parks, and one of the problems with the parks is that there's there's no shade. And in you know 85 degree you know uh, summer days people are dying for for shade, and then there's just you know the climate factor, the nature, the nature factor, the idea of you know removing trees that you know are decades and decades old, um, and I wonder if that's even legal that to remove um, healthy trees. So that's that that's that. Thank you. So so, so thank you. So so. Benches, uh, you're absolutely correct, and that was a very recent comment from LPC. They asked us to swap out those benches for something more period correct, and we're in the process of, of locating something more postmodern, a little less flair, if you will, on them, and something that relates to the original design intent and architecture as well. So we're, we're on the same page as, as you on that. Um, as far as the murals and the actual paint will we'll have to work with the the artists and find out. I just I, I only know of uh, anti anti graffiti coatings for masonry uh, that help you know allow you to sort of remove it afterwards. So I'd, we'd have to work with the artist and find out maybe do some test trials to see if it doesn't ruin their artwork. Um, but certainly open to that. Um, as far as the trees, I may have overstated. Um, um, because we're we're not the intention is to make sure that we have shade areas and we're not just blanketly removing trees trees that are literally hanging on to the building that are overgrown in some of these little entrance pocket areas will possibly be removed nothing will be removed without the arborist you know without an arborist and the landscape architect um speaking very closely together and then you know having the resonance input also so everyone's aware of what what we're doing here um i, I for one love old trees um i think it's beautiful um they just need to be maintained and they need to be cleaned up uh and we need to lighten them if you will to allow for the the natural light to come down below uh and, and allow the other sort of tertiary, secondary and tertiary levels uh, to grow as well. Sante? Uh, yes, oh, hi, Brian, um, Sante here. 
uh, well, very fast. I was happy to see that the first picture was about window and the window were fully open 90 degree. You know, it's unrelated, but I wish we would have seen the rendering before. Uh, but going back, uh, same comment, uh, I believe Steve Chesler pointed to all the things that was uh, definitely, uh, you know, interesting saying something. Uh, I was wondering the same, <clears throat> same issue about the, the trees. Uh, let me see some not. Uh, I saw a lot of flowers in your rendering, so I was wondering, uh, that's great. Uh, have that, but are you planning in uh, looking at uh, uh, kind of native planting, native flower? Because uh, I don't know how much you'll be able to do maintenance. So it's nice to see the rendering, but looking at, you know, things that could really be sustainable uh, in a long terms. Uh, definitely comment about murals. Definitely are going to be covered by graffiti. That's uh, 100% for sure. So maybe thinking of giving opportunity to have actual, maybe contemporary uh, uh, murals there. I know may be historically not correct, but that may open the door to actually to have those uh, murals more respected. Uh, something I would explore if the community will feel open to that. Uh, uh, and again, benches, for sure, you have to focus uh, on, a, on a more modern design. Uh, those are definitely more like Victorian type of bench, even if they're a little more modernized in a way, but uh, I know you already had response to that. Um, yeah, beyond that, uh, yeah, again, the tree is very important. Uh, actually, a question about the tree. Even when you, if you remove a tree and you were mentioning to plant a new tree, how old will it be the tree? Because this is a very recurrent issue. You know, tree are cut, tree are removed, uh, different species is the size to be planted. But then we put down a, like a one year tree, which will take 15 years to grow. So when is the case that you have to replant a tree? Will you plant a tree grown enough to provide all and perform this equally like the older tree, you know? So those things to, to be more specific. Yeah, I saw the specific of the vegetation. Okay, that's great. Yeah, and just to just to comment on the on the vegetation there, uh, what what the landscape architects were, were able to uncover, and obviously this is their expertise, as they went through the original plantings, they realized, and, and it sort of was the trend in in the 30s and uh, early 40s uh, to bring in these sort of quote unquote exotic species from Europe uh, at the time. So while they planted uh, a lot of those species at, at that time, they never really took or became invasive um, in North America, in, in our case, the Northeast. They just weren't the right type of uh, 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 species uh, to, to plant. So very cautiously, um, you know, that's why, that's why we took the time and the effort to bring in an expert, Dirt, Dirtworks, as I mentioned before, the licensed landscape architect firm, uh, who not only obviously does the historic aspects of it, but they know the vegetation, they know the right plants. And I just wanted to quickly bring bring this up to you. You know, these are the species uh, of the vegetation, the plants, and, and so forth that they're specifying, so we know they're native and they will survive here. Uh, Trina, I have something. Dell here. Okay, Dell, and then I know Willis had a question. And Katie had a question. So Dell, okay. do you want to something? Uh, just with respect to the trees and the murals, I I would, I would hope that you could have a specific plan for getting the uh, opinions of the tenants. I think you'll find that tenants will have definite opinions on which, what shade is really important to them and which trees are, are important. And I think their opinions should be at least taken into consideration. And with the murals, if you could have the tenants involved in choosing the artwork, you may have a better chance at the community feeling that they have ownership and um, pride in, in the, the artwork. That's all I have to say. Yep. No, I, I definitely agree with that. And that's something uh, we're really taking to heart here and working with the residents to come up. Uh, with what they want to see at those mural areas. Uh, as far as the trees go, um, uh, I, I don't want to throw uh, the residents of Williamsburg houses under the bus, but the trees were actually something that was first brought to our attention by residents, um, that the site is uh, too overcast from the trees. 
um, and they wanted more light to come through. And so we are trying to find a way that's a happy middle ground between keeping these beautiful trees that have grown um, since the site, you know, was initially developed, uh, coming up with ways to remove the the branches overhanging the roofs that are causing uh, leaks in the apartments. Uh, and making sure that the residents have sufficient light coming through, which we're also actually working uh, to put in better lighting, uh, site lighting at the site, uh, because it, it was initially brought to us as a, a safety concern, uh, believe it or not. Okay. Okay. Willis? Thank you. Willis? Um, just real quick, my question is about if you guys have looked at ways to collect stormwater on site from all the paved areas, green infrastructure, rain gardens, um, it should be a real priority for when you're redoing landscaping to prevent combined sewer overflow and capture stormwater on site. So th thank you for bringing that up. Um, yes, so we're heavily landscaped here, as, as I mentioned before, so that absolutely gives us opportunities to do rain gardens. Um, that's sort of our, our next stage of design development, I, I call it, when we get into the the working drawings with the landscape architect, but absolutely, uh, it, it, it's it's absolutely important here. So we can make sure we incorporate rain gardens. Or Especially with the acid. Um, Haiti, do you have? Katie Nabletarski? Yes, thanks. Um, I echo what everybody says about the trees um, and that a lot of tenants be uh, surveyed to see what they think um, about that. Um, I love the of course, historic murals. Maybe um, some could be given a chance and there can be a mix of uh, uh, the historic and uh, new. Um, and then something which hasn't been brought up um, the lights, uh, what color will the light be that comes from the lights? Uh, these days, the bright white light uh, is popular. Um, of course, that wasn't what it was originally. And it's not something that's spoken about much, but I think that the cool blue light, I find um, personally um, not appealing. So um, if you have a choice, then... And <laughs> Maybe that's something to uh, decide one way or the other about. Had that been discussed, Brian? No, no we haven't gotten to the uh, the temperature uh, of the the luminaire yet. Uh, not no, um, but that that's certainly good input to to discuss that. And I know that there was a comment in the chat. I know some of these things are out of the scope of LTC, and so when we come up with our resolution, we'll stick to what they want. That's good input, you guys. Absolutely. Is there a thought to do composting on, on the premises somewhere? Have a composting program? So historically, uh, in our other community gardens that we've developed on uh, NYCHA sites, we have not had the opportunity to composting. I think a lot of it uh, comes to what sort of technical assistance we can get for the garden. Um, at our Ocean Bay site, there was a local community garden next door that did have a composting program, uh, and that sort of took care of that aspect. Um, but it would be definitely something that we'd be open to. If anyone has any recommendations for uh, local um, sort of urban gardening uh, not-for-profits uh, that might be interested in doing technical assistance with the residents, I think uh composting would be one of those things if we had the technical assistance for it to assist residents uh it would definitely be something we'd be interested in there is a north brooklyn composting and so we can put them in touch with you great do any other committee any other committee members uh, people there have questions or i comments? think we should really move on trina uh someone okay. did just point out on the chat that it's 7 30 and we're still on the first item so okay. um okay yeah. I just have one question before you do. I'm sorry. Did sure. the Penn Association and the residents of the development approve their plans? So uh, we sort of have to do things in a bit of a different order um, because we need to present something to residents that they can actually, uh, something that's actually achievable. And so what we've presented to residents in the recent meetings uh, has been 
that we are going to approach uh, CB1, LPC, uh, State Historic Preservation and National Parks um, with this sort of menu of items. And then we will be pulling them amongst residents um, to confirm which are the top priorities. Uh, and then that will dictate the final site plan, but we want to make sure that all of these elements that we are proposing are things we can say to a resident. If you select this, we can actually move forward with it. And we, we actually do have uh, a third party uh, resident uh, liaison or independent tenant advisor, uh, urbane development, uh, who is not part of the development team, but is strictly acting as a, someone who represents the residents. They were selected by the TA. They are paid for from the development, but fully selected by the TA, interviewed and sort of without input from the development team. Uh, and so they will actually be facilitating that process to get resident feedback on the scope and advocate for uh, what residents want to see in the scope uh, or things that they might not want to see in the scope, such as the dog run. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. So, so if, that, if people don't have knowing that we have to move on, and if no one else has anything that they want to chime in quickly with, I think we should come up with a resolution approving the the proposed um, plan with um, with 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 a recommendation that they um, find a more look into a more um, period correct design for the benches and also um, that they concerning the public art that they they definitely make use of a tenant committee and also look into the potential graffiti removal um, for, the, for the bureaus and um, most importantly the trees that that they work with the members and really work with the tenants too before they um, undertake any taking down of grown, full grown shade trees I make a motion to uh, adopt your resolution, your recommendation. Can anyone second it? I second. Okay. Do we need Do we need a roll call vote, or can we just can anyone can anyone who has Can we start with the no's, and anyone with a no can chime in? Anyone that um, and all in favor then. Aye. 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 So can we call this unanimous? This is this is the last chance to, for anyone to say no or you abstain. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we'll move on. I just before we move on to the next item, I just want to mention that uh, we are very privileged to have R Richard Barrick from the Borough President's Office here this evening. So welcome, Richard, and thank you for being here. All right, the next item is 114 Kingsland Avenue, and there's a presentation on this uh, application. Hi, Elise so. Holader from Eric Palatnik, PC. Um, I have trouble sharing on WebEx, so Haley, the architect, uh, would like to share the presentation. Hi, everybody. I'm Haley Padgett with Jay Frankel Associates. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Thank you, Haley. Um, also with us tonight is um, Barbara Cohen, who did the economic analysis because last time there was a few questions on that. So we had her come to this presentation. So whenever you're ready, I can begin. Please um, begin. This is an application for a use variance filed pursuant to 7221 of the zoning resolution. Um, it's in an M11 zoning district to permit the development of a four story, 45 tall, 5,210 square foot residential use building on the premises. Um, you can see it. This building, we're stuck in this situation because you can see the R6B is right next to it. And the R6B was part of the 2009 Greenport Williamsburg rezoning. And on the other side of it is an IBZ. So on the same street is an R6B. And that's what we try to reflect because this. Street has historically for over 100 years been residential, but we were exactly on the cutoff. So you can see this is a tiny little site. It's um, 25 feet and then it's irregular. So parts of it are 98 feet and parts of it go up to 93 feet. 
So this is the radius map. So you can see that this was historically residential. I don't know if I have said we're looking to build 8 units here that match a lot of the buildings across the street. It's in between 2 residential um, sites. You can see that on the on the map and there's 1 or 2 commercial buildings on this block, but it's mostly residential. Um, what kind of commerce? What, what are the commercial buildings? Um, the commercial buildings, there's a bodega on the street. There's a real estate um, office on the street. Um, and a few, sure. um, you can see yeah, here is a cleaners. So small um, types of commercial uses that go with residential use that people in a residence would need like cleaners, a small office. A bodega, and that's the site. Go go back, Haley. Sorry. To the to the map or to the Google. Uh, so where that picture was, that was good because it showed. But you can see in a lot, it's in between two small residences. So this has been sitting like this in 1965, approximately. The residential building that was on it burned down, and then it was used as just a trucking site, and it's been sitting like this as a trucking site since. 1965 in between these two residences. And how, how, how tall do you want to make your building? Four, four stories, 45 feet tall, which is comparable to the building across the street, which we have a nice, um, bulk. Uh, drawing that's so that building is comparable to that building and then go to the bulk. Sorry. These are photographs. So it's comparable to the building across the street, which is in an R six B. So that's what we look to make it comparable to. Okay. So next, the uh, these are the plans. It would have eight units, and I think I would like to tell, based on comments from last time we met, I would like to talk about what we looked to do before we decided on this. So. We first looked and said, can we build commercial or manufacturing space? And there's a lot of reasons we couldn't do that. One is it's a really, really narrow street and it's on, it's on the cross. So, so you can go back. So it would not provide enough room for any loading or deliveries. And the office space, it allows 1.0 FAR and it would be in between two residences. So I don't think either of those residences would really appreciate having deliveries or an office space or something like that. We wanted something historical and comparable, but also it would have to be a 1.0 commercial space, which wouldn't, we did an economic study, which we can talk more about if necessary, but it wouldn't been, it wouldn't work economically for us either. This was the best option for us economically. And that's why we proposed it. And then we can't go back to what we had before without asking you for a variance. Anyway, we need to have a use variance because the site's been vacant with no build on it since 1965. So we were really in a tight position here because of the size of the lot and its historical use. And the fact that our, we're on a such a narrow street on a cross. Uh, right, and to piggyback off of what Elise was saying, um, from a design perspective, um, you know, we're between two buildings that are existing residential um, and on that, for our street wall condition, we paid homage to, you know, finding a midway point to connect the street better. Um, and with that, you know, there's a lot of discussion of in our last meeting, like what, what is the street presence and what does that become? And so we would set back about six feet. Um, and in order to do that, you know, we're taking, you know, valuable space from the front. But what we'd also do with that is try to plant something um, with some local fauna or flora that would actually work in the area, grasses, something low maintenance, um, but also something that creates a buffer between our building um, and the sidewalk. Um, if we want to talk a little bit, at least you mind if I go ahead and talk a little bit more about the design? No, go. I think the design is probably, we look to do something that fit the neighborhood. So explain mm -hmm. away, have a good time. <laughs> so yeah, eight, eight, eight units, like we said, um, and four floors, uh, majority of them are going to be one bedrooms. Uh, I think that we've all learned that having a, a room to close off, especially during these WebEx meetings and Zoom meetings is very important. Um, and one of the other units that we have would be a studio, but it would have an accessory cellar space. So there's a way to escape. Um, a big thing about Greenpoint, um, I used to live in Long Island City and would bike back and forth all the time. It's 
it's, it's about the bike parking. So um, with quality housing, of course, we have our uh, requirements, but we wanted to make sure that it was something on the ground floor, easily accessible um, for the residents. Um, and, you know, we can kind of go off a the theme interior decor of, of bicycles. Um, and then some of the units, I mean, they're pretty, pretty typical. We don't have to do an elevator because of our height and with this small um, site and lock coverage, but, um, you know, storage is important. We've added storage and washer dryers, something that has come up a lot in the designs as of late are trying to avoid shared spaces when they're not needed. And so having a washer dryer stack in each unit would be really important to this. Um, and then some of the units have an outdoor connection. So um, some type of balcony that would connect them to the outdoors. I think that our apartments and condos have become very important to all of us. Let's also make it very clear that we are doing apartments. Um, these are not going to be condominiums. Um, and then other than that, uh, our facade, we have just, you know, kind of started to dapple and we'd probably keep it brick clad, um, maybe with some metal um, accents and balconies, um, some type of nice coverage um, from the elements for that entryway. Um, but yeah, that's the design. We want to keep it clean and concise. And if there's any questions, please let us know. Uh, yes. Are you certified yet? Have, is, are you on the clock this is, yet? This is not a ULERP, so we're not certified. And also, in addition to that, we're not on the BSA calendar. It's a BSA application. So yep. is there, so, but do we, do you need us to vote this evening? We do not need you to vote this evening. If there's any recommendations that you, your board sees would be fitting, we can come back and meet again if necessary. But you will ultimately need uh, a recommendation from us, or you would yes. like a recommendation. Yeah, the board of, if the, you want to say anything to the board of standards and appeals about what you're looking to see there, we definitely need a recommendation from you. Um, that is something the board of standards and appeals looks to see from the community. Anybody have any questions or comments? Uh, yes, still. Yes, thanks. Um. Yeah, so um, my, my general feeling is, you know, the and most of the buildings or properties nearby are, are residential. And so, you know, why shouldn't this um, owner be deprived of, you know, creating residential there? But I saw Willis's co co um, comment about, you know, the size of the building. Yes, across the street, there are four-story buildings, but next, you know, on either side of it, it's it's much shorter. And so, so I, I guess I'm, you know, favorable to the idea of creating residential units. But I, I worry about the gentrification factor of introducing market rate housing in this area. So I feel, you know, I think the question was posed to you before, but posed you again about the owner, including, you know, a couple of units of affordable housing um, in his um, in his project. Sorry, you faded out a little for me. Can you repeat the question? The owner, I lost you a little bit after that. Sure. Um, yeah, just. Uh, I'm worried about the gentrification factor, though I'm, yeah. I'm in favor of the idea of, you know, residential here. Um, love to see a couple of units of affordable housing um, included in the building. And I guess for us, the, the issue with that is because this building is so small, we had to do a financial analysis um, and we had the financial consultant with us and we didn't really make any return on the investment. It wasn't worth it at all unless we provided a few units and doing residential there's not this isn't like a ULERP application with MIH it's just really small so financially it's just very difficult for us. Is, uh, is there the inclusionary housing available as an option? No because this isn't a ULERP this is a variance so it's much 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 smaller on a much much smaller scale. Um, if you we could potentially look at doing different kinds of units here if the board would want but we just it financially this is going to be a small building and this we look to do what we could do and break even pretty much. Right. Yeah. But it's just you know, in, injecting, you know, um, you know, market rate units into, you know, kind of the edge of uh, the, you know, beyond the rezoned area, um, you know, just that's it, troubling. And, um, you know, I, I know, so I know this is an Uller, but I know that I live across the street from a couple of buildings um, that, you know, um, one is six stories, the others one eight because they had inclusionary housing. They included, I think, two or three units of affordable housing. 
So um, I know this is you know not Euler, but if there is a way to um, you know to work those in there, I would you know feel better about the uh, understood. You know, and, um, um, sorry, I just thought, can I just add that there are there is a, a fairly big range of affordability. You wouldn't necessarily have to have. It, since it's such a small building, you wouldn't necessarily have to have, uh, you know, the lowest uh, end, the lowest level of affordability. Barbara, are you here? Sorry, something. Um, I would say something yes. too. Could you speak to to your study at all about my hand? Is someone, is... <laughs> someone had a someone had a question, but. No. Okay. Yes. Uh, Sante, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, no, I have, uh, sorry, my camera is back on. I, I was having some problem. Uh, now, one question. Uh, is this a new owner or this lot or this is uh, uh, somebody on the space for a long time? So, so this, this, this lot was purchased in 2018 and the owner looked at a bunch of different things they could do and they looked at what would be the best for this. And this has a historical use of residential. So that was determined to be the best use. But the owner looked through all the, as I tried to explain before, the manufacturing, you can't really use this as a manufacturing commercial. It would be, it wouldn't really make sense either here. It would be too small. They can't really have deliveries. So a lot of different factors were taken into account. And this is what the owner felt would be the best looking at all the different variables in this slot. So. Yes, it, it was purchased in 2018, and we come it, to your board asking for recommendations. I, you know, if I had to be honest, I, I personally feel if somebody purchased a lot in 2018, it wasn't long ago, uh, uh, so it could have been purchased in the assumption asking for a variance. Uh, I always fear the precedent or things happening, and I know we making reference across the street. But it could be many other uh, similar lot who would want to do the same. Uh, both existing residential building may decide to become bigger and add other two stories on top or warehouses, which it seems that they uh, are not important. But I always have been advocating for this type of uh, smaller industrial spaces, which are important for a uh, smaller scale of manufacturing, maybe many time craftsmen, maybe many time uh, woodworker shops, so small metal worker or artists uh, themselves. So really, and I mentioned at our public uh, meeting, I believe uh, still there is a potential amount of revenue that is possible to make both uh, as a small one story warehouse, also as a, uh, uh, even as a parking lot, I believe Willis Elkins uh, made the comment uh, uh, before. Well, it, 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 yeah. It's just Sorry, a matter. It, it's just a matter. I believe if we want to look at it in, more, in a more specu if we can make a speculation or if we can still produce a revenue. I believe this space can still produce a, a revenue. The the actual zoning. And, well, and it, it has been a parking lot since 1965, but on a historical residential block. It's not great for two Nate two residences to live with a trucking lot in between them. It just uh, yeah, but but with an artist uh, using the space for as his sculpture studio, which uh, is very difficult today uh, for the community of artists to find space where it's possible to make certain kind of production. Offer smaller, uh, very uh, part of the community craftsmen that uh, may need space to that scale. That's all. That's my comment. Sorry. Understood. And I think that the issue is that putting this in context to what this board sees so frequently is uh, developers or owners who buy a lot that has one zoning with an intention to use it as another zoning. So I, I think what you're hitting on is is kind of a sore spot more generally um, than this specific site. Yeah, and I would like to say that um, the board can and has in other. We've had a lot of. Historic M1 residential tiny little lots around the city. It happens all the time. And in a situation like this, I would say that the board can make very specific recommendations and say their feelings towards making sure that M uses don't go anywhere, or however they feel about it, and really make this a very specific recommendation because I understand that you don't want M districts to go away or you don't want to 
just tell people they can build whatever they want, but to write just whatever you say, I would say that you should focus that in your recommendation and just really let the board of standards and appeals know. And this project can be very focused as opposed to just allowing precedence for anything to happen. Uh, well, let me just uh, in interject here that um, I think what Corey and Sante are hitting on is that I think the concept comes up over and over again that no one put a gun to the purchaser's head to pay the speculative price that they paid, assuming they're going to get a variance. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that we've been living with and dealing with. And the other, uh, the, your suggestion that we can make it focused, well, that's what every developer says to us. They all, everyone comes and says, well, just make it for this, this site. Um, just, you know, give us the variance. So this is, um, this is a very real struggle and we keep asking, well, what is the real benefit to the community? If you won't even agree to some kind of, um, um, limit on, on the rent that you would charge in, you know, a small number of the units. Okay, and Bar Barbara, Barbara you ever, yeah, can, I, can you add anything about um, what we did in the economic analysis? Because, yeah, I was I was going to jump in anyway. Um, so the the board of sins and appeals is very cognizant of the fact of of of, um, uh, of developers uh, who 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 buy and may have overpaid, and and now they're you know seeking a variance to offset that decision the the board uh you know has very specific criteria in terms of one how the financials are done but um and go through a pretty rigorous um process of determining exactly sort of how much is enough to make the 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 developer whole and and they say it very often that they're they're not there to make anyone rich but just to be able to offset the the challenge that the site itself and it's it's always about what is it about the site that creates a challenge to producing um the uh an as of right uh um uh, scenario and i would point out that that the the as of right, uh, which is the commercial building scenario, um, yes, is it reflects the site. It's very small, et cetera. And um, the assumptions for the rent is actually at the high end. And it's, and it's, it's not really warehouse rents. It, it's more towards what would be office type of use uh, rents. And then you have to balance that with, of course, the, the cost of new construction of producing the product um, and then evaluating what, you know, what, what do you get and, and, and what type of uh, uh, prospective tenant can find it um, uh, useful. And all of those factors go into the, the analysis and you're either able to come out with a, uh, with a, a small profit or, or it comes out as a as a loss and and the loss is really reflecting the challenge of the development of the site um the the residential the proposed plan whatever that is in this case it's residential is the balance again between producing it the the what it provides you with in terms of a unit mix what is the uh, um the rent assumptions of which all, by the way, both the 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 value of the site, the all the the rental assumptions are all based on recent sales and and comparables in the area. So it's it's not it, just sort of making it up, um, and which are also re viewed very carefully um, by the board. And uh, and then it's a matter of is that representing. Um, uh, again, just enough to offset uh, the hardship that's inherent and reflected in this narrow, small site, yes, between two residential uh, uses. And the truth is, is it if the fact that it's remained undeveloped for such a long time, 
tells you a little bit about if there's a market for something, someone would have done it, you know? Um, so, I mean, basically, you know, we, certainly my report and, and um, all the submissions do, uh, you know, f fall within the framework of how the BSA um, evaluates um, what the hardship is and then what is the, the, the relief that is that is um, um, enough. So very often, yes, people propose, you know, uh, 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 projects that that are a little too aggressive, and very quickly in their analysis of the costs, the rents, the cap rates, all the all those different factors, uh, streetscape and character, and uh, lots of other things, and and the board will very clearly say, uh, this is this is not the minimum variance necessary it's it's too much go back and 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 uh, adjust this that or the other thing so so they they do you know keep an eye out um for what is appropriate and and what is the level of relief that is uh, warranted which again relates all the way back to the site itself and what is its uh, uh, challenge to development. And Dell, if I may say something. Yes, please. Um, again, it, you know, I echo what Sante and Courtney and, uh, you know, Dell is saying is again, when the, you know, um, when the purchaser had, you know, purchased the property, they knew that it was M land. Um, I'm understanding, you know, the grandfathered, you know, hardship and, but I would like to know what exactly when you did the economic, you know, um, analysis between doing a, even a commercial building and I'm not even, you know, I'm not even saying, you know, light manufacturing, but the commercial building versus the residential, um, because Again, like Sante said, there's still, you know, there's there's a big demand for smaller spaces now. And um, someone had mentioned about, you know, even getting deliveries and um, what about the business that's on the corner of Beagle who has, you know, tractor trailers um, and gets their deliveries? How are they doing it every single, you know, day? Um, so I don't think that's, you know, a, a good enough excuse. Um, so I'm just curious as to what is the economic analysis comparable from residential to, um, you know, the commercial aspect of it. And three, I also want to know, you know, again, you're asking for the variance. You, you know, you knew that this was M land um, and what is actually the community benefit and we, you know, you should look at at least providing affordable housing um, or, you know, low, you know, low income. So I just, I want to point that out if, if the variance goes through. Did you have any uh, response to the uh, Karen's question about the economic sure. analysis? Sure. Um, the, and uh, I'm assuming you ha all have the full report, but I will say in terms of the pricing of the of the um, uh, the site, uh, the applicant uh, um, uh, paid um, what was uh, the market for for M1 sites, and those those comparables are are in the report, um, and that's what the 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 site value is is based on so that's one cost right the per this this is in terms of how the financials are done so you have to buy the site that's one cost the the next cost is is building it and the brick and mortar that, that the commercial building um results in it is what it is i mean it is what what building uh the one story building costs so those are so sort of the heavy cost side and then you have to sort of say so what is what is the the rent in the area for 
commercial space. And again, least comparables are shown in the report. Um, they're, um, a, uh, I think, I think if I'm not mistaken, there, um, uh, I think twenty eight dollars is used, which is pretty high end. Um, and that was that was when the report was done. But um, uh, and so what it really, you know, it says, look, it's a small site. You can only get what you can get. Twenty twenty eight bucks if you can really get it times the the twenty three twenty five hundred square foot building. You know, one who the question is, who has the ability to pay it, and is it enough to offset the costs? And the the answer is no. The costs are 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 too much for the the potential rent. Um, as far as the residential, I mean, they're small units. They're they're one bedrooms. Um, the the rents will will um, uh, will reflect what. Area rents are um, again lease in the report. Lease comparables of uh, similar units were were used as a basis, um, and uh, uh, and so the you know again you got to pay for pay for the site and build the building and then have enough rent to to make to make it work um, and and just to make it work. It's not. Um, uh, excessive in in any any way, um, so I mean those are that's really the 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 way the BSA you know evaluates this thing and um, uh, you know and 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 does the match between you know is there a hardship what is it and 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 what and does the proposed plan um, uh, offset that hardship um, and. Uh, so, um, yeah, and to, um, just to answer, I'm like reading questions as they come up on the side. Someone just said, is there anything to prevent the applicant from flipping the site if the variance is granted? Whatever is granted by the BSA, whatever on the plans, once a BSA site, always a BSA site it has to build exactly what's on the plans. And that's it. And if you need to change anything, then you'd have to go back to the BSA and get that approved. And we'd have to come in front of you for it again. Um, I, 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 have, I, I just wanted to know, um, I wanted to know if Willis Elkins, if you wanted to say anything, because I noticed you had uh, sure. something in the chat. I think so. Well, I mean, just to that last point, just because it, it has to be a, a, an eight unit building doesn't prevent the applicant from reselling the property at significant profit. And I just feel like, you know, in the past few years, we've had so much of this where you know, the community is these sites are being used to turn profit for for people that are buying these sites. And if someone, you know, goes through the trouble of seeking a variance and turning it from an M zone to residential market rate residential, you know, what does the community get out of that? And the answer is really nothing compared to what the developer is getting out of it. So I just I feel like we're going round and round talking the same thing, but in short, I just I personally feel strongly that you know, oh, yeah. communities being used here for for the profit of someone who bought this property two years ago. So, uh, what would your recommendation be, Willis, if you have one? That they sh that we should recommend use of the site as is. So, as the architect and very far away from the financials in this situation, um, I appreciate everything everything everyone is saying, but I. Say I have no idea what they purchased it for. I don't know nothing of this, but we did explore what a 25 by 100 foot deep manufacturing lot would look like or a commercial space. And in this market where small spaces are not, we need to we need to open up spaces. We need to all have some breathing room. We probably need to compartmentalize just in case this happens to us again. So this being a manufacturing site, and, and I, I know that someone brought up what be Beater is. Um, I brought up Beater just so everyone can see. This is a one-way street and Beater's loading, which is already, as you can see, people are piling up on the sidewalk in order to accommodate that cannot happen on Kingsland Avenue because it's a two-way street um, and it's going to be 
feeding, um, this is the mouth of another road intersecting it. So there are limitations and we understand that our client didn't figure all of that into, you know, his purchase of it. But at the end of the day, if we don't build something for the for, infill this site, it's going to stay as is. And, you know, I, I am a Long Island city person and, and I love Greenpoint and I drive by and if we don't have eyes on the street in our community, then we're really missing out on opportunity for safety. So that's my piece and I, I hear everything everyone is saying, but take the developer out of the picture um, and, and let's think about what's best for the community. So I, I have a question. Um, it was yes. residential at one, it was residential at one point, correct? For how many years was it residential? It was residential probably for, so it was been there over a hundred years. It was probably 60, 70 years. Okay. Um, I, I feel that um, just speaking in terms of opinion of recommendation that there needs to be some kind of compromise. Uh, something is being asked for and something should be given. So uh, should be partly affordable um, and, and or uh, somebody put in a question here, can it be commercial and residential? So that there should be some some compromise. So ground floor commercial and residential over, or like manufacturing first floor, that there should be some give and take here. And I think we would be more than happy to go back to the the you know the developer the client and 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 go ask for whatever like for instance the commercial bottom or something like that and see if it's possible and and do it and come back and see, come back and present to you if that's something your board would appreciate. Um, so we, we have a, uh, a choice here, it seems to me, of uh, coming up with a recommendation tonight or having them come back to and giving them time to uh, speak to their client. Can I make a last uh, uh, re-emphasizing? Uh, but let, let's let's make it quick, okay? Because we have so, so many so. more things tonight. Uh, absolutely, I want to say that uh, I know that we can get trapped into this idea. There is nothing affordable, yeah. one unit more that can really <laughs> replace the loss of the, those small industrial sites. I don't know. I'm going to be without breath, and I don't know how many times I'm going to say. There is nothing that can replace the loss of these industrial sites, which are very important for entrepreneurial small business. And, and we can get into this trap. We are repeating ourselves. It's kind of boring at this point. It's just a speculative idea. How, how fast do you want to get your money? You can make money, and there is people in our board, they are real estate experts. They know very well. You can make money anyway with any uh, type of zoning. So let's just stop talking about this to justify. We decide how fast they want to make money. They want to make money in five years, it's not going to happen. Can you make revenue for the next 20, 30 years? Yes, you can. That's all. So uh, one thing I will mention is that we've had a f the, the last few committee meetings we've had has been have been uh, focused very much on the importance of maintaining our manufacturing districts and, our, and and protecting our industry and our manufacturing, including just small manufacturers, small industry. So it seems to me we have a choice of saying, no, we don't want to give up any more manufacturing sites. We want to keep that or do we consider some kind of a, um, a compromise here? And um, I think that we may need to come up to a, we, we may need, need a, a conclusion on that from the um, committee tonight before we send these people back to talk to their their client. I, um, I think that, oh, do you want an opinion, no, Del? No, Sorry. Fine. Yes, yes. I think that we should allow for a compromise because I think that we should see what could come back in terms of a give back because it is between two other residential buildings because it was residential for such a long time. It has, I don't know if it's ever been manufacturing. Um, I think that 
mostly when something is manufacturing, it should not be converted. But I think that this is perhaps is a different case. And I think we need to be careful and use uh, careful discretion. Just All right. Discretion. So are you making, a mo are you, are you moving to uh, have a vote on that? Uh, sure. I, 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 I it's Karen, second. wait, before we, wait, wait, okay. Wait, okay. Before Karen. we make a motion, okay. if we're going to do the, the scenarios, okay. in the compromise. Then you need to include, okay, commercial or residential overlay and or looking into affordable housing units. That's just my, my piece. Yep. If we're going to go this route, then we need to look at every aspect, not just one. Thank you. Right. So if we're going to do, um, um, let me make sure I get your clarification straight. If we're going to do a compromise, it would it would include commercial with residential overlay, or or residential with affordable units. Karen, is that correct? correct. Um, does do, does anyone make want to make I that have, motion? Can I ask one yes. question? Do they need to come back to us then with yeah, one yeah, or the other? Yes, yes. If if we say. If we say forget it, then why why have them come back to us? If we say forget it, we're just going to leave it as it is. But if we're if a more majority of the committee is willing to go with this kind of a um, compromise, then we would send them to their client with these with this, uh, knowing that they that we are willing to to um, look at a compromise. I I think that it could also be. A a possibility to Dell of man, small manufacturing, if that's what an artist studio would be. Sure, sure, or small it's manufacturing. If it, if it is manufacturing, we don't need to. This is, then they don't need anything. If they don't, they don't exactly. need anything. But <laughs> manufacturing with with residential. Well, then, yeah. If we come back with a commercial or manufacturing space, that would be yeah, yes. commercial or manufacturing with a residential overlay. So also don't get confused about manufacturing because when we have this light manufacturing one, one, so many things can be done. You know, the word itself is a scary Oh, manufacturing. You're not going to have a polluting manufacturing. You can do a variety of business yes. in this zoning. We're Absolutely. Clarify. Noxious new yeah, but, uses. Now, we need to move on. So, um, <sighs> okay. And Karen, why don't you make your motion and then we can vote on it and we'll do a roll call. Mm. Do, do you want to make the motion, Karen? Just check it out. Say something is silent. Yes. This uh, is it. This is the end because we have to move on. Or yeah, 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 if you're yeah, yeah, all no, willing no, no, to just... stay here till one in the morning, I am. But oh, I don't think you want they, to. When she came on, the, was pre the presenter said she doesn't need a vote. She just wants to hear what our recommendations are we vote you have to vote on this I mean, we I, need i need to know i i need to know what the majority of the committee is willing to look toward not not a final vote just are we willing to look at a at at this um at a compromise and then yes we she they would have to come back and and if if we're willing to look at a compromise part of this motion is they will talk to the client and come back to us I think it's a good and motion. We don't, we don't want to spend the time redesigning if that's not something you're interested in. So, Karen, why don't you make that motion? Look, either it will, either the majority of people will go for that or not. Let's just move on. So, Karen. Sure. I would like to make a motion to have the developer go back to the property owner to look into a compromise, which would be um, commercial light manufacturing with a residential um, overlay um, or um, an opportunity for affordable housing units. Any second? second? That motion. I second. Dr. Minsky. Okay, good. It's seconded. So, Jerry, would you call a uh, ro roll call on this? So this is just a uh, this is just a roll call of the land use committee, Dell. Correct. It's Tuesday. Um, it, I I 
Yeah. I guess does it have to? I guess it is just a land. This is use. just a land use item. Yes, it is just. So okay. thank you. All right. So, uh, Del Teague. Yes. Maria Vieira. Trina McKeever. Yes. My answer is yes. Maria Vieira okay. wrote yes. Gina yes. Barros. Yes. yes. Aaron Drinkwater. Yes. Boisha Indig. Ozita Kaminsky. Yes. Avram Katz. Abraham Leibovitz. Sante Michelli. No. Rabbi Niederman. Rabbi Niederman. No vote. Karen Nieves? Yes. Isaac Sofer? Robert Solano? Stephen Weidberg? Stephen Weidberg? No vote. William Vega? Yes. William votes yes. Simon Weiser? Yes. Simon votes yes. Michael Andrews. Yes. Michael votes yes. Keith Berger. No vote. Corey Canton. Yes. Corey votes yes. Michael Kawachka. Yes. Michael votes yes. Mengelin Lee. Mengelin Lee. No vote. Kate Napolitarski. Yes. Eight votes yes. Allison Stone? Yeah. Allison? Yes. Yes, thank you. And Jerry, Keith Berger's a yes. He's, it's in the chat. Fifteen yes, one no. Motion carries. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. All right. So you can. Um, do you want to come back the next month to, uh, to the next month's meeting? Do you think you'd be ready? If it's okay, we would like to uh, email with your community board to figure out a good date because we have to speak to the client, and if we have to redesign, we might need two months. I don't. It just depends what we have to do. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Thank, Thank you. you. So much. Thank you. So much. Okay, the next item is Department of City Planning presentation on the citywide text amendment. Hello, um, this is Alexandra Sabi. I'm designer and city planner for City One um, as part of the New York City Department of City Planning and the Brooklyn Office. Today, here I'm also joined by Alex Summer, which is the deputy director of our office. And several of my colleagues that are um, you know, experts for the text amendments I'm going um, to share today. I am here uh, because we want to give you a quick overview of four text amendments that to our standing resolution that the department uh, plans for them to enter for public review this month and next month. And they will. Um, continue. Uh, before all this happens, um, we wanted for you to know what is happening and, and why we're doing this at this time. So these proposals are uh, aiming to create a fair, more equitable economic recovery after uh, what has been happening in the past years. And we want to help local communities and small businesses uh, for a just part of recovery. So the four uh, projects um, that we're heading is aiming to improve accessibility in subway stations, to incentivize the creation of grocery stores in communities for healthy and fresh food access needs, to reduce barriers to establish and opening gyms and other health facilities, and to make DOTs open restaurants program permanent. 
these text amendments uh, are technically not part of Mueller, but any change on the zoning resolution must be reviewed by each community board. So all these text amendments will be reviewed by all community boards. A quick overview on them. The first one is the zoning for accessibility, um, subway stations and elevators. This is in collaboration with the MTA and the city council and the mayor's office for people with disabilities. We are proposing to expand and improve the zoning rules that allow the MTA to leverage private developments to help create more accessible subway stations. So today, only about 30% of the city subway stations are fully accessible. With this text amendment, we seek to expand the zoning tools that will help coordinate new developments near transit with the construction of improvements in those subway stations to ensure accessibility and capacity. Um, currently, we have some of these zoning tools in our resolution, but they're only applicable to very limited areas. Uh, most of them in Manhattan. So with this proposal, um, it will require property owners near public, uh, near subway stations all around the city um, to engage with the MTA and city planning uh, to provide a station access easements. And this will, this also is provided with some incentive um, in high density districts. Um, this, this project in particular was today presented to the uh, City Planning Commission. So it will be referred to you uh, in the next uh, days. And if the board wants um, an extended presentation of this project, either for the Land Use Committee or for the board, we are available um, to do that or to answer any questions today. Uh, let me just let me just say that we definitely I'm sure I can speak on behalf of this committee that we would like more information and I suspect the full board would would want you to come to and I know that your department is very available so I know that's not a problem thanks yes if, if we can get already a point of the agenda for your next uh, meeting uh, that would be great and we will come uh, with a full presentation on the zone for accessibility. Thank you. For okay, that. great. Um, now, um, what we call uh, what we call internally internally the COVID relief packet, and these are like three text amendments that are, are coming as part of what we have seen the city needs um, after what we have experienced during the pandemic. So the first one, uh, which I'm very excited to present to you, well, sorry for accessibility. So I'm excited. For this one in particular too is fresh, what we call fresh two, which is a grocery store program expansion. This is in partnership with the city council. Uh, DCP is seeking to expand the applicability of the existing food retail expansion for or to support health, which is the that's what the acronym means for the fresh program. This is a program that we have that offers both zoning and tax incentives um, to encourage the creation of more convenient, accessible stores that provide fresh fruits, meats, vegetables, and perishable goods, in addition to a full range of um, grocery products. This fresh uh, proposal, the expansion of it, seeks to bring the program to more communities. Um, as part of the communities that we're planning to expand, um, this program, uh, if approved, will be available for uh, community district one. Um, which now I'm sorry, you were breaking up. Could you just say what this was? What the aim here is with the stores? Just explain it a little bit more. Yes. So the fresh program uh, right now, what it does is it creates Sony. It has Sony incentives and financial benefits for developments that incorporate uh, grocery stores that provide fresh food um, within their building. And with the expansion of the program, uh, which is this project, uh, we are uh, expanding 
which of the community districts are eligible for this program, but also we're doing certain modifications to those Sony um, uh, incentives that are part of it. Uh, right now, seating one um, is not a part of the program, but with this project to expand it, it will be included. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thank you for that. Um, the second uh, part, the second project as part of the COVID relief package is called Health and Fitness Tax Amendment. So, since the creation of our Sony resolution, exercise gyms, licensed massage therapy, martial arts studios, spas, and other health related businesses are not allowed to build as a right in our city. And instead, they have to go through a lengthy and costly process uh, to obtain special permissions, um, such as in the Board Standards of Appeal and the new, um, Board of Standards and Appeals, my apologies for that, and our department to be able to get built. So this tax amendment, uh, it's, uh, it's to allow all of these facilities to be developed as a right or without for seeking any special permission from the city. So it's basically removing the obstacles in the zoning resolution for this type of businesses to open up a right without any process uh, with our agency. With the same uh, line of thought, um, we have seen, uh, we have the open restaurants tax amendment uh, this is in coordination with DOT. We have seen how the Open Restaurants Program has helped uh, re-energize our sidewalks and streets, but also support um, and to save uh, many small businesses and restaurants uh, and local jobs around our communities. Um, right now, that happened because as part of the emergency that we're in, a few of the obstacles were removed. Uh, but the ones most firmly, right? With this text amendment, it's seeking to pass uh, a program that is now that will be now uh, become permanent. So instead of having obstacles for restaurants and businesses to apply uh, to have open restaurants available on the sidewalks in the streets, now it will also become as of right. And lastly, um, we have a third, uh, a third package, which is uh, a hotels tax amendment. Uh, this hotels tax amendment, um, I think that I think you might be aware of it, um, since um, it's I think it's have made been public in January. But this is a major initiative. What it aims is to create a more consistent approach on the hotel development around the city. And with the tax amendment, it will require any new hotel uh, in any uh, in any zone district that is not um, available or applicable to be, to be developed as of right, to ask for a special permit um, and enter a user process in order to be built. So. Um, different from what I explained before. In this case, uh, if a person wants, if, if a proper planner wants to be a hotel, they will have to go through the whole process of public review, which also, which obviously includes coming to the community boards um, to be able to get developed and get your input and your comments on that. Um, so that concludes my quick overview on the, on the projects. As I said. Sony for Accessibility was certified today and, and uh, sorry, was referred today and is uh, now in a few days, I went that the whole package of materials will arrive to your desk. Um, our COVID relief uh, package, which is fresh two, the health and fitness facilities and open restaurants is expected to be referred to you in May, if I'm not mistaken as well as well the hotels. Um, and I imagine that, you know, we will be reaching out to you 
uh, again in case if, if you want to hear more details on any of them. And if today you have questions that you want us to answer, um, not only I'm here, as I said, uh, our deputy director is here, and I also have uh, three colleagues of my of the office, one of which um, is an expert in each of these projects in case you have something that we, that you want us to also do. That concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for allowing us to share with you uh, these projects. Thank you. Uh, we, the uh, community board has already voted in favor of the hotel text amendment requiring the special permit, just so you know. Okay. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions? Yeah, I, I, Bill, I have uh, hopefully a quick question on the first um, text amendment related to subway entrances. Would it apply to entrances that are that are would be fully, you know, inside of a building or next to a building, or both? I can jump in to take that. Um, Joshua, you, Department of City Planning Office. So, there's two parts of this text amendment. One would require any new development or enlargement, so permits filed with the Department of Buildings within 50 foot, 50 feet of a subway station, to first consult with the MTA and uh, City Planning to see if there's an opportunity for an easement, and if there is, the uh, MTA and city planning and the developer work together to find uh, a way that uh, worked for, for both parties. There would be some zoning relief if needed. It could be street wall or height or permitted obstructions. Uh, if, it, if they didn't take that space immediately, say that they uh, um, identified a good space for an easement, but didn't have plans to build that elevator in the next decade, the developer could use that as a temporary retail. Uh, and there's a chance that maybe the MTA doesn't need an easement there. There's um, at the adding an elevator is not feasible, and then in, the developer could just go on and, and file their permits. And those are medium medium density districts only. The second part of it is an incentive program that's only in high density districts. So in Brooklyn, it's only downtown Brooklyn Community District Two. So it does not apply to Community Board One, and it's a it offers a, a bonus in floor area for developers that are within 500 feet of a station and are willing to provide significant station improvements and those station improvements if they're for a subway station that does not have an elevator they would have, the first one would have to be adding an elevator as i'm sure everyone is aware a lot of subway stations are not uh, accessible only a little under a third have an elevator uh, so this is a way of working with private developers who are who have new uh, projects along subway stations and uh, incentivizing them, providing them opportunities to to help uh, the city with adding accessibility. Thank you. Yeah, something else if I can say. Yes. Uh, um, you mentioned, uh, Alexander, about uh, open uh, restaurant. Uh, uh, some concern that our community, or at least uh, in that portion of uh, the community that I'm part with, and some of the neighbor uh, community has come out. It's definitely, uh, it, we recognize as being very helpful to many of the, our neighbors and existing business. You know, they've been around, uh, but they've been largely, they opened the door to a certain level of uh, unregulation of things that used to be pretty regulated and they had impact on the quality of life of the residents. Many times uh, we have to do with mixed use area where, you know, uh, there are residents kind of both. So finally, uh, you know, those businesses that come outside, you know, they've been allowed to use amplified music and there are certain corridor that, you know, we define it the corridor now in Williamsburg or in Greenpoint. Uh, they've been really uh, definitely impacted by this quality of life issue. Uh, and also, we've been losing diversity. And so, while there are existing business, and this has been very helpful to those restaurants and those bars, uh, this has not stopped a new applicant uh, to come into uh, the neighborhood and apply, for example, for legal license. And this is killing also diversity. So, it seems that the open street 
they are good enough or they provide parameters that are sufficient to still produce revenue. And this is also killing diversity. I don't want to know how much uh, you know, DCP is really uh, making quantistic analysis really to evaluate what the impact uh, is, you know, and if we really are uh, working on quality of life, it's a major issue. There was a, there were many parameters in the CDS before, noises, sound, they were strictly regulated. I believe we're getting lax on that. Uh, can you comment on that, please? Yeah, hello, um, I'm Jesse Hirakawa. I'm actually, I'm also with the Department of City Planning. Um, I'll be able to take your question for that. Um, yeah, I think essentially the open restaurants um, text moment is kind of doing a few things. One, it's kind of addressing the zoning aspect, uh, right? The outdoor sidewalk uh, cafe text moment to approve for outdoor dining. And it's also allowing a lot more coordination with like multiple agencies like um, the Department of Transportation, small businesses. Um, uh, there may be more, but it's basically kind of having that conversation with more agencies to talk about all those, everything that you just mentioned, you know, the quality of life and, you know, how does it affect, you know, liquor license and um, it's looking at a, a wholesome approach to how to look at the open restaurants. And so, um, yeah, I don't know, Alex, if there's anything else I could jump in on, but I feel like it's opening up so that there's a lot of interagency coordination between all the other agencies to talk about any issue that is coming up to the many that you're explaining as well. But those has become um, a real issue, and we have not getting answer you now from the OT. Uh, it seems nobody is, but definitely the impact is real, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and the residents mm -hmm. are not having not being considered. Um, so it's something I want to bring really to it's, your attention. Yeah, I hear you. Definitely, this is definitely something we can make sure we we can address. Right. I think that um, hearing your concern, uh, when we come back to explain in detail uh, the tax amendment, um, we can incorporate, uh, we can dig and incorporate some of, of the knowledge um, to respond to your question. Thank you for that. I took Th notes on that. Thank you. So um, they're going to be coming back in May. So if there are no other questions, that you know, then we should move on because we have two rather lengthy um, issues to deal with. And so, um, unless there's some really burning question, I think we should move on because we are going to get to speak with them again in May, in our May meeting. And potentially June. <laughs> and potentially June. Yes. So, all right, then, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so the fourth application, the fourth uh, item on the agenda, I should say, is 315 Berry Street. And um, this is a special request to permit the construction of an elect electric utility substation on the roof of the existing building. Um, I know that we've had some people who have written uh, letters and asked to be able to speak tonight. So let's proceed. Hi, and uh, this is Rebecca Barr from MGN. I'll share my screen. Uh, we have a short presentation for you. We are aware that we, you know, we spent over two hours in the first three presentations. So we're going to try to make it as quick as possible. And we're going to open for um, questions after the presentation. So please, um, let us know if you have additional um, questions when we finish this. So let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. 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 Okay. All right. So um, good evening, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to um, we um, talk about reintroduce to the community board um, MGN and further inform this joint committee on the energy storage system or ESS for short and why these systems are critical for this community. So again, my name is Rebecca and I am in charge of the construction and safety at MGN. 
And also I am a longtime resident of Williamsburg and I'm, I'm also a neighbor to the community board offices on, on Graham Street. I actually live around the corner. Um, we, the presentation would hopefully provide all of the necessary information and address some of the um, concerns that were already expressed during our last call, um, as well as some additional questions that were raised by 315 Barry tenants. So this evening we plan to cover the following topics. We're going to give you a, just a short reminder on why we are today, uh, reintroduction of MGN and our mission. Um, we're going to explain what an ESS or um, energy storage and solar facility is and why we urgently need these microgrids. Fourth, we're going to be demonstrating why systems are safe to install and operate. We will also try to more specifically talk about the challenges of the Williamsburg grid and why Barry Street is the right for this project and how ESS benefits the community as a whole. Um, we're also going to cover the um, ongoing outreach and education efforts thus far and demonstrate how we are committed to keeping the communication line um, open and coordinate with the tenants and neighbors of 315 Barry. So, um, again, we are here tonight because we, um, we need to uh, demonstrate to the BSA why it's infeasible to locate this electric infrastructure project anywhere else. And therefore, 315 Barry was chosen as best fit. And also, we want to quickly talk about the, the fact that the site meets the sizing criteria. And then, um, of course, again, we want to cycle back to the um, tech concerns and comments that were made during our last meeting regarding structural capacity, noise and vibration, as well as other safety concerns. So, um, microgrid networks, um, MGN is a, a New York City based company. Our main offices are located on Grand Street with a team of local energy experts having a long history in renewable energy project deployment and operations. We aim to serve the local communities such as Williamsburg who are still to this day are suffering from a long history of environmental injustice and pollution um, and are also in experiencing grid congestion as well as elevated threats to life and safety and property damage due to our coastal location and increasing climate change events, as we're all aware. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the crisis and, and um, where it stems from. So New York City grid um, is the oldest and the most congested electrical grid in our nation. It's um, not really designed to withstand the looming climate threats and increasing demand. Um, as some of you or some of us already experienced personally in, in recent years. Uh, New York City power is also very expensive compared to the rest of the nation, and we need to uh, plan and invest in our future uh, resiliency in our city and push for infrastructure upgrades that will result in reduced costs for the consumer, which is all of us. So this, this is kind of a very quick comparison of the available tradition, traditional approach to um, dealing with overloaded networks, such as the Williamsburg network and what MGN as, is proposing to do here. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with peaker plants and the current inefficient ways of responding to the ever-growing energy demand and outages, in red you can see um, the only available like quote solutions to the energy crisis. Uh, unfortunately, one of them are peaker plants, which should be the way of the past. Um, and we will see in the following slides, um, the proximity of one of these plants to, spe to specifically 315 Berry. And um, if some of you are familiar, and if you're not, um, peaker plants are associated with health issues and they also go against the city and state sustainability goals. Um, and then the other alternative, which is very expensive and we all end up paying for it, is digging up the roads and adding wires to the network. Um, 
both of these solutions don't really um, offer backup power, which um, an ESS system does. So um, an ESS system or energy storage system combined with solar is a simple and elegant solution. It allows us to basically tap into the existing um, energy reserves that were previously inaccessible and therefore significantly improving our grid efficiency. We aim to directly displace the fuel, fossil fuel picker plants um, that have been polluting Williamsburg for many, many years. Um, we are also creating a path for a meaningful shift towards renewable energy in our community um, and therefore making them stronger and ready for the future. Energy storage facilities um, and these batteries that uh, will in fact help to reduce the consumer rates and will make the existing grid considerably more efficient. It is safe and clean and can be installed where the grid congestion is present, which is kind of an important point to make. Um, and just to make it very clear, the problem cannot be solved remotely. And that's why we need these projects to be implemented inside the community where the congestion is currently present. And in the Williamsburg grid, which is also known as the Water Street Network, um, uh, which is highly congested, if we're gonna add these type of um, energy storage facilities, we're gonna make it more resilient and future facing. So um, this is kind of just a quick overview of um, the different um, jurisdictions and authorities that uh, support energy storage and, um, and, and say that they're needed. So who says they're, they're needed? Basically, if you look at this slide, is everyone. It's from nonprofit environmental groups to local governments, such as the mayor's office, the state level, um, including the New York State Power Authority, NYSERDA, which is the uh, New York State Energy and Research Development Authority, on Edison, um, and all the way to the federal government. Um, actually, the, the New York State Energy uh, Storage Mandate is aiming for 1,500 megawatts in the next four years, and then we're looking at 3,000 megawatts by 2030. Um, and our project is just a small piece of that puzzle and we need to um, find a way to reach these targets. Um, with that, um, I would like to give the mic to Tim, who is our chief operating officer, who will explain in further detail the current, need, current stat, state of the Williamsburg network and the need for an ESS at 315 Barry specifically, as well as talk about some of the um, tenant outreach um, efforts that um, we had so far, the benefits to the entire community and address some of the tenants concerns. Tim. Thank you, Rebecca, and uh, thank you everybody for our time, for um, uh, the time this evening. Um, this is a map of the Water Street Network. The Water Street Network extends up, it's really the Western half of Community Board 1. It extends up as far North as Greenpoint. Um, it's this, the center of kind of Western Williamsburg. And then on the Southern end, it, it actually goes down into community board two and three in Fort Greene and, and the little uh, Western edge of bed -Stuy. It's called uh, uh, the Water Street Network because the substation that serves is in Vinegar Hill on Water Street. Um, this network is, is really one of the oldest in New York City. And it's, uh, it, it has a peak capacity of about 370 megawatts. Um, and that's you know, what Con Ed is, is, uh, has estimated as its peak. Currently, the um, uh, the cap or the capacity is 370 megawatts. Currently, estimated loads, peak loads uh, for 2021 are 390 megawatts. In um, 2022, is 400 megawatts. So essentially, what's happening is everyone is just using more power. Everyone has more devices. Power. Uh, people are starting to use uh, electricity for heat, and so there's a whole lot more electricity that is is coursing through the same old wires that are in the street. As you can, this, this map is actually developed by Con Ed, and you, the, the red spots are showing the parts of the network that are under most stress. These are the feeders that are mo the, the wires that are most, have the most um, overcapacity, they have the most electricity flowing through them, and they're, most, they're, they're closest to their capacity. As you can see, uh, 315 Berry Street sits in the dead center of this congestion zone. Um, it, it also sits just to the south and, and west uh, uh, of the Kent Street Peaker plant, right, which is uh, 
you know, been, been spewing fumes into the Williamsburg neighborhood for, for uh, a couple decades now. Um, next. Uh, so, so uh, Con Edison uh, was looking for, in order to solve this congestion, Con Ed has been looking for about 70 megawatts of energy storage inside the Water Street Network, not somewhere else, inside the Water Street Network. And it really needs to be in close proximity to those congested areas and those congested feeders. Uh, we surveyed over 200 sites over the course of three years in North Brooklyn in order to try to find sites to put this uh, energy storage. And we were looking to try to find as many storage sites as we could up to 70 megawatts. And we were the only people looking. As it turns out, no one was successful in finding sites except, uh, except us. And we only found two sites and they total 5.4 megawatts altogether. So the urgent need for the energy storage in this neighborhood is, is you know, still there. There is still a very, very strong need for energy storage. The network is still congested and is still um, uh, something that we have to work on together. Um, this map is showing all the sites that we looked at. You can see Barry Street is basically sitting right on this, uh, this feeder. Uh, what we're really looking for on sites is, number one, we have to find a site that has close proximity to the overloaded feeders. Number two, we need a site that can carry the equipment that has a structural capacity. You can't put it on any roof. Uh, Barry Street happens to be a, a very um, well-built building that used to be built as a munitions factory. There's a ton of room for load capacity. Uh, the third, the building must have, uh, or the site have, has to have sufficient space for the equipment. Uh, we can't take 300 feet here and 300 feet there. We really need six to 8,000 square feet. Um, and we must be able to rent it uh, long-term due to the cost of the equipment. We're essentially installing a very big pipe onto the electrical grid, and that costs a whole lot of money. So we can't put one in there and then uh, have to leave in five years. We really need a, a long-term commitment of 20 years for this piece of, really piece of city infrastructure. Um, next. As you can see the green uh, dot here, this is the Berry Street. You can see the, the, the red feeders, these are the, the, the very stressed feeders. Uh, it's very well located to uh, inject power exactly in, in, into the network when it's needed in the, in the middle of a kind of peak. Um, next. It's a little tricky to understand why energy storage uh, is interesting and useful. But I think uh, this, this graph at least helped me a lot. If you look here, this is a graph showing the, the energy use during time. On the left is the night and the morning, and on the right is the afternoon and evening. Each of these lines shows a progressive year. So the lowest one is 2018, and the highest one is 2027. Obviously, the, the 2027, these are estimates. This is a, 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 this is a grid from uh, Con Edison. So um, as you can see, in the, in the night and morning, there's plenty. Or sorry, this red line here is the, the ultimate capacity of the network. This is where the, the um, basically the wires start to get too filled and they have to sh be shut down. What you can see here is that there's plenty of capacity in the morning and evening. People are not using a lot of power at five in the morning and four in the morning. So right here, there's a whole bunch of capacity. Where there isn't capacity is in the afternoon and the evenings. This is when everyone is pounding on the network, when everyone wants a lot of power, and there's a huge amount of demand. Next. What energy storage does Energy storage, we charge these batteries that are sitting in the middle of the network exactly where the demand is. We charge them at night and then we inject them into the, into the network where the power is being consumed exactly when it needs to be consumed. Con Ed basically says, Whoop, we need power and then we inject. That's exactly how it works. So essentially what happens, if you have a bunch of energy storage in your electrical grid, what it lets you do is it lets you flatten the demand curve. So essentially we are taking the wires that are in the street that all of us have already paid for every month in and out when we pay for our electrical bill. We are taking those um, wires and we're making them more efficient. We're saying, we're, instead of replacing them, they don't need to be replaced. They just need to be used more efficiently. And that's exactly what, what energy storage does. Okay. Batteries are starting to be uh, widely deployed all over the place. Uh, you know, upgrading the electrical grid is something that everyone in the country is is uh, looking at because it's so important. Um, as you as you all remember, you can you cannot imagine two more different places in terms of the way their energy uh, their electrical grids are are managed from Texas and California, and yet both of them experienced a very large grid outage. 
And what we're here to tell you is that New York should not assume that we're different than California or different than Texas. It's just that it hasn't happened here yet. As you can see, a lot of people are looking at this. This is an article just from, uh, uh, from uh, a recent New York Times showing how this energy storage right, right here, this thing, it looks like a refrigerator. It's not a refrigerator, it's battery storage. Every apartment in this 600 uh, unit complex has their own battery storage in the unit, okay? Everyone I think has heard, of it. people who have not heard of the Tesla Power Wall, certainly us engineering types have heard about the Tesla Power Wall. It's designed to be hooked onto residential buildings. It's designed to be inside people's power rooms in their basement. Uh, this is not an unusual thing in, 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 today's, um, in today's world. There's currently three existing battery projects in New York, in Brooklyn, sorry, there's a lot more in New York City. The Marcus Garvey Apartments has energy storage. Uh, it's it's in, um, in Brooklyn. The roof of the Barclays Center has a five megawatt energy storage facility and the Gateway Center in Brooklyn has a five megawatt energy storage. That's a shopping complex. Anyone who wants to go see it can go see it. The Barclays Center is on the roof, a little harder to see, um, but, but you know, this stuff is not uh, uh, unusual anymore. Uh, next. So uh, we are using the most advanced battery on the market. It's made by Fluence, which is a, a company that's owned by Siemens and AES, two of the largest electrical man, uh, equipment manufacturers. It is. Uh, it meets all the, the global, national, and city safety codes. It's been extensively tested. Uh, it has the most modern uh, lithium lithium iron phosphate batteries, which are uh, not shown to to uh, propagate any fires or anything like that. So it's really it's it's a it's not only is it um, the best battery chemistry, but it has belts and three layers of suspenders. It's designed to sense what's happening in the energy storage and shut down if there's an issue. There's all sorts of fire. I, I, we can go through it in detail if you want, but basically it has uh, many, many layers of systems to, to make it very safe. Next. Um, there's a lot of people studying the safety of batteries. Um, and a lot of people, these are all the people that we, that matter in the New York, in New York city. The fire department in New York uh, has an extensive experience, um, you know, proving batteries. They're probably the national leader in the safe installation and operation of energy storage. Um, and, and all of the battery facilities, not, you know, even the ones that are, that don't require BSA, every single one of them requires extensive review by the fire department. Every single one requires extensive review by the New York City Buildings OTCR, which is the Office of Technical Certification and Research. So this is the, you know, kind of the engineers inside the buildings department, they look at it and they make sure that it's installed safely. And they also, you know, make sure that all of the, all of the um, considerations for the site are, are deemed safe. Um, of course, all of the equipment that we're putting in is UL listed. It's all been extensively tested um, and we have, some of the best engineers in the in the world working on this project with us. Uh, these systems are monitor, monitored safely uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Unlike all of those all of those batteries that you see in other people's houses, which are not monitored, this one actually has full time monitors, system engineers that monitor it. Um, MGN and the manufacturer have dedicated trained uh, safety teams on the ground in Brooklyn. Next. So th let's talk about the facility. So this is the roof of the, of the um, 315 Berry Street. The building was really originally built as a munitions factory. Uh, it was built with an enormous amount of, of floor load capacity uh, that is basically unused as a, as a residential building. That you can see in the center, there's a big old water tower base. The water tower is long gone. And of course, uh, over the years, there's been a lot of cell tower equipment, uh, cell phone equipment installed uh, uh, on the roof as well. Next. This is the a, a rendering showing um, that same roof from the same angle and showing what we want to install on the roof. These uh, blue cubes are those fluence uh, uh, battery storage cubes. Those are about eight feet by eight feet. We have, um, we're installing 18 of them. And then the solar panels are here. Uh, they're the purple. And then we have, uh, um, this is basically some sound mitigation uh, over the center of this. Uh, everything in green is the interconnection equipment. So that's essentially the equipment that, uh, that allows a switch gear and stuff that allows us to in inject the energy into the electrical grid. 
Uh, so there's a, a couple transformers here. These are uh, the high, uh, uh, two different levels of, of switch gear. And then these are the inverters. They will convert the DC electricity into the AC, the AC going into the electric grid and the DCs, because that's how you store it in, uh, in batteries. Next. Uh, this is the same roof, but from the from the um, a plan view, um, it, I just want to reemphasize that that this basically what this is all the equipment is all installed on dunnage. So it's essentially the equipment itself is not touching the roof; it's really sitting four feet above the roof, and the loads are carried across steel beams and then down into the columns. So it's not really impacting the the slab of the roof. And it's not impacting the exterior walls of the building. It's really impacting just the columns, which we have gone and, and measured uh, and, and tested the concrete to make sure that the, the that the you know that the columns and everything can accommodate the uh, the load. Um, also, you know, I should mention that uh, the building has an old roof. We're planning to replace this roof, and we're planning to add a, a whole lot of insulation. The building is currently the roof is not insulated. We want to put a layer of insulation in between the roof and the uh, and the, the roof slab. Uh, this way, it will improve the thermal efficiency. The apartments on the top floor will get um, not only drier because it's a brand new roof, they will also be quieter because uh, people walking on the roof, the sound won't transmit through the insulation, um, and it will be easier to keep those uh, warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Um, of course, the installation of this is going to meet all the city safety codes. For energy storage, and then also, of course, the city safety codes for equipment that's installed on dunnage all over the city. Next. Uh, so, so, of course, people live in this building and, and we're uh, concerned about them. We want them to uh, understand what's happening here. So, how long is the installation going to take place and how much noise will, will the tenants experience? Construction anticipated to take about three to four months. It's really three phases of the construction. The first phase of the construction is installing the dunnage. That's essentially taking those steel beams, craning them up and putting them in place. Um, the second is craning the equipment. So the battery cube and the transformers and switch gear will be craned into place. And then the third phase is probably the longest phase is actually hooking everything up and making sure that it's commissioning it and getting it all up and running. Um, like any construction project, there will be some drilling and, there, and banging and vibrations. But that is primarily going to be uh, happen during the dunnage installation, right? This is when you're taking the steel and connecting it in with the concrete building. Our work hours will conform to DOB regulations and will continue to will be in constant discussion with tenants uh, to meet their special needs as we have been uh, already. Uh, there's will be a tenant protection plan in place to minimize the impacts of the needs, and we of course will have a on-site supervisor for the construction, and everyone in the building will have. The phone numbers, my phone numbers, Rebecca's phone number, and also the phone number of the on site supervisor. Next. Okay, well, after the equipment is 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 up there, what is it gonna what, are there any safety issues or noise issues? We've done an extensive noise uh, a noise study. Um, essentially these batteries are solid state, so they don't produce a lot of noise. Your cell phone battery doesn't make any noise and um, your computer battery doesn't make noise. What does make noise is, is that some of the cooling equipment makes some noise uh, that that can be shown to uh, be mitigated pretty easily. And of course, the facility will meet uh, city noise code. Um, we um, again, the, the the equipment doesn't vibrate because there's no not really a lot of moving parts. Uh, so there, there's not really a lot of uh, concern about vibration in a facility like this. Uh, we of course will put rubber pads and mitigate. Uh, vibration and monitor the vibration to sure there's no disruption to, to building tenants. Um, the battery, in terms of EMF, someone brought this up. The battery doesn't produce any electromagnetic frequency. Um, it's that's not something that you know cell towers do. We, batteries don't do that. Um, any EMF produced by this uh, facility will be from the interconnection equipment, uh, which is essentially the same kind of transformers and switchgear that are are providing power to every building in the city. Um, so every building has to have transformers that switch the um, switch the power from 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 uh, uh, transmission lines to to building a uh, power that can be used in the building. Uh, that's either done in the street uh, and you walk over those things on the sidewalk, or it's often done in the you know second floor of the building or the basement of the building. Uh, that that's quite common, especially in flood zones. 
So uh, that kind of equipment is the equipment that's on the roof is equipment that's installed all over the city, the, the green equipment, uh, the equipment that's that's connecting the batteries to an electrical grid. Uh, emissions, this facility doesn't burn fuel uh, to produce power and has no form of operational exhaust. There's no odor emitted from it and there's no wastewater that discharged from it. It's all really solid state. Uh, next. Okay, community tenant engagement. Um, you know, uh, we have a, a commitment really to transparency. Uh, we think that the more people that know about this, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty relatively tech, uh, sophisticated technology, but we feel that the more people know about this, uh, the more that they're gonna support uh, projects like this and, and hopefully this project. Uh, we're, you know, wanna try to talk to people and, and engage with the community. Over the last three years in, in the community, we've had a very active engagement in North Brooklyn. We've met with dozens of local politicians and community leaders. We let, met with local nonprofits and environmental organizations. Uh, we're fully committed to educating the residents and stakeholders about clean energy and about this facility and how that fits in with the, um, you know, the, the move to, to uh, decarbonize the grid. And we're fully committed to, you know, addressing concerns by stakeholders and residents of the village. Um, we, we've tried to engage the tenant as much as possible. The, um, I, I think there's some people here going to tell me that I haven't engaged them enough. And if that's true, I'm here to engage you more. I'm happy to meet um, and have a Zoom. We've offered Zoom calls to every resident. Um, we're happy to have meetings in person if someone can't get online. Uh, we're happy to answer their questions. Uh, we we started out engaging last year when we were doing testing that was in the last uh, end of last summer and last fall, um, and we were quite engaged with, with several tenants in the building. And I know a lot more have now written letters and every single one who's written a letter, I've responded to individually and personally, and I invited them to have a, a Zoom call so that they don't, you know, I know, understand we're not gonna have a lot of time for questions tonight. I wanna make sure that everyone who wants to can sit down with Rebecca and myself and answer questions for an hour, two hours, whatever it is. Um, so anyway, next. Um, this is you, Rebecca. Thank you, Tim. So, um, just as just a quick recap, um, this is the last slide of the presentation. So, um, we talked about the technology, the, the different challenges that the network, the grid is uh, facing and how we're trying to solve it and the investment that we need to make in the spirit of progress and the future of our great city. Um, you know, progressiveness is not always measured by tweets and words. It's hard work and it's challenging and it's it's a personal commitment to making it happen, not just in theory, but in our own communities. Um, ESS will help us avoid the increased um, grid stress, brownouts and blackouts like Tim mentioned before and also make us uh, prepared for extreme weather events that are unfortunately becoming more frequent and therefore avoid risks to life and property. It will also help Thank you. us uh, lower the utility bills and make our communities healthier, cleaner and um, create local green jobs for the community. And um, again, just a quick um, reminder, the reason we're here tonight is to talk about why this project is needed at 315 why it cannot be located anywhere else and how we are meeting the size criteria and uh, with that we would like to open the floor for any questions that you might have thank you all right so um let's start with any questions by the um members of the committee committees um, committees, sorry, committees. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, can I, I, yeah, I have, and just note, I don't know if you've seen in the chat, there are numerous people after the board, the committee members, um, chime in, um, who want to speak also. Um, yeah, so I guess first I just have a comment. I, I appreciate you addressing, um, you know, a lot of the questions that were brought up at the full board meeting. Um, just, you know, clarifying, uh, what the system does in terms of, of, you know, emissions, um, and, um, you know, particular hazardous, um, uh, byproducts of, of the operation of, of this, of this system. Um, and I, and I guess I, in, in my mind, I, I, I guess I see it as kind of two. 
two layers to this is just the 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 system itself inherently, and the second thing is the building itself. Um, you know, we received almost you know, at least eight uh, written uh, bits of testimony from tenants in the building about the uh, the treatment of those tenants during you know previous construction. Um, uh, moments and then just the structural integrity of the building. It sounds um, like there, there are major problems uh, that are going on. There's a temporary vacate order now that I just that someone sent along. Uh, but first with the um, just the system itself, um, I guess the main thing I want to go back to is the noise. Um, and there, there are other two. It's just they're kind of related, but I, I, guess, I know what my colleagues will chime in as well. But the uh, you, you mentioned that there are I guess there are sound muffling or sound mitigation mitigating um, uh, parts to this system, and uh, so that implies that there there is significant sound, and and I don't know if there could be a comparison to what that might be like the typical white noise or like a central air unit that might be on top of a building or an exhaust fan from a um, you know a restaurant or a cafe in a building just to get a give a sense of what um, folks uh, might be exposed to or living in the building especially on the upper floors near the roof so I guess I'll sure so um, yeah we, we've done a very extensive sound study with a with the purpose of getting to a point where we can show no impact on the on the sound levels in in the area so what you're looking at um, i don't know if you can still see my screen but uh, we we created a 3d model that takes into account the ambient noise levels in in the neighborhood in the in the surrounding of, of 315 berry and we worked it to create a very tailored design that will eliminate any added impact and to your question about like what it is similar to maybe you can think about it as something that is similar to like an hvac system because there is a cooling element to the to the cube basically you have to um, it's a safety feature you have to always keep a liquid cooling system active within the cube so that's kind of like the only moving part in the system so the 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 like the, you show slide. Which slide? Show slide fourteen. I think fourteen is useful. This one. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I mean, so, go ahead, Tim. No, no. I, I was just to say that this is really like a mini split. There's there's a battery system in the queue, and then on the door is an is a little miniature cooling and heating heat exchanger. So the the noise is coming from that. It's on this door. There's a, a heat exchanger. Honestly, when we first asked Fluence about this, they were like, you know, it doesn't make that much noise at all. Um, we insisted that they test it. They, you know, because the, um, you know, anyway, we were able to get noise ratings out of this and and find a way to just put some sound baffling to show that there's no change in the ambient sound. Tim, can I can I address uh, Mr. Yeah, Chesler's yeah. question? I mean, I think I can very easily address. So, as a part of the environmental review process uh, for the proposed uh, implementation, we we actually have to comply with New York City Building Code, and we also have to comply with something called the City Environmental Quality Review um, for um, any noise exposures generated by a project. And both of those are actually very, uh, very detailed analyses. So we cannot raise the ambient noise level at any single hour more than three decibels. Uh, and one of the things that we did to establish that is we did 24 hour readings on the roof to identify the lowest decibel level present on the roof of 54 decibels. And, and so that's quite um, quiet for New York City. So the system with the canopy mitigation system, so basically sound baffles, as Tim mentioned, uh, is we did a computer, a three-dimensional model uh, with um, the componentry of the system uh, that basically demonstrates that there would be no noise bleed 
over three decibels. And that's an open window condition, by the way. We cannot raise the with the window open, not even close more than three decibels. So at, at the those ambient noise levels, the amount of noise emissions from the project uh, would, would not be noticeable. So very, very high threshold. The environmental assessment has this analysis and we've done some structural refinements on the canopy system to make it nice and lean and elegant and, and to have the smallest footprint uh, visible would not even be visible from the street to the canopy system. So, you know, I, I hope that addresses, you know, this has to go through DEP for approval. Yeah, no, thank thanks uh, for that. Um, yeah, appreciate that. So, the, I guess uh, my second part of the question I just, um, is um, involves so many different things. It's just the, yeah, this building was a munition storage facility, but now, you know, it's, I guess, you know, re, you know residential. And again, I just multiple descriptions of, it sounds like the facade is falling apart. Um, and there's just been during previous construction projects, it's just been, um, uh, hell and, and beyond with folks. So I guess the question is, yeah, no, I guess in normal circumstances, I guess I trust the idea that the building would be structurally uh, sound to handle the new load of this system, but it just sounds like, um, uh, I know this, a good part of this building is, uh, has met its um, life expectancy. And so I have, I have real worries and issues about that. And I know many, many others do. Um, and if I understand correctly, there's some insulation either through or down the, the columns. And I'm assuming the col the support columns of the building. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, but that I don't know, just is really um, in this particular building. It just sounds like there's potentially some some problems. Um, and I'm just wondering if the if the property owner is here tonight, a representative to address that specifically. And this, um, you know, partial vacate order because of the, um, you know, their uh, structural issues with um, the building. So um, let me address some of your. It's it's one question, but with a lot of detail. So first of all, um, we are very aware of the existing issues that the building is experiencing. So first of all, there are issues with the existing roof. The roof currently is just a simple concrete slab. It has no insulation and therefore some of the tenants over the years have been experiencing leaks, which is not a, a great situation for anybody to experience. Um, in addition to that, just the fact that it's, it's, um, it's kind of, a, you know, the, the, the ceilings of the tenants on the seventh floor, the, ten, the ceiling is actually the concrete slab. So, if there is a you know an issue with leaks over time, what happens? Any type of moisture will penetrate, will impact the concrete. Will water is always going to find a way you know down. That's that's kind of the the rule of water. And the only way to mitigate that is to install a new roofing system, which currently doesn't exist. You only have a, a very simple slab. So what we're going to do, um, obviously, as soon as we install the structural parts of the of the dunnage, we're going to go and install a new roofing system, which should should solve not only the leaks but also improve the temperature envelope of the building and provide additional sound um, insulation. Now, um, we are aware that, um, some tenants were talking about the south facade of the building, which um, has some. Um, Maybe it's out of plumb and people are concerned about that, which obviously sounds very concerning. Um, this specifically doesn't have much to do with a structural um, capacity of a building, but it's still a, it's an issue. And, and the owner of the building is already in the process. And if this is in accordance with local law, law 11 in the process of, um. Getting the the permits to put up a, um, a scaffolding system and improve the entire facade of the building. So we're not talking just about the south wall of the building, but the you know the all, all the entire envelope. So this is something that is already in in, in process. And I think Tim. Yes, uh, we, was... we also have the we have the structural engineers here. Ivan, you're you're here. You want to say a couple things about the analysis you did for the building because. Um, also, uh, the owner is not here right now. He was here earlier, but he had to uh, he had to leave. 
Um, but uh, he's assured, you know, he's assured me that the, the, the local law 11 work is, is just about to start. Right. So, and I just that's, wanted, wanted to add, to start, um, but that's what happens. You now have scaffolding that's going to go up and, and those things are going to be repaired. Yeah, but they really don't go, have anything to do with our bill, our project. It's, it's, it's totally incidental. Yeah, to yeah. just before we go to Ivan, I just want to address the, the comment about the partial vacant. Make it um, order. This is yeah. uh, not a structural uh, related topic. We can send more information about it, but it's not related to structural. Um, Ivan, go ahead if you want to add anything. Hi, uh, my name is Ivan. I'm structural engineer, professional engineer for New York State. I have 24 years experience doing engineering. Um, when we start the project, we get uh, some research on the building. The building is a concrete building built in back in 1929. Uh, we did uh, research on the camp period building uh, to compare of what we're finding of the building to make sure it is uh, match and uh, sound. We did call cast to cast the concrete strain of the building. We can just guess what we use. Uh, we did numerous scan measurement and probe to make sure we understand the building and when we do our analysis. Uh, regarding the vacate order that you talked about, I just quickly looked up in the GOP website. It was issued on April 2nd, just last week, and it is regarding some kind of uh, falling debris from the south facade, and that is the cement scuckle. The cement scuckle is just a covering of the concrete building that is uh, to protect the surface of the building. So the scuckle itself is not a uh, structural element. Uh, and any building in New York City, it require local law 11 that have to be done every five years to make sure the facade is in sound shape. And it sounds like this is one of the local law 11 uh, item that the building owner have to be addressed. But, uh, Based on our analysis, this building have a uh, very high capacity for the column itself because the column size is 24 inch diameter, even at the roof level. Uh, just the pure concrete compression, <coughs> even without reinforcement, is had like is over designed for what it meant for. So we are very confident with our design and we did many iteration to make sure what we are placing on this roof is not overloading the existing column. Um, I was just told actually Richie is here, Richie, the, Richie. The, from the landlord. So it, maybe he can speak now too, Richie. Hi, um, uh, you hear me okay? In any case, I'd rather just uh, be here in the answering question type of capacity if you don't mind because i didn't prepare any presentation excuse me richie what, what's your last name herbst h-e-r-b-s-t and i just wanted to add to ivan's um last comments the the design of the facility was always with the with the capacity in mind so <laughs> We would prefer to, you know, have uh, the ability to have more batteries on on the roof, but that's not the case. The, the 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 exact quantity of batteries and the equipment that we are putting on the roof is in 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 accordance with the structural analysis. So it it, it doesn't come from nowhere. It, it we would love to have more capacity, but it it was always the intention to make sure that we we the number one, you know, concern and, and item that we need to check is the structural capability uh, to carry the load. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I know just one more uh, on the one more comment on this subject. I'll let my colleagues, um, but it's it's hard to, uh, you know, to believe that, you know, replacing a roof and then creating the infrastructure for this system would not cause vibrations or. Um, uh, that would affect the, I guess, the facade or the covering that is currently bulging and uh, falling apart. So I feel like that, I mean, would have to be totally shored up and tested and signed off on before um, could even think about doing construction on the roof. 
Well, as, you, as we just said, there's going to be a, there's a local law 11 cycle that's happening right now. So there's actually a, you know, a facade study that's happening right now. And there's going to be people looking at the facade and repairing it. So it's not that somehow that stuff will not be addressed or looked at. Right. Um, yeah, and in addition, it's part of the design of the system. We have um, vibration uh, padding to mitigate any vibration from um, transferring down to the building. So that's something that we are already committed to. And in addition to that, we are also adding um, ongoing vibration monitoring to the system. So this is something that the data is always going to be available and the vibration mitigation can be adjusted as needed. So this is something that we are very aware of and we take seriously. Okay, uh, thank you. I've taken up uh, a lot of time. Uh, welcome my colleagues on either the environmental committee or uh, land use. Yeah, I have, I have a couple of questions actually. Sante, Micheli, <clears throat> land use committee. Um, yeah, I, I was wondering because I, I know the building and I, I have been seeing for decades, uh, definitely having problem. And, and it's very clear that reinforced uh, concrete, uh, one of the major problem, and you said the building was built in 1920, uh, as soon as it, even earlier than 50 years, is actually still corroding. And one of the reasons we've been having element of the facade crumbling down, I believe uh, we received letter uh, from residents which they had problem in the past with things crumbling down even in their apartment is because they're still as corroded to a point which has uh, caused the concrete to break. I don't think the owner of the building have never really uh, accept kind of finding cosmetic remedy to really issue the degradation of the steel, which is a serious issue for a building. I'm wondering uh, how will you, because this is not a problem is gonna go away. Once you install this machinery on top of this roof, the roof will still need to be insulated and even insulation in a perfect working building, they need to be uh, consistently maintained to make sure that the building is uh, 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 consistently waterproof. So I'm wondering uh, how you will manage that, how easy it will be, what the impact will be. And so those are, those are serious issue. And, and the sound uh, and the noise and the vibration, uh, I know you brought very interesting uh, and I don't know exactly the data, but will you be willing, my question is, uh, uh, to have engineer and expert uh, working, representing the resident and the community at large to really make sure that there is a, a voice that is really representing impartially as no other economic interest uh, to make sure that this is uh, exactly what you're saying? Uh, will you be willing to, uh, to take the responsibility? You know, what it will be your liability towards each tenant that may be there for a very long time. So, um, Sante, thank you for the questions. Um, I'll start with the, with the noise concerns. Um, we, we have the data to show that the design is mitigating any type of additional uh, noise to the tenants in the community. Um, noise can be very easily measured, and this is something that we, we can always have additional data on. What we can provide, and this is something that I think we already did is access to the to the data that we have in our our model. So, um, if you have somebody who's more experienced in the area and wants to look at it, they can. It's not it's not really about you know um, independent um, research. Yeah, it's more the about DEC it, already. They already look at our model and approve it, right? So they're yeah. already looking at that data and saying, "What about this? What about this? What about that? What about that?" So it's not that we're just here going, "Oh, we have this model." We have to go through a rigorous process with uh, engineers that work for the state. Uh, no, but my question was specific. Even in long so term, you want to have a sound engineer come and look at our data? It's no problem at all. No, but I, I know that I said, will, you're will you, about, will you, yeah, you're asking you about the, the future. Yes, you're talking about the future and how this is going to be happening when the system is operating. And again, exactly in the same way that vibration works. Noise is something that is very easy to measure, and this is something that the, the sound mitigation systems and the panels are adjustable. They can always be added, altered as needed, but the model that we created, which is very sophisticated, demonstrates that 
there is no additional impact on the tenants or the buildings next to 315 Barry. Every, every engineer on this call who's worked on work here takes responsibility for the work they're producing. And my question was different. Will you will you take responsibility yes. if an issue yes. if an issue will arise? You will be financially uh, responsible for making sure a request of the tenants of the building to make sure that if we the, cause some problem that we're that, that's a normal thing. If we cause a problem, why would we not be that we're showing? You know, what, actually, that? Tim, Tim, if I could answer, Mr. Michelli, sure. I remember you from the last call. I'm I'm Monty Vanderman. I'm the CEO of the company. So. But let me make a very clear statement. We are the responsible party. We are responsible for our employee safety. We're responsible for the safety of the people in the building. We're responsible for the safety of the people in the neighborhood. We're responsible for the fire responders. If the, if in the event they have to come out here, I will I declare very clearly. We're committed to transparency. If you, if there's anybody who's qualified to look at this data, it's going to be completely open and transparent. We are accepting responsibility for the design, engineering, installation, and construction of this. We will be we will be owning and operating this plant for a very long time. These these assets are designed to last 30 or 40 years. We are permanent features in the neighborhood. We are live in the we live in the neighborhood. Our operation center is in the neighborhood. We are and will remain responsible fully for everything that we do and say to you. And when we say something to you, we mean it and we're prepared to back it up. And we will remain that way for us. I want to just say I one. that we are not just installing the system, we are installing and we're operating the system. So we're always going to be available to address any ongoing concerns from the tenants. Go ahead, also, Kim. bear in mind there's a New York City noise code that is subject to uh, to proper regulation that you can dial uh, 311. You can contact DEP, you can contact your council person, your community board. There are very set requirements, something we analyze all the time with rooftop noise nuisances. Uh, and there's a very, that's, that's one of the things you can count on actually that if there's a noise code violation, it can be taken and it can but be measured. That, that, was not, that was not my question. My question was, would you be financially a uh, sponsor a study, a study to represent the tenants uh, a, a data will you pay for a consultant that could provide this information impartially uh, uh, to the tenants sure we actually as i said to you we are these this data is open for examination by anybody it's available by the city we are perfectly willing to talk to somebody but we will want to make sure that whoever is doing it is fully qualified to to act on this behalf and isn't having an action to grind. So I would be I'd be willing to consider that. I would be willing to consider that. But first and foremost, we owe our responsibility to the authorities having jurisdiction over that. So we will remain primarily uh, obligated to meet all the requirements of all the authorities who have jurisdiction. So we will not allow something that goes in conflict with the authorities that have jurisdiction. So I want to make sure that's clear. So I would consider it uh, being responsible to fund an independent engineer to come in and have a look at these and verify that we have met all the requirements that we stated and that what we say is is there. But any engineer that comes to the table and needs to understand our first and foremost obligation is to meet the safety and construction codes of the authorities who are responsible for guarding those codes, not something that's out, out of the mix. So yes. Uh, uh, this is that. Del Teague here. I just want to uh, ask, you're talking about you're being responsible for any damage or any any negative effects on the tenants. What what um, legal document would make you responsible? What the, te the tenant what say, law? The, the tenant, well, actually, what law? What law or legal document are you no, referring to? No, we're conforming to? to the city codes and the city requirements and the reporting and obligation responsibilities we have under this city rules and regulations. And there are a great many of them involved in this. Just about every authority in the city of New York has had a chance to review our plans and our designs and our processes and our permits. Yes, but you, you're saying that you're, you're of course, uh, financially responsible for any uh, damage suffered by any tenant, any, any, you know, so I'm just wondering what, what um, legal well, we're responsible. Uh, document like you're else. talking about. Okay, so uh, I guess you know I, I could, 
I'm not sure there's a specific one. If we're talking about civil litigation or uh, violations of city regulations, we're responsible in the same way anyone else would be. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the tenants would have to bring you to court and sue you. Or issue a complaint to the necessary parties right. as our consultant said, is that these, these channels for issuing complaints are, are, are quite open and quite well established. And in addition to that, we will have mm -hmm. a safety officer dedicated to this and we will have tenant representation that anybody can contact us at any time. Right. I don't know what else we can do beyond that. Uh, well, a, a dedicated agreement with the tenant where uh, could be a language sure, that, sure. that is precisely specified uh, the responsibility and the hiring of any consultant that was, should be qualified, but it should be at the choice maybe of the tenant. Is something that has not happened before, is something new, is something that potentially could have an impact. I believe may, I hope it would never have an impact, a negative one. And but because we the community may not know that, uh, are you, are, which kind of consultant are you talking about? I mean, is it, uh, are you so, are you... so Sante again? If you if yeah. you have somebody in mind who's a qualified yeah. sound engineer and you bring that to the tenants and the tenants go to have that consultant look into it. We are open to the idea and we will share all the uh, That's not my role. I don't have, no, I'm okay. just so talking I'm, so to I'm, represent a portion no of the community that may have this concern and 100%. may uh, be a, a, an issue that will arise. All right, just S Sante, I, th I think you've made your point yeah, and I think, the, I think the answer is that they're, they're um, I think the answer is we, you know, if, if the tenants have issues, they can Call three one one, or they can um, call they can us. Call, they can call us. Or they can call, call you. The city, right. Whatever they need to do, but we are going to be operating the system. I am the safety um, director of the company. My phone number and email is going to be available. I'm happy to address any type of concern and and make sure that everybody feels safe and heard. My my concern is that so many of the tenants have written and and taken the time out to. Uh, right, lengthy um, reports of how you have not been yeah, responsive. I think, so, I, think I, mean, should, I think we should address that. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I, Tim can speak to that um, in length because he, he's been uh, sending um, all the communication out to the tenants. Um, yeah, I, if, I, you wanna, I, if you want to jump in, to you, I think I, a lot of the concerns that were expressed in writing are to do with a lot of the existing issues that the building is experiencing, which we understand and we we plan to address. So some of it is, you know, the, the, the ceilings, the linkage, the south wall, the facade, and we understand we're going to address that. We should have the tenant speak. There is a, there are a lot of tenants uh, here that should say something. Uh, before, before we do that, uh, as the owner, as the owner side of the building, I'd like to just state as far as that is concerned, that it really pains me this has become a contentious when we signed up for this i don't know two years ago or so i didn't dream i thought this would be a smooth sailing project it sounded win-win for everybody as the ownership of the building we don't have that much at stake to be quite honest with you already we have paid a price that's probably more than than we'll ever benefit from this from this agreement but we're already committed to it at this point but it's really regrettable that i had, I had no idea this would trigger we have had many, many years of quiet um, detente in the building between the ownership, because there is a history, a long litigation history with many of the tenants and some of the old management. That, in my mind, was always in history, and it's been a long stretch of almost 20 years of, of peace and quiet. And this has woken up a lot of the old wounds, and it's basically a deja vu. It's the same tenants who are here now complaining who were that time in contention. There are 55 tenants in the building, you understand? And most of them, I mean, they just fully on with this project. They would never even think twice about it. If, if you would ask them in person, they would be go all for it. They would ask all the check marks for a green project and all those things that benefits the community, benefits the building, benefits everybody. It's the same tenants who have just, just for old time's sake, have reawakened old contentions and old pain that have been through what I thought was already dead and buried. So I have regrets at that as that as as far as that as regard. Had I known this would cause that, I would have rethought the whole project from our side of it, to be honest with you. But you know, it's not really fair to the neighborhood, it's not fair to the environment, it's not fair to the city. This is this project is much more bigger than just 
this building or even these tenants. It's, it's a bigger issue that the city will have to be dealing with with many more of such cases going forward. And if we're going to, you know, and this is just a statue. I don't want to go further than that. But that's my feeling as far as that issue is concerned. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, I just want to say uh, Isaac Sofer. Um, I don't know if Isaac is. I know Isaac is here. He's on the chat. I don't know if he can speak. He had some a comment that I, I thought needed clarification. I don't know if, if Isaac, if you can, if you can speak. Yes. Would did you did you Isaac? Did you want to um, speak more on your comment? <clears throat> so I only see a question from Isaac, and his question was, "How many tenants are there?" I don't. See also, uh, he had something about. Uh, that they wanted, they just wanted a variance. Hello, there are 55 yes. tenants in the building, and they've all been notified many times by emails. They've been, they've gotten updates uh, every time there's been testing in the building. All the tenants get an email, and they've got an email about tonight's hearing, and they've gotten emails about the previous hearing with the uh, community board. So they, they all the tenants are aware of the situation. Okay, Dell, you can hear me, Isaac. Yes, I can. Okay, yes. my Steve, Steve oh. Silver here. Uh, he's on, I think. And I no, 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 no. Isaac is trying to speak now. Oh, sorry. Yes, my Isaac. Question, my question was direct. Uh, how many tenants is in the building? Yeah. How many? 55. 55. How many tenants have been outreach to? Out of the 55. All the tenants were reached out to. Uh huh. Okay, that was one question. The other question is: um, Have you a mitigation plan is ready to share, or are you you committed to share it with the public and the tenants? Are you speaking regarding the the sound uh, mitigation again? What specific um, mitigation? No, are you no, no, no. The entire construction plan, the entire time of the construction, and. Uh, that the tenant protection plan that you supposed to um, submit to the DOB during construction, and all in all, in all, all the companies that are going to do the work. Okay, so you are asking about the construction mitigation. So, yes, but the tenant protection plan, yes. Yeah. So we, of course, um, in order to get the permits for this project, um, one of the steps that we have to do when when pulling a permit, we will have to provide the tenant protection plan. What we have done so far, which is a little bit more um, elaborate than the generic tenant protection plan, which is just a very standard form and narrative. We already um, developed a full logistics and site, site safety plan to show exactly how the construction is going to happen. Um, everything from, you know, deliveries to the site, um, adding a sidewalk shed and overhead protection, minimizing dust. So all of these items are. They're covered by the tenant protection plan, but we already uh, went ahead and, and developed specific um, drawings to support that. And we are, are of course, we're going to share that. Um, and I think we maybe already did share part of it, but if anything is missing, we can always um, add that. It's it's public information. It's something that is always also, also posted to the TOB website. There is There are no secrets on the tenant protection plan. And we are also very open to hear about you know, comments. If you, if any of the tenants have specific concerns and special needs, we are we are here to hear about it. Is there any benefit for the tenants themselves about the energy that this building will provide? Yes, I mean they are part of the community, and they're going to be the closest to the energy injection to back to the grid. So, the way energy storage works is it's it's going to support the buildings that are in the area of 315 Barry. The first benefiter benefiter of the the project is going to be the building itself. It's the closest to the location. So, in the event of a blackout or brownout or uh, an extreme climate event. The tenants of 315 Mary are going to be um, able to keep their lights on, their Wi-Fi working, um, while maybe other neighborhoods that don't have this type of system are going to be, you know, sitting in the dark without a working elevator and air conditioning. Um, let me ask you this: Are you are you company committed to do more projects like this in the area? 
are we committed to doing more projects like this? What was the rest of it? In this, the same, in our area. I mean, we want to, um, and, and as Tim was talking about the network and let me show this slide again on the screen. Um, we, we surveyed more than uh, 200 uh, locations in this specific Williamsburg network. There is, a, there is a need for many more of these projects. Our project is gonna help the immediate area of 315 Dairy, but in order to actually meet the demand of the network, you're gonna have to have multiple locations. So this is, this is obviously not just for this network, this is for the entire city too. And that's why it's called a mic Great. It's something that is being implemented within the community and supports the immediate area um, where it's installed. So it's going to have to be hundreds of these before we're done. Many hundreds of these across the city, and we're going to those areas that are most most at risk today. All right. Well, um, uh, I know there are other people who want to speak. Yes. I just like. To, can I ask a few questions, Del, really quickly? Yes. Um, I'm wondering why. I'm going to ask three or four questions. Why is that not in a manufacturing zone? That's where this should be, not in a res top of a residential building. Uh, to quote, um, it'll meet the noise code, but we all know that that is, can be insufferable, even if it's under the noise code, if you're right there as a resident. And you said vibration is not a lot of concern, to quote. Vibration, any vibration can, can drive a person crazy. This should be in a manufacturing zone. I'd like to know who did you meet with of the local politicians of community leaders? Please name them. And I'd like to know how much is the owner of this building being paid? And specifically, how much? And if this is to go in, which I'm not so sure that it should, are the tenants going to benefit financially from this too? Those who have to suffer from the noise, the construction, and the uh, so, so, Katie, I appreciate your question. I think the the comments about vibration was more to the um, to the effect that it's not a major concern <laughs> with this specific system because it doesn't produce a lot of vibration. We don't mean to say that vibration is not a concern. Obviously, if you have something vibrating above your head, that's going to be a nightmare, and and we don't want to have that happen to anybody. That's why we are installing the vibration padding and the active monitoring of the vibration. That's that's maybe a kind of a, a misquote there, but definitely not our intention. Uh, when we say that we meet uh, the codes, this is um, there is a reason for the code and Kevin maybe can add and speak to that, but also what we were doing in our design and our intention was to show no impact. So it's it's it goes a little bit beyond that. You know, we, we really put a lot of effort to look in, at the existing conditions and sound in the in the area and make sure that we don't make the, the situation worse. So we, we please can we move on because it's getting very late. We understand that yeah. you're saying that you have to meet the codes, but uh, can you answer Katie's other uh, questions? I'd, I'd like I'd like to I'd like to address her first issue. I'm going to say, well, we respectively, uh, we, you know, I understand why you would why you would think that this belongs in an in M district, but I'm going to say, if you think about the, the, the actual what happens in a power outage, the most important thing you can do, speaking as a New Yorker who's lived through these, is how do you get, how do you make sure your air conditioning is still running for the elderly people in your building who could hit, be hit with heat stroke in these extreme heat events? How do you make sure your elevators are still working when someone needs to be uh, uh, taken out of the building? We have manufacturing so. districts right next to us. They're Del, all around here. Yeah, no, Del, that doesn't answer no, the question. I, Del, it's actually a really simple answer if I can just answer this. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thanks. So Richard Lobel, Sheldon Lobel, we're, we're, this just everyone realizes why we're here. There was a slide about this, but it's a special permit application at BSA. The whole reason we're here is because public service, service establishments like this under 7314 in residence districts, they can locate, provided they make two findings. Now, understand something. The board heard a variance application before ours. Variances are what the BSA grants contrary to the law. The, a variance application, when they came in for a, for a residential building in an M district, that's asking the board to do something contrary to zoning law. Special permits like this are different. Special permits say... If you meet the narrow findings of the special permit, you get the special permit. It's actually a legislative duty of the BSA to grant the special permit. 
So the reason that it's not in a manufacturing district is because they meet two findings. Number one is the use will serve residential area within where it's proposed to be located and that there are serious difficulties in locating in a district where it's permitted as of right from which it could serve the residential area, which make it necessary to locate in the district. And that was the slide which talked about the fact that they've looked over at over 200 sites and have been unable to locate. It's not that it's impossible. It's not that there's no possibility to locate in a residential district. There's, there's, there's special permits like that, which talk about no practical possibility. That's not this, that there's serious difficulties. The second finding is that the lot area is a minimum of 500 square feet. So in answer to the question, the, the, the zoning resolution and the department of buildings dictates this to be a use group 6D use. It's not a manufacturing use. It's like a use group 6 is like a commercial use, like any commercial use you'd see on the street. And they say in these narrow cases, it's appropriate. So we appreciate all the safety concerns. I literally have never had a client which has been so engaged with trying to figure out what's going on and to try to solve it. But as far as why it's not in a manufacturing district, that's the reason why, because it can be here if they meet these two findings. I also have to say, I'm very surprised that nobody in this community is worried about the, the graphs that we showed you. I mean, you understand how terrible it was for California to lose power for a long period of time. You understand how many people died when Texas lost power for a long time. We're telling you, look, this is not my graph. This is Con Ed showing what your power that you're using in this neighborhood. And they're telling you that you guys are in trouble. And so we're trying to do something to fix this problem. And I guess you guys are just saying, well, problems doesn't matter. I, I just, I really don't understand. Uh, excuse Very me, um, if you're going to, I don't think this is a, it's, it's, I don't see any point in okay. insulting, insulting the, the committee I and the community. I'm just and I didn't hear anyone questions. say that these graphs didn't matter. They are, people have raised concerns about this particular building. Okay. I'm, and, I didn't mean to and, anybody. It's just surprising. That's it. Well, I mean, you didn't mean to, but you did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Del, can no, I just really. interject something? Yeah. yeah, I think. Yes, I, please. I generally agree with what Tim is saying. I mean, in in general, I, I, I really like the the project in terms of just, the, you know, the battery storage, et cetera, et cetera. But as Willis alluded to, it, there's a trust issue here with the tenants and the building owner and with uh, um, microgrid. So I think that, I feel like to me that that's the issue. We have to solve a trust problem. I feel like this type of system could really potentially go on any building. And I feel like it's it's potentially the future, you know, for dealing with energy and get, you know, and dealing with climate change and that sort of thing. But um, but I feel like we, you know, I hope soon we'll, we'll, we'll hear from the tenants. And I feel like uh, that's where resolution uh, needs to happen um, in terms of uh, feeling safe, feeling heard, th those types of things. That's you know my my opinion. So um, we have to move on. Uh, are there? Does anyone want to feel that we are ready for a motion? Does anyone want to hear more specifically from the tenants? We've been getting we've been getting comments in the chat. The tenant should have a right to speak in the public forum. Is this who is this speaking? This is Willis. Willis. I, just, I mean, we've, we've read okay. the comments, we've read the letters, but I just feel like there's a lot. That so how many? How many? Okay, I I so which tenants? Uh, we have to limit this because we still have to go through our a very um, can detailed. They, uh, can they raise their hands in the? Uh... Yeah. I don't know. Can they? Can... Jerry, I don't know how this works. They can just uh, unmute themselves and speak. Oh, there you go. Hi, I'd like to speak. Yes, yes. your name? My name is Olivia Silver. I've lived at 315 Berry Street for all my life. I live on the seventh floor. Um, a lot of the points I want to make have already been brought up. Actually, I had written something. I had prepared something to read. So if I would, uh, I'm going to do that. Um, I'd like to emphasize, uh, which it has already been said, that this is a residential building. And while it may have been well built, it hasn't been properly maintained at all. The building, like many people have already said, is in really bad condition. 
there's an open, there are multiple open DOB violations. Like people mentioned, a big chunk of the external facade fell from the sixth floor. There's going to be mandatory scaffolding in May. We've already talked about the garden and the downstairs dumpster area that is under a mandatory vacate order. In our apartment alone, there's cracks in the walls and in the ceiling, pieces of concrete that fall off the walls and the ceiling every now and then. And every time it rains, the water seeps in through the walls. I'd like to say, to clarify this, through the walls, there are no leaks from the ceiling and we have massive floods every time heavy rain hits, every single time. This is gonna be a massive project. I don't think that the construction aspect of this has been properly addressed because the proposed work is gonna cause tremendous disruption in the building, which is gonna be harmful to all the tenants. For us, this means at least four months, because they're saying four months, but I doubt that it's gonna last that long, really of drip, heavy construction work. They're trying to remove a whole water tower from up on the roof. This is a cement building. The noise carries. You can hear the elevator move up and down like it's right by your ear. When somebody's walking up on the roof barefoot, you can hear it clearly. So imagine having multiple people up there doing heavy construction work every single day for four months, a minimum of four months. And I'm going to say, I was here both days when people from the company came last month to test, and the noise was completely unbearable. It started at eight and it ended at three for two days straight. And it was like you couldn't think, you could not be at home. It was impossible to be at home. And the reality is that if this work happens, it's going to be impossible for me and my family to continue living here. While the, and I, like I said before, I've lived here for 24 years. I have my entire life established here. My father has lived here for over 40 years. He's an artist. He has his studio here, all of his work here. He can't work under these conditions. He can't work when he's outside of the house and away from his studio. My parents are in their 60s and 70s. I can't begin to stress how much distress this has caused my mother who can't handle noise like this. They don't have to suffer this. They don't have to be forced to leave their homes because of this, because this building needs structural repairs. It doesn't need a preventative project for something that hasn't happened yet, for an outage that hasn't happened yet. No matter how important that is, I'm sure there are much more suitable buildings that aren't falling apart in the neighborhood within their structures. As far as I know, this is a multi-million dollar project. I'm sure the company has the budget to find a building that is much better suited and structurally sound that doesn't have people living underneath. I'm gonna say one, Two more points, and I'm sorry if I'm, I'm heated because this makes me really angry and this concerns myself and my family, and it's something I'm very passionate about. They said there's been company outreach. That outreach has only been to tenants who directly reached out and emailed either the community board or the BSA expressing complaints. That is to tenants who were already aware about the project. And for the most part, they were aware because I have been calling as many people as I could that whose contact info I had in the building and letting them know about what was gonna happen. Even people, my next door neighbor on the seventh floor, she lives here too. She's lived here for 30 years. She had no idea that this was gonna happen. They sent an email asking to come in to test the cement in people's units. Someone from the sixth floor, when I told him that this was for the project on the roof, he said, oh, I thought they were coming to fix the leaks. I thought that's what they were testing. So there's been no specific project information given about this. The only notice I've seen has been three days ago, and it wasn't about this meeting. It was about the BSA meeting on the 13th, and that was only after I directly emailed Tim with my concerns and said that there was no information. And then right after that email, there was a notice posted downstairs. That isn't following protocol. That's not open communication or transparency. That's, I'm sorry, but that's bullshit. There's been everyone here. And sure, there's not enough, a lot of tenants here. Yeah, because it's because the majority of the building has no idea that it's gonna happen. And they have a right to know. They shouldn't have to be, like I've been, contacting the community board on my own, calling the BSA, Googling for hours to try to find out what this is about because it directly impacts my life and my parents' lives. And also the last thing I'll say is that as far as I'm aware, the company has never done an installation of this kind before on top of a rooftop, again, in a residential building with people living directly underneath, especially not in a building that's 118 years old, that's literally falling to pieces. Everybody is complaining about this. We're not crazy. It's not in our heads. We live here. We've experienced this noise and we will continue to experience this noise or be forced to leave our houses because of it. And I think that's totally inhumane. We're in the middle of a pandemic. 
everybody's at home. Everybody's working from home, studying from home. I am home 97% of the time. So how, who's, it, this was done to the people from the company or to my landlord, do it on their building. And they would be in the same position I'm in right now, complaining just like I am right now. I'm sorry uh, that I was heated or agitated and I spoke really quickly, but that's how I feel. Thank you. Well, according to the chat, you speak for the other tenants who are here tonight. <clears throat> Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's Richard. Um, so I just want to point out one additional aspect of the zoning uh, section. Panel uh, says the BSA may have appropriate conditions and safeguards to minimize adverse effects on character surrounding area, which perhaps you also determine that to be the building, including requirements for soundproofing of fences, barrier, safety devices for um, screening of apparatus for landscaping. So, for example, if this product is something BSA has to prove, they could st uh, put a lot of obligations, for example, that issue of the roof, right, not being watertight. Um, there might be ideas. So, if the, the community board wanted to say whether they take a position in favor or not, that these are the following problems that need to be addressed. That's something the board could consider. Okay, thank you. So the, that we could say that whether we approve or not, we can say that we think that BSA need would need to address the, the, um, the repair of the roof, what kind of uh, safety, um provisions are installed what what kind of um my can what, one of my concerns is what is this new roof system what is that going to entail i'm concerned that it's that it's going to be such a, a significant um uh renovation that it's going to actually cause people to have to leave their apartments well normally roofing systems can be added onto existing buildings but perhaps that may be something the board BSA should be looking at instruction details to understand because that has to be done first, right? You could, I mean, you could do a certain amount w with the steel work, but ultimately you can't put the battery systems on unless you have an integral roof system. Right, and this is a concrete roof. This is not your normal, a normal roof. Right, but still adding systems above concrete is not much different than a steel deck that happens to have a layer of concrete above it. So it's just additional uh, amount of concrete, but you're putting on these rubberized systems. So perhaps the, the construction details might be something you would want BSA to be intimate with. Okay, and so the other this thing is, is, okay. And the other thing is the tenants in general warrant a habitability so even though this is a deal with the landlord, again, if this were to eat, the landlord has a responsive to the requirements um, that the law provides through a warrant of habitability. So where the tenants need to better understand what their rights are within a warrant of habitability, that's something. And, and Marty Needleman would be great listening to this, but uh, uh, some guidance to help them understand the rights through construction and beyond again if this were to move forward is something the bo the community board could at least put out there in terms of open issues that should be addressed so so you're saying that we can we can i'm wondering if this is something we have to decide on now it seems to me the tenants need to be educated as to their legal rights and what the warrant of habitability means um and i think it's also important that the tenants should know what what they're talking about with respect to fixing this roof it may well be that the the details involved in putting in a new roof system might be very much to the tenants uh in the tenants best interest but i don't get the sense that there have been really cohesive meetings with the tenants as a group answering their questions and giving them details of exactly what what to expect. 
and normally to say notification is to ownership, not to tenants. Right. So, you know, right. what steps you may want to see to make sure that the tenants get to fully participate in a aware of a BSA process is something to consider. Richard, Richard, can I, can I, I'd like to ask, um, couldn't this be in a manufacturing area? So, can you say, Richard, yeah, oh, the sorry. use is allowed, Barrick. as Richard described the right is where it can be as of right, and then where it can be according to meeting the findings of the BSA. Uh, the section, sure. if anyone wanted to go on to the city planning site, is uh, Article 7, uh, chapter three, it's seventy three sixteen says um, uh, public transit railroad or electric utility substations. I believe I'm looking at the section. Richard could correct me, um, but I believe that's what this is being filed under. I'm not saying that this is disallowed here. What I'm saying is this Only could be in a manufacturing area. Correct. All right. Let let Richard answer. It's Sorry. Only, it's allowed as of right in a manufacturing district. It's subject to a BSA standard, uh, board of standard and PL findings as Richard described. So the board of standards, if they look at the findings and they say, well, this do the findings, the board say yes. says yes, it has the sentence that I read in terms of safeguarding, so to avoid unintended consequences. So the board can planting ideas that the board of standards should consider in this particular situation. Thank you, Richard. All right, we're going to have like to, to come something. up to some kind of a vote. Yes? I'd like to say something. I'm one of the tenants. Yes. Yeah, I'm Steve Silver. I live on the seventh floor. First of all, this is this this project which Initially, it was told to me it was going to be three months. Now they're saying it's going to be four months. It might be longer than that. It's going to cause a major disruption in the lives of all of the tenants in the building, and especially us who live on the seventh floor. Having people working, walking on your head from seven o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the afternoon is untenable, and we will not be able to live here during that period of time. So we're going to be displaced by this project that they're putting on the roof. The other thing I'd like to say is that it was mentioned that this project is going to alleviate some great stresses on the uh, electrical grid. But all I understand is it's going to alleviate three megawatts of power. That doesn't seem to be a lot considering all the stuff that they're going to do on the roof. Three megawatts is nothing compared to the 3,000 megawatts that Con Ed is talking about in 2027. So it's a kind of a minimal project, but with a major disruption. Besides that, the structural problems in the building are tremendous, tremendous, okay? And, uh, the landlord has never really been concerned about taking care of them. All right. The landlord is somebody who, who comes across as a, a very nice guy. But for instance, we have a freight elevator. Oh. In All right. Well, yeah. so um, I can't let this meeting devolve into uh, one side insulting the other. Um, who, who am I insulting? I'm telling you something about what's going on here. I'm not insulting anybody. I'm just telling you how things are operating here. Okay, so I'm telling you that these guys are, are, are not exactly trustworthy. It's not insulting them. <laughs> we have an interesting concept here tonight of What's an insult, no. but it's okay. No. Uh, no. Yes, 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 so I I thought that if we, I yes. I think that if we want to hear from the tenants, we're going to have to be accepting of their comments and their and their feelings, um, no. whether they're for or against. 
Del, Del, you hear me? I hear you, Simon. Can I talk? Can I talk? Uh, well, I don't know if Mr. Silva was, was finished. No, Mr. Silva? I'm not finished. They're capable of, 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 of taking a freight elevator that was perfectly uh, usable and taking it out of commission illegally. So, for instance, I have uh, the landlord said, well, I can take my paintings out of the window. All right. If I need to move them. All right. So, I mean, these guys aren't exactly giving you all the information all of the time. And we haven't really had the information here, even though Tim is a very nice guy and 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 is willing to talk to everybody. What I see is a small project making a lot of a lot of disruption and it's not going to solve the electrical grid in the city. Okay, it's not going to solve much. 3 megawatts. They need 3000. You're going to disrupt the lives of 55 people for at least 4 months. You should think about that. Uh, I just want to thank you, Mr. Silver. I just want to mention that um, Katie asked whether the landlord was being uh, paid for this or how much, and that that question wasn't asked. It wasn't answered. Um, I yes, I can address paid. that. The landlord is being right. paid a market rent for the for the space, and just right. like every other facility we're putting in the city, we are paying okay. market rents for the use of the space in all cases. For all of these systems, and to answer your question, uh, uh, sir, uh, the, the this this uh, three megawatts of power is enough power to run 150 standalone homes for an entire month. So, in in the event of a power outage, it will definitely do a lot of good in the immediate area. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Simon, Simon, Simon wants it, wait, Simon rent. wanted to say something. Simon, it's they're getting market rent. Simon, you wanted to say something. Simon? Addressing the market rent that was stated, uh, it's it's an insignificant amount. I tell you the truth, already I pay the price that is significantly more than, than the potential benefit. And, you know, in hindsight, I don't know if we did the right thing, but um, in, in going with this, uh, it's really, I don't have enough in this in order, in order to make the tenants right. But what I do know is that the company microgrid have spoken to the tenants and they've extended themselves and I understand they've offered mitigating or alternate housing to the tenants. There's not enough in it from my point of view. I should be able to provide that. But I have uh, I have participated and I've I've in other words, to the extent that the amount of money that the rents that the tenants pay on the seventh floor, I have said the four months that they're gonna be disrupted, I've forgiven that rent. And in addition to that, microgrid, from what I understand, went ahead and supplemented that and made them an offer where they can relocate. But I don't want to get into the details. I don't know what the details they've made. But again, all that has to come from them, not from the ownership, because there's not enough in it for the ownership of the building to participate more than, than that, if, if, if I made myself clear. Simon, and then we really have to um, make a decision here. Yes. Daddy, can you hear me? You can hear me. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. I just uh, I hope my 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 phone gets. I'm calling in, uh, but I'm online as well. Um, so, uh, but listening to all the comments from all the sides, so it has to be broken down the issue here. Most the biggest problem we hear from from uh, the tenants is the issue of the tenants. You know, issues of the building, the tenants. That, that's one issue. The other issue is regarding uh, the actual project itself we don't hear much uh, complaints about it it's, it's we need the, we need the electric we need the grid uh Ken Edison is complaining that they need more power you know for the whole community so what has to happen i think has to happen that the, we we should i think um, have the tenants set up a meeting just with the company and make sure their roof will be fixed uh the the the, the roof will be, will will be fixed and all the issues of the building that will not affect whilst the construction is going on. And that's the most important thing we hear, the tenants, and, and as you said before, the, the roof will get a new roof. It will help the issues of the rain. Some uh, comment was about raining in. This will, this will be uh, fixed while the construction is going on. So I think the tenants will eventually benefit. 
you know, there's some old friction going on with the tenants. That has to, they should work themselves out. But this this project is a very healthy, important for the whole community, I think. Uh, and I think it's uh, I would I'll put I'll put in a motion to approve it. I believe that you're questioning this. There is a motion to approve. Does anyone second it? Okay, no one seconds the motion. Um, do I have any other motions? I, I have a motion. I have yes. a motion that a location be sought in the manufacturing district. That what? A location be sought in a manufacturing district. That I don't think that's a motion that that's addresses this. The motion is whether we okay. approve, so we, we, we disapprove, we approve with conditions, we disapprove. Uh, Adele, Adele, okay, can I mention my, one my more? motion is that Adele. we disapprove this because of the burden that it will be on the tenants during the manu for during the construction of it and after, and that um, it be sought a uh, location be sought in a manufacturing district. Does anyone uh, second that motion? I second the motion. Okay, roll cut, roll, um, roll call vote. Del Teague. Yes. Maria Vieira. Maria Vieira. I'm thinking about it. I guess so. Yes. Yes, what? Yes. Trina McKeever. Yes. Gina Barrows. Stephen Chesler. Yes. Aaron Drinkwater. Aaron Drinkwater. No vote. Moisha Indig. No vote. Ozina Kaminsky. No. Avram Katz. No vote. Abraham Leibovitz. No vote. Sante Michelli. Sante, Sante? Michelli. Yes. Sorry. Rabbi Niederman. No vote. Karen Nieves. Karen Nieves, no vote. Isaac Sulfur? No. Isaac Sulfur? No. No. Robert Solano? Robert Solano? No vote. Steven Weidberg? Steven Weidberg? <clears throat> Excuse me, no vote. William Vega? William Vega? No vote. Simon Weiser? Yes. William Vega votes Vega yes. Vega says yes. <clears throat> William Vega votes yes. Simon Weiser? No. No. Michael Andrews? Yes. Keith Berger? Yes. Corey <laughs> Canton? Yes. Michael Kowachka. Abstain. Meglin Lee. Kate Naplatarski. Yes. Allison Stone. Can you please clarify the motion for me? 
the a yes vote is a mo is a vote to disapprove the project. And if I'm not yeah. correct, someone please correct me. That's no. correct. Disapprove because of the ten the burden that will be uh, caused to the tenants, and that they si look for a site in the manufacturing district. Okay. It, it's not my turn, but I will say I think there's a lot of good of the project that could come of it. And you guys could essentially be the pioneers to do something. Lots of other cities do this and do it successfully. And there could be a great silver lining. That's my two cents. Okay, so noted. You, what's your vote? Yes, what's no your vote? abstention. My vote is no. Thank you for clarifying. No, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I will also the environmental committee wants to vote on this also. Yes, a, yes, yes. On the same yes. motion. Yes. All right, but I'll call that motion separately because there's no way to to do it as a combined vote. Okay. Well, I feel like uh, it, we're we're voting. I don't see how the environmental committee can vote on the land use action if we want to make a motion basically on the environmental aspect of the project. Um. So it's in terms of either the system itself and or the construction um, issues, you know, with the integrity of the building and the potential environmental impact on the tenants. I feel like that's our purview. So noted. Okay, the vote for, for the land use committee is 10 yes, three no, one abstention. So the motion carries. So Steve, does, does your committee want to vote on this? Or, or make an, a motion, or, an, a separate motion. We'll make a separate motion. Do we yeah. have a quorum for environmental? Um, maybe we should check that out. Uh, we didn't before, but um, but we could make right. a consensus recommendation. Do you want a quorum call? Sure. Okay, this is a quorum call for the Environmental Protection Committee. Six members are required to have a quorum. Stephen Chesler? Here. Eric Brzeidis? Here. <laughs> P. Willis Elkins. Here. William Clagsbold. Yo Lowe. Trina McKeever. Here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Janice Peterson. Bella Sable. Laura Hoffman. Kevin Costa. Daniel Grossman. Here. So you have one, two, three, four, you have five members present. Well, we could just make a consensus recommendation. Um, I'd like to um, basically make a motion not to recommend this project. Um, though the, um, just due to the issues with integrity of the building, the impact on the tenants, um, I, I don't know that that would did any any of my colleagues um, have a comment about that or yeah I mean I agree I think the to to me personally the the key issue here is I think the idea of trying to relocate these energy systems outside of residential area is to me not the issue right now and to me I would say we disapprove this project because they haven't. They haven't satisfied any of the concerns of the residents in the building. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah, I mean, there, you know, real concerns about the impacts of construction. So I don't know what the answer is to like try and <laughs> appease those concerns, but that's kind of where we are. Yeah, I feel like if there, you know, there was an effort to make to have meetings with the tenants and the tenants put forth a proposal to feel like they would be satisfied. There's some way that this project could happen in, under, you know, with terms that they would feel, uh, you know, strong, strong about, and there was a process to achieve that. Then I potentially feel better about that. But as it is, how, how things have been laid out. Yeah, I, I have a hard time recommending it, even though overall, I like the idea of, of the, of what, um, Michael Grigg is trying to do. So, I have a question. I agree with Stephen this, Willis. This, this is Bojana Kaminsky. I have a question. Um, but are you on that committee, 
No, I'm not on that committee, but the question is uh, the procedural. I think you should allow the, the committee to to yeah, have their but, vote. But if they don't have a quorum, then they can have they can have a vote. They can have a vote and then it'll be a consensus. Without a quorum? Yes, it'll oh. just be a consensus and, and Steve will be authorized to present it. Yeah, the land use committee has done that numerous we, times. Ed, ed, listen, this, <laughs> nothing would, would, we wouldn't function if we couldn't do that. Rosanna, as long as there is disclosure that there was not a quorum present and this is a consensus of those committee members that were present, it's, it's proper. Yes, absolutely. Dan, Dan, did you have something to say? Dan, can, can they have an opportunity to engage? Further um, with the tenants, as you mentioned, and uh, you know, potentially re remedy their concerns. Is that something we can offer? Uh, yeah, okay. I suppose you would come in and say we're we're against a project um, as it's been presented um, due to yeah the just the negative environmental impact on the tenants, the issues with the structural integrity of the building, the upkeep of the building, but if the landlord and the and microgrid were engaged with the tenants and the tenants were to find some you know find a resolution that they would be satisfied with um i think that'd be a good way I mean, is that essentially what you're yeah i and frankly i think that's that's certainly implied if not directly yeah. understood yeah. from the from the motion that passed for for the land use if obviously if the tenants were if they would work would work it out with the tenants and they wanted to come back before us yeah then we could reevaluate okay thanks just wanted to clarify yeah Okay, yeah, so then for help, I'd like to make a motion to not recommend uh, this project um, yeah, due to the environmental impact of construction on the tenants, on the building, um, until there, I would say, until there is um, engagement between the, the tenants of the building, the landlord and microgrid, and they, um, a resolution is achieved that the tenants um, approve. How does that? I'll second. Okay. Yeah. That was Trina. Yeah. Um, we only have five people, so all all in favor, say aye. 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 All those against. Those abstain. Okay. Uh, motion is approved. Uh, Jerry, this is Dell. Could you just give me the numbers on uh, the um, land use vote? The yes, no, and absent and abstains. Ten three one. Ten three one. Thank you. All right. We have one more thing left. We have uh, Dave Lambino. I think is going to update us on the development plans for the um the uh site that was owned by con ed the river ring and please just listen to this and listen with the understanding and the idea that you all know i've i i asked you all to look at the positive declaration the new york city planning positive declaration about this site there are lots of categories. There's going to be a meeting, a scoping meeting on April 26th at 2 p.m. virtual. I'm hoping several of us at least can can attend that meeting. Um, but the thing is that the um, comments on that meeting are due 10 days later. We will have a chance to meet again before the comments are due. However, we will not be before the full board. So what I'd like to do is put together um, comments tonight that we can present to the, the full board on the 13th. And perhaps if we all think we'd like, if you'd, you'd like me to ask the full board, perhaps I could ask the full board if they would want to give us per authority as a committee to add to those comments um if 
if more, you know, if, if, if relevant questions come up at the scoping meeting that we think would, would, we would like to add. I don't know if the full board will give us that. So, um, let's not assume we'll get it. So, if Dave is still here, let's let him present and then we will go over the, um, over the, um, positive declaration. Thanks, Del. Um, Welcome. thanks everyone for your time and, and service. I uh, appreciate it. Um, we're going to run through a quick, my colleague and I, uh, are going to run through a quick presentation. Um, and then we can answer questions. Uh, we're here voluntarily, obviously. Um, wanted to bring you up to speed on, on what we've been doing for the last 15 months since we last saw you changes that we've made outreach. We've done answer questions you may have. Um, but we'll try to keep it brief. We know everyone it's been a long night. Um, I think you all know Bonnie Campbell, um, my colleague, she's at, uh, at two trees. She, she did the presentation uh, about 15 months ago to this committee um, and she'll take us through uh, this deck. Thank you. Um, I think you're muted. There we go. Okay, sorry. It's like this is later than I've stayed up uh, in a, since the pandemic began. Um, so you know, it, it's ironically, it's been you know just over a year since I was in front of this uh, this board, uh, the senior center, right before uh, everything changed. Um, and I'm pleased to say that you know, in spite of the, the real challenges that we've all been grappling with over the past 12 months, um, our team's been pretty hard at work on this project in an effort to address many of the concerns that were articulated actually at that meeting a year ago. Um, we worked all of last spring and summer with city planning with the other agencies to improve the site plan to expand the public space as was, um, you know, duly brought up in that meeting to increase the affordable housing to reduce the footprints of the building and to really begin to dig into the environmental impacts of this project and, and how we can do our part to mitigate them. Um, and this is obviously something that we'll all get further into together um, during the scoping meeting. Let's see if I can advance the slide here. Right. Make this full screen. All right. Um, so we've also this is this is a site just to remind you guys where we're talking about. Most people know it as the former Con Ed site. It includes those three parcels that span um, in front of the NIPA plant um, at the foot of. Grand Street to North 3rd Street. Um, we've also spent the past 12 months doing very deep and widespread community outreach um, to really the whole community board, North Side, South Side, Greenpoint, Bushwick. We've done dozens of meetings with, with a whole spectrum of stakeholders um, from groups like St. Nick's and Los Suarez and El Puente, environmental groups, NYCHA, community leaders, um, and also our immediate neighbors north of the site. And as you would expect, the feedback has also been very diverse. Um, there's environmental justice groups, affordable housing advocates, community leaders that have been very vocal in their support of the project. And there's been neighbors that uh, continue and to have and understandably have the development fatigue and they're worried about construction impacts and loss of views, overcrowding, constrained parking, um, and more change in an area that you know has seen an abundance of change since the 2004 rezoning. And, you know, while we can't address uh, every concern, we think we've put together a very well considered, well intentioned, and I, I believe improved from last year plan that will make the wider community, the neighborhood and the city a better place to live once this project is complete. And I hope that this committee will agree that we've been a good and important development partner in this neighborhood. Um, our track record at Domino and elsewhere at living up to our promises is strong. Um, we are also stakeholders in this neighborhood with Domino and with this site, and we do what we say, and we very much prioritize our commitments to this community. There are kind of the major over, over areas of, of change since I, I sat before you uh, January 2020, and I'll keep this pretty quick, but, you know, through our work with city planning and compressing the building in, in uh, building footprints, we have been able to significantly improve the open space in both quantity and quality. Um, 
the footprints of the buildings are more slender. That does make the buildings a bit taller, but they take up much less of the open space. Um, we've really dug into the engineering on the resiliency. We've been able to use this year to do much more modeling with the wave breaks and the infrastructure so that we're designing something that's forward looking 100 years, not 10 years, not 50 years. This is something that will protect not just this property, but hundreds of properties to the east and north of the site um, as really kind of a new model for waterfront development. Um, we really improved, and this is a, a, in large part thanks to city planning, the public um, realm at the ground floor where the buildings hit the park so that it doesn't feel like a private building landing on a public park like you see um, in many other places and it really kind of integrates the two. I think you'll find that the public programming in the park is much expanded, the playground area, the nature trails, you can walk nature trails and wetlands for a half a mile um, now with the, the way that the park has been redesigned and then more units of affordable housing. And I'll kind of go through some of this quickly because you, you may perhaps remember it from the past, but these were really um, our overarching uh, goals for the for the open space with connectivity, programming, community engagement, but really habitat restoration and resiliency, a new kind of park um, for New York. And in terms of the project goals, um, I won't read through all of these, um, but a few that have really coalesced over the past year as real underpinnings to this project, the first being res resiliency. Uh, we see a real opportunity for this project to pilot a new approach to shoreline infrastructure that New York can finally take cues from of its Euro European counterparts when it comes to dealing with climate change and the health of our water, water waterways proactively. And we think um, this project is going to go a long way to demonstrate that. The second goal that's really kind of coalesced is, is around equity and equity. I mean, in the form of environmental equity getting people that live in this community board who don't have the opportunity to really engage with New York's ecosystem actively engaged in the public space. And I mean, social equity, having low income housing in a high opportunity area like this. It's expensive to do. Um, it does take subsidy, but the integration and the diversity that we're seeing emerge from the beginning of the domino redevelopment process has been incredibly encouraging from our standpoint, and we think it's a fundamental approach to curbing gentrification in this neighborhood. So I'll just take you through the kind of master planning approach quickly here, as you'll recall, you know, wanting to connect the waterfront, wanting to bring the water actually into the city and create a softened shoreline and really compress the building footprints to really the outermost parts of the site and create a new model for a different type of waterfront park. And here is River Rings. And as we zoom in, you'll be able to see a bit more of the change. So this is the site currently, and you can see the existing shoreline with the white line. Um, and this is what we're proposing. Um, it's, a, it's a significantly enhanced open space. It's about five times what uh, is traditionally required by the zoning resolution for a waterfront. Um, Public shoreline, and the programming is expansive. The the I don't know if my mouse is showing up here, but you know the, this whole nature play area, and you'll see some of the renderings is actually massive, um, and and one can take these nature tidal trails, and as I said, they can walk for you know nearly a half mile um, through this open space. We've greatly expanded the tidal wetland and created trails, exploratory trails around it, so that people can get really up close to the ecology of the space and the river. Um, the beach, we were able to kind of use the, the work that we did with the hydrologists and engineers to, to move the beach to a location where it won't wash out because of the positioning of the wave breaks um, and the, the outland infrastructure. So here you can see there's really three pieces of the resiliency here. Um, there's a wave break here, and then each of these are, are wave breaks as well. So they, they serve to um, reduce the wave energy by upward of 80%, which is important both in a storm surge and as sea levels rise to protect the upland and, and really fundamentally the neighborhood east and north of the site from some of the damages of uh, super storms and, and climate change. Um, this is just a quick walkthrough, and I know everybody's tired of some of the, um, you know, the new and improved park. You can see the beach is quite expansive. And accommodating there's lots of um, there's lots of room for in water calm uh, recreation, which is unique to this part of the river. The 
you know, as you know, the tides are very strong here. So use, utilizing those wave breaks to create a, a calm uh, in water environment really gives the opportunity for um, us to partner with Billion Oyster and with Brooklyn Boat Works and, and kayaking groups to kind of create water that people can interact with um, in a meaningful way. Again, here are some more of the renderings from the outposts. Um, when you walk out on the nature trail, there's all kinds of opportunities for education out here. Uh, we really have a great list of partners that we've been working with. Um, Billion Oysters already, we got them going at Domino and here, same with Brooklyn Boat Works. They were out during the pandemic engaging um, school kids in, in COVID safe uh, outdoor ec ecological activities. And there's gonna be a great opportunity for that here. The project still um, still has the, the YMCA, the partnership with YMCA. You can see a rendering. It's going to go uh, ho hopefully in the north building here, um, and they'll be running their uh, second grade swim program, which allows second graders to uh, become water safe free of charge, and that'll be open to this community. We think that's a tremendous benefit. And then you can be begin to see in this lower diagram, and I think you'll see it better subsequent slides here. Yes. Um, the arcade. So really working with city planning, um, we developed a, a design idea where you actually kind of move the building back from the facade, which in allows like a different kind of public realm that sits in between the park and the um, community uses on the ground floor. So some of them will have sh will be shaded and, you know, the, it'll allow opportunities for different types of public public programming against the park and really open up a huge part of what used to be building um, as part of the public realm. This is a, a view down Metropolitan Gateway. You can see those uh, those arcades and esplanades here. It kind of, it really, they're not counted in the park calculations, but in reality, it adds like a, a tremendous amount of footprint to the public realm here. This is a view down North uh, 3rd Street 184 Kent here, and the, again, the YMCA on the second floor. Um, some of the sustainable building strategies um, that we, we've dug into over the past year, we're actually huge proponents of the microgrids, to be honest. Um, and it's something that uh, we hope to and intend to include um, in, this, in this development going forward. We think it's, it's absolutely essential for New York to become carbon neutral and, and reduce its reliance on fossil fuels. Um, having a distributed network of microgrids, we think is absolutely essential. Um, the on-site wastewater treatment, this is something we're doing at Domino, and I'm excited to say that we you know, have sign off from the agencies and are in the middle of our construction documents to build an on-site water treatment plant at Domino, which we'll also do here, that will treat 100% of the um, wastewater generated from Domino. So we're not gonna be putting anything back into the DEP sewer grid that needs to be cleaned up in Greenpoint. Um, we're really excited about it. There's been a few other developments in New York that have done it, um, and we're gonna we plan to do it here too. And again, just in terms of this, uh, you know, approach to uh, resilience and slowing the the traditional kind of bulkhead edge is what you see normally up and down the East River. And what we're doing here, obviously, is pr pulling that out and softening softening it with these. Um, wave breaks, which has both the resiliency benefits, but also really significant ecological benefits. And, you know, I think we may have shown something like this before, but you can see in these two diagrams, one, the one on the left without the breakwaters and the one on the right with the breakwaters, how much energy um, from the waves is, is it comes out. You know, we have almost placid water here and the wave breaks. They're almost like flower pots at the top of the water. They don't go down through the water column. So there's still water go flowing underneath them. Um, here's, a, here's a nice cross section where you can see uh, what the wave breaks look like and, and what types of ecology and installations um, it enables. And frankly, these, these things all really work together. So the wetland can't exist without the wave breaks. And the wave breaks alone don't stabilize the shoreline in a, in a way that promotes resilience and um, can really stay intact. You need both working together. You need the plants and the, and the um, species and the armorage on the shoreline in addition to uh, the breakwaters out, out in, the, in the water. Um, affordable housing, you know, we've been able to squeeze now uh, 263 affordable units, um, all of which will be available uh, 
at an average of 60% of the area median income or rent, rents for families at that, those levels. Um, as with Domino, I mean, I think we have a very strong philosophy that integrating these affordable units in this neighborhood um, goes a long way in, in breaking the cycle of poverty and allowing families to stay in neighborhoods where they are now. Um, it's something we feel uh, strongly about and are very proud of. And I think, you know, in aggregate, when you take Domino and and this site together, it, it represents a, an actual, a very significant economic diversification of this neighborhood. And I think it goes a long way in, in curbing some of the gentrification that's come with market rate condominium development in the area. And then I'll just kind of look at it here, um, overview of the, the benefits, but I'm sure um, you guys will want to get into questions that Dave and I can hopefully answer. Obviously, we're at the very beginning of this process, um, the scoping meetings at the end of the month. There'll be a public process after that, so we'll have plenty of time to engage with you guys and we're, we're always available um, to, to, you know, continue the discussion and, and hear everybody's thoughts whenever it's convenient for you guys. And with that, I'll turn it over back to you, Dell, for questions. Okay, thank you. I have uh, one question uh, with respect to the YMCA. Have you entered into an enforceable agreement with the YMCA? If not, will you be doing that before um, construction? Yeah, we, we have. Um, we have a, a mutually signed, executed um, agreement with them. Um, so that's the, the answer to that. Of course, we'll be working with them on like the exact design and everything as we get much closer to construction. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I, I do that. Yes. Um, you have a couple. Uh, first, you, the um, you're rezoning to uh, C62, uh, which I, if I understand correctly, has uses like uh, hotels and department stores. Is there, um, you know, intention to bring hotel no. rooms into the building? No, especially uh -huh. now with that special permit requirement. No, um, no, there's no intention at all. The only reason, there's two reasons that there's C62. Um, the buildings get kind of deep towards the bottom. There's a thought and because residential becomes less efficient when the building flares out like that. So there, it's possible that in those, um, <coughs> the YMCA will certainly take up a big portion of that. Um, but on the other building, perhaps there might be a small office component. I think that's what we're showing in the EIS uh, right now. And, you know, we, we do, as we did at um, 10 Grand, one south first, the first domino building on the waterfront, we do like integrating office and residential. We think it creates kind of like a nice, uh, lively dynamic in the building. Um, we're certainly not going to do a hotel. We're certain we've never done uh, the type of retail that you discussed. I, you know, that's not at all our intent. Um, and okay. we'd, be happy, we'd be happy to limit ourselves during the process. Oh, and the other reason is for the microgrid, frankly, because to have a microgrid, we need the C designation in order to, to not have to go through the variance process that you guys just spent two hours discussing. Right. All right. Thanks. Uh, one other question um, is the. Um, I guess, I guess maybe we're referring to as a C word area or the repairing area, or since you're building structures in the water, are you able to get access to additional, you know, open space acreage that is increasing the floor area and the size of your buildings? Great. Um, no, the answer we right now, the site, the lot as it exists today, here it is. Um, is 156,000 square feet of lot area. And, you know, you multiply that times whatever the floor barrier permitted under the zoning is. We are going through this process and ending up with 156,000 square feet of lot area. So we're not creating any new lot area that's going to give rise to development. I think that was the core of your question. The other piece of your question. So a lot of this infrastructure is actually out here. And this is the reason that we've been able to work with DEC. DEC is very, um, reluctant to allow new construction in the water column for habitat reasons, but because the infrastructure exists out there and because we're actually creating new net open water where there's more cut here than fill, so to speak, um, it's actually a very, it's very much in line with DEC's kind of resiliency um, strategies. Um, so we're using the existing infrastructure that's out here from the old days when it was, you know, a kind of, these were moorings for huge, um, like oil ships, 
uh, we're going to be able to reuse that and essentially hang these breakwaters off of them like aprons that span between the existing infrastructure. Okay, and how much, um, thank you, uh, additional affordable housing you're offering now than before? I think before we were at 250 units and now we're at 263 as just kind of as the building efficiency has, has taken shape. And, you know, we have, we are working with all of the local affordable housing groups. And of course, the message is that, you know, everyone wants to see more and, and, and deeper levels of affordability. And, you know, that's all conversations were, um, engaged in and can, will continue to be engaged in as the process goes forward. Um, you know, we, we want to put as much affordable housing here as we can. And it, to the extent that there's other programs available or, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to work with your community and, and, and your board and, and doing the best that we can here. Thank you. What um, is happening? Excuse me. Who is this? Uh, this was Corey. Corey. Yes. Um, I wanted to find out on the note of affordable housing, what's going on with one South 1st street and why the affordable housing isn't released there. Great. Um, I am more than happy to give a, a, a synopsis of our effort there with working closely with the state legislature, legislature, um, to kind of restore the affordable housing regulation that was in place when we, uh, started the construction of that building. Um, and everything that I say, I want you guys to feel free to go to St. Nick's and Los Suarez who are working hand in hand with. Um, on this to, to really understand, um, you know, our sincerity behind it, but I want to be very clear about something I. Through the chatter, it, I understand there's no lore, particularly from pro folks that are opposed to the, the river ring project to find kind of a gotcha with what's going on with domino 1 south 1st. Um, and that kind of calls into question our company's integrity implies that we don't make good on our promises during the ULIP process. And that is not how two trees operates. That's not our track record and that's simply not the case here. I want to be super clear about that because this is not a gotcha and we're not going to get into that. The fact of the matter is that one South first was financed by a lender and in the middle of construction, the rent laws were changed in June, 2019. Okay. There was not a provision to grandfather this project. And as a result, if we were to meet the requirements of our loan and the requirements of the new program, we would have to provide 30% of the units at 130% of AMI. In fact, the four other projects in your community board that were in the same predicament, that's what they all did. They provided 30% of the units at 130% of AMI. Now, because we committed to this board and this community and our nonprofit partners here to deeper levels of affordability, we, we put our word that we are going to work with the city and work with the nonprofit partners to do AMIs below 80%. We were front and center. We took it to the press. We took it to the electives. We said, hey, guys, this was an inadvertent. Um, this is we're, we're kind of a, an inadvertent outlier that was overlooked by the legislative fix here. They, we don't believe that the state legislator wanted a project like ours to have higher AMI is 30% at 130% of AMI. And in fact, that's what we've heard from every elective we've reached out to. So we're working tire, tirelessly to correct this problem. In the meantime, we have 30% of our units not occupied. We're, we're basically foregoing two and a half million dollars in rent to try and fix this problem and, and live up to our word. Um, so I, I won't get caught in a gotcha here for people who are opposed to River Ring um, because we're the only developer in the community board who stood up to say, hey, like we're not just going to switch to 30% at 130. We're fighting hard and we could use your help if anyone wants to reach out to their local elected officials like we we want that. Bonnie, just to respond to that, um, I do have I, I did reach out to our local electeds because, you know, I, I agree with you to some degree that if uh, if the 421 a changes there, there is an issue and there can be an issue for developers uh, who are trying to meet their obligations. Um, but what I what. I found out from them was this the following statement. It is the position of the city of New York and HBD that two trees should meet their obligations and that there are no government barriers to doing so. Yeah, they made a commitment. They, that, those obligations are 30% at 130. We don't want to do that. Well, there, there are actually a few different. I mean, I don't no, I, I think that this is not the best use developer in the community board who didn't just immediately that was mid construction like us that then flipped to 30 at 130. And we might have to too, if, if Corey, if we're not successful, then, 
what they're saying is yes you can meet you can meet the requirements of this program and they are right i can meet the requirements of this program i'm trying to do better than that and i'm trying to do i'm trying to live up to my commitment i don't have to and ultimately i can't afford to forego two and a half million dollars in rent i can't right the building can't sit there we're, we're paying full taxes we're getting no tax abatement right now zero so i can't afford to do this forever but i'm fighting my fucking hardest to get it done all right, now I'm going to have to intercede here because we have to go all across. We, we understand we've got a good 45 minutes Great. to deal with this. No, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the, to the board member, to the, to the committee members too. We need to stick to this project, this presentation. And because I don't want then people just not, you know, just leaving uh, and, and leaving this for, to, two or three of us to come up with our responses for the scoping. I do have a, a question with respect to nonprofit um, uh, affordable housing nonprofits. I would um, request that you also, I know that you've reached out to a number of them on the south side. I would recommend that you also reach out to some of the nonprofits on the north side, like, for instance, the People's Firehouse, you know, nonprofits who, who manage and deal with uh, with low income housing. So. Um, Great. Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to take up your time on anything else. I'll just see who else has any other questions. Hi, hi Blair. I'm a member of the public and I'd like to make a comment. Well, first, you can't yet. Yeah, we are first board members. OK. Committee members, I mean, not just committee members. Hi there, Allison Stone. I um, had put a question into the chat. I just wanted to know, um, and maybe it was already in the presentation, but if you can speak a little bit about the timeline of this project, I know we're all really concerned about the construction in our neighborhood. I have a hotel going out up with a toddler who I expect to nap uh, every day and um, you know, I'd, I'd love to learn a little bit about what the timeline is and is that something that is, is you're, you're willing to stick with or is it going to be delayed um, from here on out? Would love to hear, you know, where you're at with that. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I, I can speak to that or Dave, you can jump in if you want, but, uh, you know, we're, we, we've been working on this for two years we're, we're moving as fast as we can obviously COVID did delay things for us um we were you know excited to be entering the scoping process we're going to do all of the environmental due diligence that's required that comes out of that scoping process um you know we have to get this thing approved as soon as possible and break ground shortly thereafter um it's not a short you know there's a lot of in water work here which i don't think will be terribly disruptive uh to folks but um, but it takes, it's very time intensive, um, all of that marine construction. Um, so it does have a, you know, a long timeline. We, we have said, like we said, um, in the public forum at Domino that we would build the park. Up front with the 1st building, um, which is an enormous endeavor. Uh, we intend to do so. So, you know, it's going to take 5 years or so to construct this entire thing. Um, so, you know. Not foreseeing no delays, we'll 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 deliver it within that time frame. Okay, and one more question relating to the affordable housing. I think it's come up in a lot of conversation, not just with the River Ring project, but certainly throughout the entire evening. Um, I think a lot of us personally know people who have struggled with affordable housing. I um, also am quite desperate to find a single male, a uh, single dad. Uh, in the neighborhood housing, I've been working at it for close to 4 months and I've been completely unsuccessful knocking on lots of city officials and people's doors begging for help. So, um, of course, I, I heard you say to Bonnie that 2 trees, uh, holds themselves, you know, um, responsible for, uh, contributing to the, the community in certain ways and giving back and making sure there's affordable housing and. You know, I, I just hope that commitment is true and would love to hear as things progress. I think, you know, there seems to be a lack of cl collaboration between the community and certain um, developers in the neighborhood. And perhaps if we were able to gain a deeper understanding of 
what we could do as a community to help fill those spots and make it so that we're not in the dark either. We could all work uh, together collectively to create an even better community. And thanks for um, listening as well. Yeah, we couldn't agree more. Dave, maybe you want to, I can even go to the sure. heat. I think what was what we found to be particularly exciting about um, what's happening at Domino is, is the number of local um, community board residents who are applying for and getting these units. Um, Dave, why don't you go ahead while I flip to that sure. slide? Sure. Um, this is a oh, slide yeah. that shows uh, for 325 Kent, which was the first building that we built at Domino. Um, this is a map of community board one. Uh, you can see um, half of the community board roughly is within Steve Levin's district and half is with within council member Reynoso's district. Um, this map shows is a heat map that shows where approximately 3200 applications for our affordable housing units at Domino came from. So the, the 3200 units um, applications from community board 1 members who wanted to improve their housing <laughs> and apply. The domino. Um, and you can see um, they're concentrated mostly on the south side. Um, there, we, we heard from Williamsburg houses tonight. There were there were a lot of applications from Williamsburg houses. People were trying to improve their housing situation. Um, so we would. This is a similar. This was for a fifty. This was for um, forty and fifty percent of AMI. We expect a very similar turnout for an average of sixty percent of AMI. Um, you know, thousands of applications from community board one residents to the new affordable housing at River Ring and half of the affordable housing units. So roughly 100 and 130 something um, are reserved for community board one residents. So you get a better, you know, half of our, of our uh, units at Domino so far have gone to community board one residents. Half of them will go here. So you get a, an upper hand as a community board one resident if you're applying to the lottery at, for for these for these affordable housing units. If you finally want to show the other slide about 325 Kent, okay, sure. just just real quick, this is um, a snapshot of our first building at Domino that was 40 and 50 percent of AMI. Um, you know, we met our 50 percent community preference. The average current income there was twenty eight thousand dollars a year. There are 16 formerly homeless house households um, in in that building. Um, it's a real good mix in terms of race, race and ethnicity, uh, and you can see the rents that people are are paying um, are also very very manageable. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, questions from uh, committee members? Yes, this is Alex Sofer again. Sorry, it's so late tonight. Um, I have a question. Um, people in the vicinity of the property are complaining that uh, they are in the dark. Have you been reaching out to all the neighboring properties? Um, Go ahead. Go ahead. No, we're doing our best. We, we reached out to the large condos um, in, in the vicinity, Northside Piers 1 and 2. Um, 80 Metropolitan um, and some others, but I, we'll, we'll brief anybody that wants to be briefed. You know, if you, if you all as a community board, as a, as a committee, um, know of people we should be getting in touch with, um, I'm putting my email in this chat. We will, we will brief anybody, anytime, um, on Zoom, in person, whatever is appropriate. Um, we're, we're happy to brief. Uh, neighbors and and people in the community board who aren't neighbors. But how about uh, uh, property owners on Kent from River uh, North First North Second? All of those who are affected during construction and post construction and, and rezoning. And I think it's it's a mixed uh, zoning prop um, area as well. And property maybe they're competing. Um, with the long term plans with, with your with, with your big project. I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, I, I know it's it's COVID time, it's tough to co communicate and meet and greet, but can you address those concerns from many others around? 
Yeah, I think what Dave is saying is like we, we really would be happy to brief anyone. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue our outreach if there's if there's people that you know of that we should reach out to, um, please let us know. Just email Dave. Um, you know, we're trying to hit as many buildings as we can. And of course, there's forums like the community board and the scoping meeting and other public processes. But as Dave said, we're happy to, you know, bring bring the, the information to any group that's willing to listen. Um, I have a question. It's, it's Pina. And my question is with the you're saying it's a five year construction period. What are you on target with what your prediction was for your construction <laughs> project? Um, we're on, I mean, we're, we had to obviously modify um, our construction development timeline um, in the EIS or the scoping or whatever um, to reflect the delays with COVID. You know, that held us back a little bit. Um, but otherwise, we're moving as quickly as we can. Yes. So when is the when is that project? When do you because you've got another two buildings, three buildings? So there was buildings? a question in the um, in the chat about as of right. Uh, yeah, Mike Wachka, uh, question for two trees. Um, so I don't know if you alluded to chat or some of the the rumors in the neighborhood that if you uh, don't get the proposed rezoning, that two trees could build a last mile delivery site like Amazon or something. Um, can you clarify your position on last mile delivery or any other uh, industrial uses under consideration for the site? Sure. I mean, I, I'm happy to address. I've heard the chatter too. So, I guess let me first be very clear that Two Trees is not a last mile developer, um, and our interest is getting this project approved. That is our interest. Um, I will also say that as we probably all know from this past year that the economics of last mile uh, in this city have changed dramatically over the past 18 to 24 months. And this reality has generated just a ton of interest in the site um, from last mile users, from logistics developers, from large format retailers who want to do a combined thing. Um, I've fielded those inquiries personally. Um, I find it a little frightening. Um, you know, this use whether it's this site or kind of elsewhere uh, in Brooklyn, like it or not, it's a reality that's coming to New York. And I, I think collectively, we actually all need to think about how to handle that with a measured in a measured way, because it's it's coming and it's coming fast. That's that's what I've uh, definitely gleaned from from the past you know six months of phone calls. Um, that said, we feel what we're proposing here is infinitely better. Um, this is our, we are also neighbors to this site. Uh, we have a vested interest in seeing a good outcome here. It's one of the reasons we bought the site in the first place. Um, you know, that said, like, if we're not successful in, in rezoning the site and recouping the investment we made and kind of the bet we made, then, you know, we, we can't be financially reckless. We wouldn't personally develop a last mile development here, but we would inevitably eventually um, sell the site to somebody who could or whatever the highest and best use is. Um, it certainly kind of seems to be generating the most interest in term under the existing zoning. What is that kind of site you're talking about? What kind of business? Last mile. So it's like the logistics and really, I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's last mile, which is what you think of as like the Amazon kind of logistics center. But it's it's almost more than that now. Like the calls that I'm getting, it's like every retailer is now gone kind of the delivery remote model. And so you have like these retailers that are even like coming together to do maybe cold storage for like six different types of restaurant. You know, there it's almost like collectives of last mile or la really last quarter mile. It's an amazing trend that's happening. You have people who are wanting to lease like just sections of our parking garages sometimes for just the delivery logistics with bicycles and these containers. It's like, a, it's just a crazy phenomenon that's happening to retail in our city. And it's, it's something we're all going to see a lot of, I'm afraid, um, in, in various ways, but yes, it's a last mile logistics kind of, uh, okay, thank you. Um, I know there's someone from not on the committee who wants to speak, but. Are there any more committee members who have questions? Remember, we still have to go over it's, our it's, public. I, deck. It's Keith. Keith. I, I have some questions. Sorry, I've okay. been having issues with my mute. Um, okay. So, 
Uh, on the River Ring website, um, I, I noticed the comment about riverringtruth.com in the comments, but on your website, you state that the River Ring will deliver massive public infrastructure and economic benefit without public tax dollars. How can you make that that statement when you're clearly seeking a significant tax abatement to build this building that would have a serious um, economic think, benefit for you I from the tax perspective? Uh, first, first, I'll say, Keith, that thank you for your um, perspective and questions. We're very, very well aware of your personal uh, opinions about this project. Um, I think that, you know, when you're talking about 421A, you're talking about an affordable housing subsidy. And in New York, and particularly in high uh, income, high opportunity areas like this, affordable housing is expensive to develop, and it does not happen without subsidy. And whether or not those funds come from the city's general fund vis-a-vis -vis tax revenue, and the city then writes a check for affordable housing, or they come in the form of tax abatements and and you know other incentives, density bonuses. I mean, that's that's a public policy debate. I don't think that changes our view that as property owners. Um, we think a government government should play place a pretty high priority on promoting mixed income rental housing in high opportunity neighborhoods and not write those dollars in exclusively in East New York. We think that leads to a more segregated um, city, frankly. Um, so, so we are big proponents of programs that work to to uh, achieve affordable housing in neighborhoods like this. So that's okay. That's the Fair enough, but, hey, I'm not done but, but that's not answering the question. But you're yeah, not no, answering no, the question. Because I'm not done. You're interrupting me. That's why. I'm, that's why the question's not answered. So that speaks to the for, why 421A um, is a tax subsidy that spurs affordable housing. Again, you could get rid of 421A and have and pay taxes to the city general fund, and they could in turn take that general fund money and write checks to developers to build affordable housing. This is a short circuit around that, which is more efficient for everybody. In, in our opinion, people have different, you know, um, views about how how affordable housing should be subsidized. On the other hand, uh, we're investing over 100 million dollars in uh, three acres of upland open space and three acres of in water open space and infrastructure that will protect your property, frankly, and many, many, many other residents property from. Um, rising sea levels and from storms um, that's not uh, costing the tax sellers, the taxpayers a single dollar. Uh, we did that at Domino Park. We built the entire thing with our own equity. We didn't finance it with the bank. It came out of pocket. We maintain it by ourselves. We spent over nearly $3 million a year maintaining that park. We do not come to the taxpayers to maintain that park. Um, so yes, there's an enormous amount of Private investment, we will be relocating and upgrading a, a stormwater outfall. Um, I, you know, it's it, the, the two are, are distinctly different buckets. And, you know, I, 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 I see the allure in conflating them. So it's like, oh, you're getting this big tax abatement and you're saying you're doing all this good. But those are very, very different things, I'm afraid. And if there was no affordable housing subsidy, you would have no affordable housing in this neighborhood and you'd have more fancy condominiums, and we just don't believe that that's what this neighborhood deserves and needs. Uh, although I did notice on your EIS, you didn't mention or, or check off the need to look at um, the the impact of displacement, uh, indirect in displacement of this project. I, I assume you're going to actually look at that? I because... don't know exactly what you're referring to, but you should definitely bring it up at the scoping meeting because everything that's yeah. brought up at the scoping meeting gets addressed. Keith, that, that save that thought for the um, what we're going to uh, put in our questions for the scoping. Mm -hmm. Don't yeah, leave. I don't, I'm not leaving. I okay. keep getting muted. I keep getting muted. Only I think Dave must have taken over the mute button because every time I <laughs> mute again, but I'm sure he's I'm sure he's found a way around it. Um, Stay, but, uh, save that thought. It's it's going to be in. It's one of the questions we're, we're going to want to ask for. Yeah, the, 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 other, the other question I the other question I have, which is uh, really more for other people's information, since two trees has heard me ask it before, which is, you know, New York City recommends open space at two point five eight five acres per thousand residents. Now the numbers here have shifted. It's you know, moved around a bit, and I understand that happens. It now looks like we're going to have twenty nine twenty five residents plus staff of up to five hundred. So, you know, roughly thirty five hundred people per day in this area. Um, and now it looks like it's gone up from 2.9 acres to 3.2 acres of open space. I mean, that, that's clearly an in, increase of density on a per capita basis. It's, it's, in my view, not adding open space. It's providing open space that's already taken over by the residents that are moving into this building. And, you know, we can talk about the water space, but, you know, you need that for your re resiliency. 
Um, nobody else uses water around them for acreage for parks, and um, it's also not usable at least you know two thirds of the year. So, uh, I, I again, I, I don't I don't see how you can can make the case that you're actually adding open space in a community that's already uh, defunct and devoid of enough open space. Again, thank you for your perspective on the open space. I think we actually agree with you more than you believe. Um, we think this community needs more open space per capita. We could not agree more. Um, we agree so strongly, in fact, that we're proposing five times the amount of open space that's required by the zoning resolution. If every developer did this, this community would not be starved of open space. Um, every square foot of open space that's, that we're providing beyond the requirement is driving the average up. And I will say, and this is just data and numbers, when the project is built, every member of this community board will have access to more open space than they did before the project was built. So we are increasing the open space per capita. We agree with you. We are huge proponents of open space. We will continue to be leaders in our field and advocates for increasing the quality and quantity of open space in this neighborhood. It's what we've done. It's what we did at Domino Park and it's what we're gonna do here. And it seems like a very shallow criticism of the project to, to, to undermine that. Bill, can I ask a question? This is Katie. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I just like to point out that providing open space is a requirement and paying for the maintenance of that open space is also a requirement, either to pay for it and do it yourself or to have the parks department do it. And also you got a density bonus by increasing the amount of parks to domino. Um, no, we did also, not. I'd like to say that's what I've heard, but I've heard that many times over. Um, I'd also like to say that the, uh, Park space that you're providing, much of that is water space, and a lot of people dispute whether that's really. Uh, but, but just to be clear, when I say, say park space, can, can I just finish? Can I, can I finish? Sorry, um, and just because I want to. Um, just seeing this in the larger context, um, we have we see uh, speculation on much property within our district, and speculation goes on the price of these properties is goes higher and then businesses come in and say we cannot afford to do this unless we do this we saw this happen with the first project that was proposed over on Kingsland Avenue earlier this evening so that's to say that if you and then to boot whatever is asked for is like to the hilt like we're going to push the envelope as far as possible. The same with ACME, the same okay. thing with the ACME project. So this is to say the same as with Kingsland Avenue, that there had to be, if you're asking for something, which is a rezoning that is from manufacturing to residential, that it should not be all the way pushing the envelope all the way. It should not be 71 stories. It should be less stories and it should be much more affordable housing if at all, because you're asking for something and it should not be that profit is, um, uh, you know, you, that you're getting the ultimate profit. I, but also I'd like to say, this is the last remaining industrial site on a formerly industrial neighborhood. The buildings are out of place and out of scale. Um, just looking at the renderings, um, it wasn't this a consideration when you, design these buildings that it is really out of character with the rest of the uh, uh, the area and what what can what will you do uh, in order to give more give back and to be so uh, to be less extreme um well, first of all, I just want to be clear. I'm, I'm, I don't need, we don't need to like parse numbers, but we're also being super upfront about this open space. We're not trying to count the in water open space as part of this per capita increase of open space. We're bringing a tremendous amount of open space far beyond what anyone, any other waterfront developer has done or does in this community board. We are, you're right that, that, um, other developers have to contribute and pay the parks department, but I think we've all seen, unfortunately, what what that's getting people that lives live adjacent to those areas like the parks department does a terrible job maintaining those and we're we're going above and beyond um operating something like domino park as, as we would here um in terms of the density i mean respectfully i i disagree um 
Uh, the density here kind of on a apples to apples basis when you look at the lot area of something like the north side development and domino. This is actually less dense on a per square foot of lot area basis because we don't own the streets um, and in those 2 projects, both domino and the north side projects, the streets were part of the lot area that generated the development. Right? So. I, what, what I do understand is that the height of these buildings, because we've shoved them into tiny little footprints is. Is new and different for the area and I actually think I think there's a slide here that I always find interesting because we could propose a project. Dang. Oops, wrong way. We could propose a project that is what we're used to seeing, which is this, right? These are the 45 story buildings that are north and south of us that sit on these podiums. This is the same density that we're proposing, in fact. But what we've chosen to do, and, and this is a trade off and, and not everyone will buy into it, but we, we our proposal is premised on it and we think it's a sensible trade off, which is that when you're already talking about buildings that are 40 stories, you know, the marginal impact of the height is, is less than the benefits, we think, of the additional open space when it's really high quality programmable, usable open space. And that, that's the kind of proposition we're putting forward. We we, we think it's a, a, a good trade off, but um, not everyone has to agree. All right, I'm going to have to um, cut this off. We did have one person. Can I, uh, um, just a couple of questions, uh, if possible, uh, just to follow up on some of the things that were said. You, you do understand that we still have to go over all of the um, items in the positive declaration. I do. It is going to be and bad, figure out. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to follow up on a couple of things I've asked in the chat and asked in the previous community meeting. Uh, we were told that a scheme was developed here that conformed to the approved density. Um, we have asked to see that scheme, uh, and I was told in here today that we could see it. Uh, I still haven't seen it, so that will be question one. Um, so this is what you are allowed to build. Yeah, this is the as of right. So this is like this okay. is an as of so, right end zone. So you have um, developed this scheme as well to uh, to work as a residential development. Is that correct? No, you can't build residential under the current zoning. So this this was developed as a um, a no action scenario for the purposes of the environmental study. You have to you have to study what would be built if there were not a. Rezoning. Okay, but so just just to clarify, this so is, this this is what a, you're showing here on screen is what you allow to build today. That no, is no, this is a manufacturing. No, but so this is zoned manufacturing. manufacturing. Disregarding the program, this is the amount of mass you're allowed to build here today. Is that correct? That's correct. Oh, you, the, the thing that's on now. Okay, yes. Okay, so basically, this scheme here is the amount of massing that you are allowed to build on the current zone. Yes. Good. And so you are asking to build 70 story towers instead of this. That's right. That's right. Okay. We are asking for an, an R8 equivalent instead of this, correct? And yes. so, there, is there any recognition to the uh, impact uh, that that kind of development will have on this neighborhood in terms of infrastructure and other? Of course. I mean, that's why we're going through the in, entire environmental impact study. But have you considered building what is on the screen here today and then making your money off of that is my question. Well, like I said, I mean, you know, we're put, putting forward what we think is a, a very well considered thoughtful and we think the neighborhood, us included, and the broader community board will be better off with what we're proposing. We don't have interest in building a manufacturing um, build out like this. If, if but, we're but unsuccessful in the rezoning, then you, you somebody, purchase, somebody you might. Purchase the site not being interested in building what could be built on there and then only hoping that you can get to build 70 story towers instead is that correct yeah that's correct okay great and question number two uh, as, as somebody who lives in the community i would like to understand how your outreach process works i mean i live around the corner from here uh, i've been very interested in this of course as, as so many other people uh, it is i guess strange to me that that somehow there has been no outreach to to let's say my building, my neighborhood, given that I'm maybe three blocks away from here. Can you explain your strategy? Sure, Dave, I'll let you take that one as our outreach. Unless you're not on, Dave. Okay, I'll take that. 
Um, I, you know, to be honest, this has been all over the papers. It's been, um, we've been at this for two years. We've met with thousands of people at this point. I, I apologize if somehow um, you didn't catch wind of any of the outreach. No, well, you don't. Know, you don't have to apologize. But just like to understand how the outreach yeah, process works. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Years. So again, we have, you know, building stakeholders, community groups. We've been working in this community now for um, over a decade. So uh, we have deep roots here. We've we've done events at Domino Park um, that that have been talking about this. We've done we did design charrettes that were publicized through this community board and. Um, you know, through lo in local papers. Um, when and all of that I've been aware of. I'm just, I'm just curious that, that ever since the last in-person uh, presentation that was done, I believe by Jed, uh, there seemed to have been no public outreach or none that has been available to us. Um, I, I'm sorry, again, I'm sorry that you weren't, um, you know, a part of any of the re outreach that we have done. I mean, you can see here we've had meetings, uh, numerous meetings with all of these groups and, and more. I mean, this is just a, a portion of them. These, um, these are great, right? I mean, uh, I guess there's a difference. If I'm not a member of a group here, then I wouldn't hear about that, right? But I'm assuming there's, there's a strategy moving forward for how these meetings will be uh, presented so we can all be part of them. And could you explain when we will uh, have the next uh, session of this? We'll do one for you. We'll do one for you, Jens. You just let us know when next week you have time, and we're happy to sit down. No, with you. But I'm not. I'm not. I mean, to be honest, I don't want a, a meeting with you. I would just like to have the ability for the community to to meet and understand again what's going on on a, on a kind of regular basis. So, so what is your schedule? I think Dave, Dave, Dave left his uh, email and his phone number, so you can feel free. But I think as other people call out in the chat, I mean, it's not so much about having the ability to write you an email and think uh, you know the ability to have the community come to a room or check in to hear what's happening is important definitely and i i hope that the public process fulfills um fulfills that for you there'll be as as del mentioned there's a scoping meeting at the end of this month and then there'll be an entire community process with um you know ability for public members to make comments and and, and recommendations um, throughout the process, there's a seven months EULA process is, has no shortage of opportunities for public engagement. Okay, so just a couple of questions through the presentation today. When we met last, um, there was a number of people asking yeah. to see renderings from ground level to actually have the impact of the building from various areas in the neighborhood itself. Um, seemed to be a lack of building shown in the, in the images that I hear. Uh, will you present some renderings for us so we can see what it looks like standing on Metropolitan, standing on Kent, etc., in going around the this thing? Had, the presentation had renderings from um, basically all the streets from Metropolitan, from North Third, um, from the park. Um, we, you know, we started the last presentation we saw had one rendering from the street side and one from the water side. Um, if you have done were all you, the other ones, you, it would be great. Were you here for my presentation tonight? Uh, yeah, Dell, we've heard a lot of questions here. There were renderings tonight. The renderings show parkland and not buildings. Is that correct, mainly? No, I'm sorry. You may have missed it. But listen, I think Dave said we'd be happy to come and give you a presentation so you can see them all. No, I would just like it to be shared so we can oh. see what it looks like from this, the, the, the fabric of the neighborhood, let's say. Yeah, that's why we put them in there. Okay, so so there will be no new renderings. Is that correct? Uh, no, there's there's a lot of renderings. There's a lot of renderings in the presentation. We also yeah. have other perspectives from different streets. We'd be happy to share them with you. Okay, so so you will share them. It's eleven thirty at night. I'm not yeah. sure. Like, where all right, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, so, right. I'm going I to all been eight questions already. Eight. All right, we are. We have to move on, um, and we will now address the scoping. And thank you. I want to thank two trees. I want to thank all of you for coming Excuse and me, giving your presentation. Public, I do want to make a comment. Oh, sure. Thank Go you. Right I appreciate ahead. it. My sure. name is Nicholas Major Pinto. I live at 184 Kent Avenue, um, and you know, Miss Campbell, I'm really glad that you brought up integrity at two trees. Um, Integrity is really important in this process, engaging with the community, being honest, being open, 
to candid criticism about this project, taking it constructively and working with it, working with this community. What the people of this community want is input in the project, not just to be told things. Nobody wants to be told what you're doing. We want to know that we have a stake in this because we live here and we've lived here even longer than you've been developing here, okay? I asked, speaking of integrity, I asked in the chat, what's what's at the site right now? And Mr. Limbino said, it's vacant. That is an egregious lie. It's not vacant. It's turned into a garbage dump. It's overrun with dump trucks, garbage trucks, full dumpsters full of crap. There's all, at all hours of the night, trucks going in and out, dumping things. It's, a, it's, it's mayhem. So what other misrepresentations can we expect from you about this project? Corey brought up a great point about what's going on with, with um, what is it, One South First or the, the, the other Two Trees building? And quite frankly, your response, oh, well, the regulatory environment changed. Guess what? You're in the business of development in the most highly regulated real estate market in the world. How could you not plan for this and embrace it as it happens? Just because the rules have changed in the middle of the game, I agree with you, it might not be fair, but that's the way this market works. And for you to now renege on what you're doing and say, well, we're working with legislators, sorry, that doesn't make me feel very comfortable about giving you seven years out of the next 10 to build this monstrosity here. And if you don't get what you want to continue doing what you're doing now, which is to make, make it hell for people who live right on North Third Street and River Street with this dumpster fire that you have here. And hey, the Nick, last thing I'm, I'm saying, a member of the, the last thing I'm a member I'm of the public as well. I live um, close by you. I did also just want to highlight for this group because I think it's important that all eight of the of the New York City Council candidates for the 33rd district have signed a letter saying that they believe the city needs to take control of land use and that they are not supportive of this rezoning proposal as it's currently requested. They have said that they would need to evaluate whether even significant changes being made to this would show any tangible benefit to our community worthy of a large scale rezoning in this location. Who, who is speaking right now? Who is I'm speaking? Lucy Walton. Hi, Lucy. And did did you ask to, to speak? I had my hand raised for an hour and a half. Yes. <laughs> oh, well, yes. Um, I'm sorry, but I mean, you, you have to really be recognized in some way because we, we can't do this. I, I, go I, go I, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, look, look well, the and this is, you're the last one. We have okay. to move on from here. I'll make it quick, I promise. Um, look, the reason this is being rushed through is because two trees do their research. They're a I have a question as well. And they know, they know that if they don't get this done now, that all the candidates coming in are vehemently opposed to this rezoning. There were 7,500 more units in the pipeline for our neighborhood, and we're already feeling the effects of that large scale rezoning. It's not even halfway through yet, and they're talking about 70 stories. It's not appropriate, and none of the people in the outreach meetings that I've attended have been remotely supportive of this plan. So I would love to have been a fly on the wall with this community outreach, because in every meeting I've heard, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of local residents. We have a survey of three, uh, three and a half thousand people who have expressed extreme concerns and um, opposition to this plan. The representation that there's been community outreach is disrespectful. And you know what else is disrespectful? Talking in a community board meeting like this when a committee member asks a question and you respond with an F-bomb. That's not the way we want to be spoken to in this meeting and that's not the way we want to engage in this process. All right, we must move on, people. We have now to present, we have to put together our questions that we want to put to the city to be included in their scoping analysis Alex, and in their scoping meeting. I ask a question about the other parcels proposed in the rezoning? Other parcels proposed in the rezoning, what's the plan no. for that? No, we're only talking about the river rank right ring. That's that's the river in, the ring same, right now. in the same yeah, but that's in the same proposal. Dale, uh, this is Bożena Kaminski. Yes, Bożena. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanna point out uh, there is a, you know a lot of confusion and misunderstanding. The Polish Slavic Center has been reached out by this group and we have received a presentation of the project. We not listed on, on their, uh, you know, a page as a, a organization that they reach out to, 
uh, and I did present it my concerns and my, uh, you know, request that if such a project will be uh, redeveloped here in, in this community, that the first, the people that live in this neighborhood, that they have the, 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 the first right to apply for those uh, affordable housing because our community has been completely, you know, disadvantaged. It says, I mean, everybody says, well, you, you have all those applications for from different, uh, uh, you know, neighborhoods and stuff, but I, I was talking about the senior housing. I was talking about the people that cannot afford to live in this neighborhood. They have to be included in that, pro in that project. That's what I wanted to say. Okay. Um, we have to move on now. This is this is not a hearing. This was just a presentation and up, update. And trust me, people, if we don't get our if we don't get this together tonight, we're not going to have anything to present to the city for the scoping. And the scoping is very very important. This is the one time when we can go to the city before they've certified. So I'm telling you, we need to move on now. Um, I hope so. I thank you all for, for the presentation. I think that um, it it is important for you to understand that although you have gotten some support from some groups there are significant number of people who have expressed opposition so we'll move forward on that thank you everyone thank you thank you dave thank you uh, for two trees and committee members please don't leave we now need to move on to the uh, related to this, we need to move on to the fact that we have a, there's a scoping meeting happening April 26th at 2 p.m. Um, and I'm hoping that a number of people will attend, but we, the, if you look at the positive declaration that we received, it goes through all of the different, um, all of the different areas and issues that could be covered or that might not be covered because the city at this point doesn't think uh, it's necessary. One of the things that it says up front is that it, the, the city at this point in the positive declaration feels that the uh, issues of um, solid waste and sanitation services and energy uh, don't really don't uh, well. Let's see that that these would not result in in adverse impacts. I personally think that those those issues do need to be included. Um, I'm trying. I've tried to think how can we best get through this. There are so many categories, and I thought since I'm the chair, let me just take the the uh, bull by the horn and say let me just quick quickly go go um, down the, the list of the, the issues, the areas that I thought needed to, could could have some Question, something added. Questions about what? Excuse me, just uh, before I, I said, uh, I asked that question. In the proposed rezoning, the uh, part of it who is, is it? Who is I'm this? sorry, I'm sorry. Can you please who identify yourself? Who is this? Yes, Alexander Schwartz. But no, we we are now on to the to the we are. Uh, this is for the community. Uh, this is for the committee members. We have to deal with our preparing. It's our just questions. a quick question. It's a quick question. It's like a yes or no question. This this is does this have to do with the scoping meeting? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I would like to know if there is any proposal for the other parcels to be no, a no, hospital this is, no, or I... there is another parcel there. Two parcels. I can't answer your question. D two trees is is no longer here. No, so, it's um, but it's just for our site. It's just for our site. It's just for the site we own. 
Yes, but the proposal includes other sites as well, which they are zoning uh, commercial. No, so they're not. Okay, yes. I'll leave it for the it's scoping, true. I guess. Oh, it's true. Um, and do you have any idea, like what 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 do you see there, like a uh, last model delivery or something? They don't own that. that. They don't own that land. So what was the purpose of uh, you guys um, doing that rezoning? I mean, just just curiosity. I don't. I'm sorry. I don't know. I, I, I'm having a hard you time. You are proposing a rezoning for properties you don't own. So why was that? I'm not aware that we are. I certainly don't think that we are. Sorry. Oh, okay. we, we, I'm, I'm sorry. We'll talk about this later. All right. We are now going to move on to. I'm going to turn on my light a little bit brighter here. All right. Let me just. Um, so the first, the first um, category that I came up across that I wanted to add something to has to do with the socio socioeconomic condition. So these are areas that um, are appropriate to the, the, the scoping. And my thought was that I would like them to study uh, specifically the effect that market rate that the market rate um, and cars, that the market rate um, apartments and, and residences and corresponding commercial businesses that would, uh, you know, really deal with and, and aim at those market rate residences um, will have on displacement and on people who are uh, not able to afford the um the 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 commercial uh prices that are that are related to the market rate um uh units so that that has to do with the socio socioeconomic conditions um with respect to community facilities i felt that um we want to we want them to study how the developer will be held to held to the plan that they are providing. What kinds of oversight will there be? What kinds of enforcement that the city should focus on and explore the possibility of uh, agreements that can be enforced and also the the explore the possibility that the community facilities that are uh, proposed either will be in place or there will be enforceable contracts to make sure that these facilities happen. Uh, as we all know, in many of the developments that have gotten um, that have that have have gotten some of the um, uh, projects that they've wanted, they've they've gotten it because they've promised community facilities. There is no enforcement. There is no oversight of that promise and a number of them have not uh, produced any community facilities. Um, the other thing with community facilities, I think that we need a detailed analysis of, uh, oh, in under community facilities, the city has said that they there we don't need a detailed analysis of the police, fire, and healthcare services. And I think that it is warranted because of the effect and the burden that the increase in density and the increase in um, the the expected number of people that will be coming in will have on those services. So I think that a detailed analysis of the police, fire, and healthcare services is warranted. Sure. Um, now, with I'm going through this, and you can all just you know add to what I have, but I don't know how else to do this in a in a in a you know a way. If you have a better way, let me know. But as I, far as with open space, what we I have a quick, yes. what if we we, we, we just nail nail them one at a time? Okay, so, fine, that's yeah. fine. Uh, let's yeah. why don't so, we nail the ones I have, and then we can nail yeah. the ones that you maybe want wanted to go through. So okay, so socio socio economic conditions. That was my first. 
Um, Dell, may I comment? This is Mike Andrews. May I comment on yes. this? It says yes, there, absolutely. And just so I understand, it says though that despite the fact the city says that they don't need it, that they were going to provide one anyway. So, yes. but it said there. So I, I don't under Is this a, an additional to yes. that, that you're requesting? Okay. Yes, I am saying that. I don't know that there there are there um the city will do this and the city will look at it but yeah. I want them to make sure that included in that analysis is a study of the effect that the market rate units and the corresponding commercial uh facilities will have on displacement because they don't necessarily look at that. They don't necessarily well, look at the the fact that you know the market rate units bring bring in commercial uh, 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 services that really are so uh, overpriced for the people who have who live in this neighborhood that they can no longer afford to even shop or buy things in this neighborhood. Yeah, I think it's displacement not only of members, but it's also displacement of other businesses, as I understand it. Exactly, they get, that's right. They give they give, they give low, low rent deals, you know, to their to their tenants. Absolutely, yeah. displacement of residents and and um, and local businesses. Yeah, absolutely. Um. So community facilities, again, in there, they say that an analysis of the police, fire, and healthcare services is not warranted. Um, and I, I can't just, I can't fathom how it, how the, the, uh, the increased density, both residences and uh, commercial um, uses and, and the, the, and, and the increase in the number of people that are going to be attracted to 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 this area and to the park, how they are not going to be a, a burden that needs to be looked at for uh, our police and and fire and healthcare services. Yeah, and I remember specifically the type of specialized uh, fire um, resources to deal with these mega high rises. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm writing this down. Dal, I got a question. Um, yes. Procedure uh, question. Okay. Um, since hopefully it's, I can answer it. Since it's almost twelve minutes, and I yes, unfortunately I can no longer stay. Um, are do we have to vote on this tonight as yes. a committee? Yes, so that I can present it to the full board. So there's no opportunity in between. Maybe if you were able to um, send what we have around so that members could maybe add to before the um, full board. Um, maybe uh, Jerry is better uh, is, is in a better position to answer that than I am, but I, it seems to me that we have to, as a committee, come up with something. I'm hoping the full board will allow us to add to this even, you know, at, after we've attended the um, the the, uh, the scoping meeting, but I don't know that they will. Is there anything that you wanted to add, Karen? Um, no, just the displacements of both the residents and, and the businesses was you know, key and also for me, um, as you know, Steve mentioned and you mentioned already, um, I'm just concerned about, you know, the burden on the infrastructure. Yes. On the electricity and, you yeah. know, all the utilities. Um, what I have is not that much. I could go through it in a few minutes here. Okay. All right. I'll, um, I'll try and if you, hang in there. So then. I have for open space um, that I think that they, uh, that I have, I think that they need to, and this is, this was raised during, during the meeting earlier, 
they need to explore the ratio of the planned increased density, both residential, co commercial, and from visitors with the size of the planned open space to evaluate the actual benefit to the community. If that's clear, you know, this is this open space looks lovely, but when you look at the ratio of the size of the open space and the use of the open space, and, and the and, cost of the open space. She said it's costing a hundred million dollars. She said that. Is yeah, that... but I, like De Devil's Advocate is to their point. Normally, they just have to create a forty-foot wide uh, esplanade and maybe a little bit more. So, yes, that's right. And even you know, so... so and in the end, it is a net. It's a net wash because they're they're going to bring in so many people. Right, but it's still more than if they just did what was required. So, that's true. On the other hand, uh, at at this point, you know they are rezoning uh, manufacturing space. Right, um, and in that context, I, there's no reason to, to to live with what's required, the minimum. So, uh, I, this is just this is just um, asking them to explore. That I, I don't I don't have the answer to this. The answer the, the I'm just suggesting that we tell them to explore the ratio of the planned density, residential, commercial, and from visitors um, with the size and the planned use of the open space to evaluate the actual benefit to the community. Bill, I'd like to add to that. Um, the, the appraisal says the sites are only 2.74 acres, and I know that they're going out on the you know rings and, and they're adding acreage there, but um, I'd love to see what parts they're considering open space. Like, are their sidewalks considered part of their open space? Are they considering high tide and low tide? So I'd love to just see a diagram as to what is considered a part of this 3.2 acres, given that it's changed. So how do you want to put that as part of the what you want them to uh, study or evaluate? But I feel for the yeah the terms of the scoping it's like it's like splitting hairs. I feel like I think what Dell is suggesting is they should just study what the real what the real impact is right. with right. The, the, the the people and uh, the tenant new tenants and. Um, the, well, I guess my question is just like yeah. remember this is remember this is what we're talking about now is is limited to um, the scoping. We want them to study. This is this the scoping of what they're going to look at, what they're going to study. And okay. I'm not I'm not sure how that fits into this. Yeah, I, I guess I would just love to see a diagram of like what they're considering open space to make sure that we would consider it open space because I I think that it seems overblown. Um, so I just love. I mean, and I I could have asked that tonight. There was honestly so little time. To do this, so perhaps there's a different forum, but I, I think, I think there is. I think there is. It's it's just this is just what we the city is going to study these things. This is their positive, their their um, declaration, and we may want to either make we may want to put in some uh, some more specific things that we want them to study because we want to make sure they don't miss it, or we might may want to say, hey, you say you don't really need to to analyze this, but we think you you should. Like for instance, the fire services, the sanitation. Well, I think they could study the high tide and low tide and 10 year flood zones, because even with the breakwaters, the water level is gonna rise. And I think that's okay. So that they can mitigate. say that again. Say that study what? They should study high tide and low tide on where that is on their beach and, and what the 10, 20, 30, 50 year flood zone will do to their open space. It's number fourteen. It's climate change. Uh, I the mean, end the end. is that okay? Uh, the it's other thing I wanted it. to ask about open space is I'm concerned about the effect that the MS four, the the combined sewer overflow point or the wet weather discharge point um, that's that's nearby. What will that effect will have that have on the Developers plans for the human usage of the water in in its open space. I don't know if it has any effect, but it's over by the. Um, well, they uh, they said that they're relocating it. 
That's what I thought I heard in the presentation, and that's part of the. That may be why. I don't know, but I, I just want to make sure that they've taken that into consideration. You know, that's over by the, um, what's the park next door there? Um, I'm, I'm so tired now. The. Um, Grand Ferry? Grand Ferry. Ferry Park. Grand Ferry yep. Park. Yep. Yep. Sounds good. All right. Um, and also then. Dale, also. Yes. Uh, yes. What kind of, a, what kind of quantistic uh, analysis uh, they could do in relation uh, I don't know, uh, Karen mentioned before infrastructure. Uh, I believe to me personally at this point, the benefit of the open space is kind of becomes irrelevant in, uh, uh, in comparison to the impact that this type of density will bring, but also what kind of activity this will trigger is beyond the number of residents that we are talking exactly, about. Exactly, exactly. This will trigger activity that we, they are really unknown and it could become an exponential factor and then infrastructure also in relation to how the city is envisioning uh, transportation. We're talking about bike, we're talking about open street. Currently, yep, we have yep. uh, Berry Street has Absolutely. been declared a, a permanent closed street. And it's also uh, is one of the track routes. It's an arterial way and, and right now is close to traffic. And Kent Avenue has a double bike lane. Uh, and so we have all those new policy and new rules that come in effect it will reduce really transportation and this type of building will increase is the transportation issue i believe we'll that's right and that's we'll that's bring... that's number 13 transportation and i i for there I, I felt that we had to explore um additional and alternate possible transportation services uh in, maybe increasing buses and, and waterborne transportation and explore the uh, possibility of a binding contract with the developer to ex to accept to have the developer accept financial responsibility for creating and maintaining additional waterborne transportation i don't know if that's realistic but um and, yeah, and definitely hard look at the uh the subways I mean, yes. I looked up the L train before the pandemic was number 39 out of 472 as the busiest um, subway station. So, um, and what about? Yeah, I found the estimate of 200 additional users to be a little interesting given the number of people living here. So, I think that's definitely yeah. important. And then there was something about the interaction between vehicles and pedestrians and bikes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, you know, um, I, I don't know how clear sanitation is mentioned either in this. Um, anybody who walks around this neighborhood on the other day and saw every single garbage can completely overflown. There's going to be obviously an impact of that too, with additional residents wandering around. Dell, this is Mike. Um, I have one question about energy number 12 before. Yes. We it. Could we find out if they can actually increase their microgrid to excess capacity to perhaps, for example, take uh, over that three megawatt site that we just said no to? Um, would there be a potential for them to increase the electricity possibly? Well, we can ask that. Explore, yeah. Yeah. study, possibility. Additional electricity to the neighborhood is so they're a, a positive uh into the grid as opposed to a negative right now they want to be neutral but maybe they can actually be a positive because they're right at that obviously they're right at that st substation that they were bragging that they were so close to that's I mean, right that's right so it. how would you say that study the possibility uh, of additional uh power resources to the neighborhood as a benefit of the project so in other words so somehow compel them to give us electricity okay Because that's already part of their proposals okay. of significant microgrid already. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. And speaking of the power plant next door, they, I guess they did really do a study about the health issues um, that come up because of the close proximity to the that power station, and also the potential for um, I just they're they're on a they're on an old Con Ed site and there's their remediation and what. Um, building a, a beach for kids to play in and just the extent of their, are they reaching a, um, 
just making sure that they're they're doing which I guess they would do, but making sure that they they're considering the public health issues of the site that they're moving on to. So um, we have this under public health. How do you what yeah. what do you want me to add to the public health here? Um, let's see. Well, just to, to how is health being considered um, with the due to the close proximity to the the power plant next door? Um, and uh, how are they remediating the sites to make it acceptable to be building a beach for kids to be playing in the, the site? Already remediated. It was remediated. So is it already? Re it's totally remediated. But the question is: Is it safe for humans to go in the water? And Yep. Okay. Yep. okay. Um, Richard, I know you're here. You probably have a, a million things here. Neighborhood character, I had a couple of thoughts. In light of the board's yep. recognition of the importance of protecting industry, Explore the effect of the loss of this um, this site uh, to you know losing yeah. the current zoning, and the other is to study the um, impact uh, in conjunction with the development and projected development from recent rezoning. So, in, in study the impact of this this development in conjunction with the. Uh, de the, the developments, the other recent developments, and the projected developments from recent rezonings. Um, that is what I had, and I, I'm sure that some of you have other topics that you wanted to highlight. Could you just um back, could we just back up real quick to socioeconomic impact? Yes. And and I would say it was racial impact study was part of our suggestion, right? Or not? And the indirect effect on neighborhood. The, uh, so it doesn't uh, address at this time uh, racial impact study. That's not part of what's in the document to date. I know there's thought at the city council of having that happen, but that's not officially part of the scope. Well, could you could we, not part of it. Well, it could be, couldn't it be included under indirect displacement? It, it's a concept, but it's, and you could argue it's a subset of it, but they're not looking to disclose that in the document. So if we were to ask them to do it, it wouldn't be something they would do just because it's inconsistent. And I think a lot of um, scope is based on law that um, this is that's been said and they're not changing it until something compels them to change it, whether it's legislation, lawsuit. Well, we are asking how what what the effect will be on on this uh, on displacement. We didn't specifically say uh, racial. Well, but, we, could, we uh, could just qualify it by saying even though the you know, current scoping um, does not mention racial impact study, it should. You know, because we feel you know the Churches United for Fair Housing study showed there was devastating displacement over. Uh, recent times because of rezoning. So. Well, we could say this on uh, the effect on displacement and racial inequity. I mean, they, they can ignore us. They can say, well, we don't care about racial inequity. Right, but we just be on the record for that's important to our community district. Sure, sure. I think, you know, it's it's interesting how it really on some level is implied because the displacement tends to it, the displacement really means people who are poorer people and it's going to be very you, you're probably going to have more uh, minorities poorer 
than non minorities. Okay. Certainly not all, but so the, I think that we can put it in. We can we can expect that they'll then turn around and say, "Well, we're not. We don't. We don't care about the racial inequity." Let them say it. I don't think they're going to say it because they're addressing the issue by providing 25% of affordable housing, which historically at the 60% AMI that they're proposing is most likely going to benefit people of color. Yeah, that's true. Question, the, the question, of course, on the other hand, you know, of course, will the number of affordable units um, ultimately, and you know, benefit the uh, the minorities and the people who are the, the the lower income people, when you s realize the secondary effects of having all of these market rate units coming in and the effect that that will have on the overall uh, rents in the whole area. I mean, this is something right. Marty Needleman has been talking about for years. Yeah, but these, these units may not make up for the actual displacement of loss you get overall. Correct. That's right. That's right. Not to harp on the tax abatement, but um, the tax abatement that they're asking for doesn't actually fit the new 421A. So I don't know. I can I can submit it not to get too heady with the board. Um, but even what they're asking for for this building isn't one of the options in the new 421A. Well, actually, that the the tax abatement. I don't know where it fits, but I think it. I think it is legitimate to say what study the kinds of tax abatements and whether the tax abatements they are getting are going to negatively affect other tax abatement abatements that could have been uh, sought by by nonprofits and by other agencies. Um, that's that's I don't know if you want if that's a question you want to ask. I mean, I, I think that ultimately the tax abatement is a huge issue that we talked a lot about. But uh, if we kept it as of right, we would get some taxes, which could fund a lot of neighborhood services. And I, I agree that the displacement caused by the 25% affordable housing doesn't actually net, you know, any benefit to the community. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how to package that question, but I think it could be maybe structured around what the experience was with Domino and studying the impact there in terms of how much displacement was seen. Um, you know, but there, there's a variety of ways we could target that, you know, between lost tax dollars and uh, the tax abatement. But I think there should be more scrutiny of it. Um. I did see a question in one of the questions that was asked about Domino, which had to do with the tax abatements. How would one of the questions was how will the affordable units uh, be subsidized and how they will affect, how will these subsidies affect other available subsidies in the area. We could ask them. This is to... Yes, Richard. The MIH was showing developer is cross subsidizing at minimum. And then the option would be would affordable New York be renewed. And if so, then the tax is also become a, a, a deferral or so that's a form of subsidy by full taxes for a number of years. I'm, I'm having trouble understanding you. You're kind of breaking up. Um, Try to any spot. Um, so basically, as MIH zoning, there's a developer cross subsidy because of the extent of receiving. Mm -hmm. And subject of 421A is questioned of whether it's renewed or not. And if it is renewed, what the form is so that part, you don't know. So is this something we could is this something we could ask now in the scoping? I mean, during the ULERP you could certainly specify which form of uh, 
for what you want. You know, do you want right. less units of more to be affordable? Um, you know, that's not typically a, a soap thing. I don't know right. if like an analysis to determine who's being placed in the neighborhood, whether it's certain incomes or more likely displaced other incomes. You know, that I don't think it's a and the other thing with the displacement okay. is replacement since no primary um you have to look at what proposed to do analyze it and whether what you're proposing to do analyze uh secondary displacement satisfactory or not because there's also triggers that it can prove that well this is what's happening anyhow in a neighborhood and they're not making it discernibly worse then if this is the trend in a neighborhood, then they don't need to do a more detailed study. That's just how it's written up in there. So what can we do to say we want them to do a detailed study? If, if they don't meet the triggers, they don't do it. You could ask, but they, they'll, you know, say this has been the trend. The question is how does one prove something is not a trend? So it's, of paragraph lanes tent under um, indirect uh, displacement. So, well, Del, I came up with a, a question around all my tax abatement stuff. So, since they're in this difficult position right now with one cell first because the 421A changed during their period. Um, I know that 421A is under scrutiny across the city and it, there's a high likelihood that it's going to get changed in the next year or two. So how do they, given that their project wouldn't work essentially without it, do they have any plans for what they would do if it were changed? Is it possible even that they can create this project without it? You know, are, are we going to potentially get stuck in the same situation as we are in one South first here? If it changes, see if a special permit as part of this approval, then typically city planning requires restrictive declaration. And so if they have the approval and then they decide it's not financeable, they're kind of in a frozen situation because of the permit. They, they can't simply just do the right development. I, I don't think I understand. Yeah, I feel um, like we're trying, we're asking city planning and countries to consider policy done. versus study specific areas. Yeah, we have to ask right now, stick to the, to the scoping of what they're going to study, what they're going to look at, what they're going to make the, the developer um, answer in terms of the effect that the development's going to have on these different areas. Well, this is all I have. I don't know what you all want to add. I think um, it would be a good idea. I, I know, like, we'll vote on what we have now, but if there anything, you know, if you could send it around prior to the board and if there's anything important, maybe I can make an amendment at the board meeting. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Include. Absolutely. We can certainly. So, yeah. So if we could circulate it, you know, um, mm -hmm. what we have so that this way, if we're missing something important, we have an opportunity at the full board to make an amendment. Absolutely. Richard, is there any suggestions you wanted to make to us? And I thank you so much for staying. You're muted. Looking at the study for each category, you're just going to see are there flaws and what they're intending. Like you mentioned a few spots where you didn't see them having to study, they go by a threshold. If you don't see a threshold, 
you may think there's a large enough development that every category gets studied, but based on the seat for manual, if they're not seating, they're not going to look at what you mentioned about, say, for example, police protection, fire protection. Um, so to ask them to do what they don't have to do, in the end, you're not going to expect city planning to say, okay, we're going to add that anyhow. That's not how it happens. So we're looking to see is what they're proposing to study okay? Maybe they're proposing to study perfect. Someone open space. They're going to have to analyze. They they figure out the population. They factor in the growth rate for the neighborhood without the project. They know how much which is a certain radius of the project, and then they're going to add their increment of open space. So now the numerator gets bigger and the denominator gets, in addition to the factored growth, they're going to add in their projected population to do a mathematical equation to get better or worse, mm -hmm. right? So that, you know, just looking how they handle each task, you're looking for, um, maybe they didn't quite think about something. Um, is there anything that you you can think of off that that you might recommend that we wanted to, that we would like to add to this, based on what you've heard tonight? Well, again, what I mentioned about you know big concern was the uh, displacement issue. Again, looking at the studies, we're going to do is there something they're not thinking about it taking into account. Um, again, staggeration is not a typical thing you tend to find triggers. So that one, I don't think you're going to uh, come up with something compelling. Um, public health is another kind of data. I'm not seeing much beyond what they ask. Sometimes I see things with transportation, although um, they're not showing you what streets they believe people will be driving to from. Um, the modal split of how many people they suggest will be driving versus walking versus getting on a bus, uh, that detail has been forth in the, in the document. So it's hard to kind of challenge them if they don't have, um, Details shared, but you know, it's kind of hard to like, what, what do you think would be if, if you have a thousand units, in this case, 750 approximately? Well, what does a typical person who lives in your neighborhood do? Do they own a car? And if they own a car, do they use every day? Um, because uh, David shared earlier the idea of having some office workforce there. Well, how are people getting to work in your area today? Uh, are they local? Are they on trains? Are they going to drive to the site? So, kind of using what you're inferring, what you're seeing, is is how your users are using your neighborhood, right? Because some of the populations will live there, say, five to fifteen years. So you have some habits that have developed. You know, do you see people going to the L train or do you see them people in the waterfront hopping on a bus that takes place not the L train? You know, what, what would you expect from people living over there in terms of how they would use mass transit? Like if you look at a couple of developments just north of them, you know, how are the people who live in those buildings 
of the ferry system versus going some other way to get to work. Certainly a mix. There's also lots of people using Ubers. That's a good point. Dell, is it possible in, in almost all these categories just to sort of summarize the question of, you know, they're looking for more or less four times the density of what the site allows and I think far more visitors. So I think in, in all of our questions is how do they sort of substantiate that? You know, and, and I think making sure that that's put in context, I, I recognize Richard's perspective that, you know, they're not the only ones who are causing displacement or adding traffic or transportation. But I think that it really does come to a, this is one too many, you know, there is a point at which it's too much. So how do we make sure that the, all of their analysis is including everything else that's already here? Also, another point, uh, uh, what are the consequences? And this is something we already have seen both in Greenpoint and Williamsburg in regard to our retail diversity, because we know when this large building comes, really what the resident of this building needs is kind of entertainment. So we have more restaurants, more bar, and this is definitely excluding the possibility of having retail diversity, which is, is a very important element in urbanism you know, to have lively and uh, sustainable neighborhood, you know, so that's another concern. Is there a study uh, can be done uh, to add to that? We already know that what the answer are, you know, because uh, we already see the changes and every day, even during COVID, you know, storefront after storefront, you know, they are uh, one, once again, one more liquor license, uh, one more restaurant, which is great, but that's another comment. And then, and the parts of the neighbor are more affected. The one that more storefront, are, uh, definitely the south side, are the old below scale smaller building. Well, one thing I wonder is uh, if there, I don't think there's any such category as aesthetic impact, is there? Um, it's uh, somewhat subjective, but that height uh, is really jarring and it is an aesthetic kind of thing. Um, and it relates to the context of, of where it is. Um, but I don't know how that can be measured or put in there. Yeah, it's number eight, urban design. Okay, so that's something I think that's very important is uh, the, un the, the, un the <laughs> how unappealing it is and out of context with the rest of the neighborhood, the, the height of it, the, yeah. Context. And that's, oh, you, know, you, that's can you remind me about which, what number is healthcare access in terms of being, a, adding to the burden already, hospital, really is Woodhull Hospital, um, unless you go across the river and you travel into Manhattan. Um, and also in terms of um, access to emergency response in the event of an impending emer emergency on that. I live on Kent Avenue. I know what it's like. I'm a couple of blocks away. Do you think we can sum summarize and wrap up pretty soon? Uh, the section and look at what the cups are, the triggers and analysis, and how close they are to it or not, in terms of whether analysis that needs to be done. It's number 16, public health. Thank you, Steve.
either we have lost energy or we're like I know. Nothing I think we should, should we vote on what we've got and it's then so quiet. and mm -hmm. then um, send the document around. Yes, please. Sounds good. I think we got a good good uh, Yes, I think in the morning we can add to it, but I I think we can vote now. Yes. Yes. Please, I start working at 6 a.m., please. Well, might as well just work through then, right? Oh, no, Steve. <laughs> Have we reached an historical record? We meeting tomorrow night. You know how long that goes. Ugh. Yeah, we got a long meeting tomorrow night, so. What do you have, Karen? Transportation. Oh. Yeah, both of us do. Add this one to your list. <laughs> do we need to hear it all, or do we all kind of know what it is and trust that Dell can put it in the document and we'll look at it? We, we trust in Dell. We trust, uh, we trust. I think we should uh, edit it for tense and agreement. And um, I make a motion. I second it. <laughs> we trust Dale. Yes, we do. She disappeared. Tell you're Tell muted. Okay, good night, everybody. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And um, thank you, Dell. Thank I'll you, Dell. Send for... this stuff thank around. Thank you, Dell. Thank you, Dell. Thank you. Thank everyone. you, don't need thank to you vote Richard. Dell, you're amazing. Welcome to the land use. Good yeah, night. welcome to, <laughs> welcome to the land use committee. Good night. Pick the best one to come.